Chapter 17 from Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, Chapter 17. Following the lead of South Carolina, the governor of Georgia began the secession movement in that state almost immediately after the presidential election. By such public declarations and acts as fell within the scope of his personal influence and official authority. But Georgia had given a heavy vote for Douglas, and her people were imbued with a strong feeling of conditional unionism. An opposition to hasty secession at once developed itself of so formidable a character that all the influence and cunning of the secessionists were needed to push their movement to success. The ablest men in the state hurried to Milledgeville and met in a sort of battle royal of speech-making and wire-pulling. The legislature was the target, and its action or non-action upon military appropriations and a convention bill was the result to be effected. Senator Toombs and others made speeches to promote secession, and in reply to these, Alexander H. Stevens addressed the legislature by special invitation on the 14th of November. His speech takes rank as the ablest made by a Southerner in opposition to disunion. The occasion appears to have been one of great excitement. Toombs sat on the platform beside the speaker and interlarded the address with his cynical interrogatories and comments, which Stevens met in every instance with successful repartee. The speaker declared that to secede in consequence of Lincoln's election was to break the Constitution and show bad faith. We went into the election with this people, said he. The result was different from what we wished, but the election has been constitutionally held. Mr. Lincoln could do the South no harm against an adverse House and Senate. This government, with all its defects, came nearer the object of all good governments than any other on the face of the earth. One by one he refuted the charges and complaints which had been advanced by tombs and warned his hearers against the perils of sudden disunion. Liberty once lost might never be restored. Georgia had grown great, rich, and intelligent in the Union. I look upon this country with our institutions as the Eden of the world, the paradise of the universe. It may be that out of it we may become greater and more prosperous, but I am candid and sincere in telling you that I fear if we yield to passion and without sufficient cause shall take that step instead of becoming greater or more peaceful, prosperous, and happy, instead of becoming gods, we will become demons and at no distant day commence cutting one another's throats. The speech created an immense sensation throughout the South, and but for an artful trick of the secessionists would have arrested and changed the immediate tide of secession in Georgia. Seeing that the underlying Union feeling was about to endanger their scheme of revolt through defection or hesitation on the part of the Empire State of the South, they devised an adroit plea to appropriate its whole force to further their own plans. They persistently urged that we can make better terms out of the Union than in it. Mr. Stevens himself has explained the misrepresentation and its result. Two-thirds at least of those who voted for the ordinance of secession did so, I have but little doubt, with a view to a more certain reformation of the Union. To understand this statement more thoroughly, it must be added that Mr. Stevens's great Union speech was also enthusiastically hailed by the North as a sign of firm allegiance, but that part of the country totally misapprehended its spirit and object. With all of his eloquently asserted devotion to the Union, he was a pro-slavery man of the most ultra-type. He defended the institution upon the higher law doctrine. If slavery, said he, as it exists with us, is not best for the African, constituted and made as he is, if it does not best promote his welfare and happiness socially, morally, and politically, as well as that of his master, it ought to be abolished. 
he believed slavery should be protected in the territories by federal law he did not go quite to the extent of advocating a revival of the african slave trade but went so far as to suggest that without such a reopening the south could not maintain her coveted balance of power if the policy of this country said he settled in its early history of prohibiting further importations or immigrations of this class of population is to be adhered to the race of competition between us and our brethren of the north in the colonization of new states which heretofore has been so well maintained by us will soon have to be abandoned so again, while he asserted that the South had lost nothing but gained much through the slavery agitation, and while he maintained that she was menaced by no danger, he had been for nearly ten years a conditional disunionist. During the agitation of 1850, a convention of Georgia passed certain resolutions known as the Georgia Platform. The resolutions declared the acceptance of the Compromise of 1850 as a permanent adjustment, and then went on to threaten disunion in case that adjustment were violated. This Georgia platform was Mr. Stevens's rallying ground and stronghold. Latterly, he had extended it by including personal liberty bills as a cause of disunion. He loved the Union, but he held the Union secondary to the Georgia platform, and he opposed secession because he thought it a departure from this platform not only a departure from the georgia platform said he and from the long established principles of the national democratic party but an entire change of position of the entire south of all parties not of all individuals in relation to the power and jurisdiction of the federal government over the subject of african slavery when the disruption of the charleston convention paralyzed the democratic party mr stevens lost heart he thought the times out of joint he saw no further prospect of doing good the popular fever must run its course if disunion came he avowed he would yield to the misfortune his destiny he said lay with georgia and the south it will appear from this that mr stevens was a most unsafe political mentor yet out of this lethargy of conviction and will came the splendid outburst of patriotic eloquence and union argument of his milledgeville speech only to be marred however at its close by renewed adhesion to the georgia platform and a new subserviency to the will of georgia the newspapers brought the report of mr stevens's speech to springfield the home of mr lincoln as well as to all other northern cities and the president-elect read its stirring periods with something of the general hope that a gleam of light was shining upon dark places like other men in the north he had no means of knowing the eccentricities of mr stevens's principles and policy and therefore probably shared the general error of overvaluing his expressions of attachment to the union he had personally known him as a fellow congressman and a fellow whig in eighteen forty seven through forty nine they had become co-laborers in their advocacy of the nomination and election of general taylor to the presidency and through these associations contracted a warm social and political friendship it was therefore most natural that upon reading his reported speech mr lincoln addressed a note of a few lines to mr stevens asking him for a revised copy and this note led to a short but most interesting correspondence mr stevens replied courteously saying that his speech had not been revised by him that while the newspaper report contained several verbal inaccuracies its main points were sufficiently clear for all practical purposes the note enclosed with the following sentence the country is certainly in great peril and no man ever had heavier or greater responsibilities resting upon him than you have in the present momentous crisis the phrase seemed to open the way to a confidential interchange of thought and a few days afterwards mr lincoln wrote the following frank letter for your own eye only springfield illinois december twenty second eighteen sixty honorable a h stevens my dear sir 
your obliging answer to my short note is just received and for which please accept my thanks i fully appreciate the present peril the country is in and the weight of responsibility on me do the people of the south really entertain fears that a republican administration would directly or indirectly interfere with the slaves or with them about the slaves if they do i wish to assure you as once a friend and still i hope not an enemy that there is no cause for such fears the south will be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of washington i suppose however this does not meet the case you think slavery is right and ought to be extended while we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted that i suppose is the rub it certainly is the only substantial difference between us yours very truly a lincoln with equal frankness mr stevens under date of december thirty wrote a long reply which is conspicuous for its candid admissions premising that though differing from him politically he was not mr lincoln's enemy mr stevens proceeded as follows i will also add that in my judgment the people of the south do not entertain any fears that a republican administration or at least the one about to be inaugurated would attempt to interfere directly and immediately with slavery in the states their apprehension and disquietude do not spring from that source they do not arise from the fact of the known anti-slavery opinions of the present president-elect washington jefferson and other presidents are generally admitted to have been anti-slavery in sentiment but in those days anti-slavery did not enter as an element into party organizations but now this subject which is confessedly on all sides outside of the constitutional action of the government so far as the states are concerned is made the central idea in the platform of principles announced by the triumphant party the leading object seems to be simply and wantonly if you please to put the institutions of nearly half the states under the ban of public opinion and national condemnation this upon general principles is quite enough of itself to arouse a spirit not only of general indignation but of revolt on the part of the proscribed we at the south do think african slavery as it exists with us both morally and politically right this opinion is founded upon the inferiority of the black race you however and perhaps a majority of the north think it wrong admit the difference of opinion the same difference of opinion existed to a more general extent amongst those who formed the constitution when it was made and adopted the changes have been mainly to our side as parties were not formed on this difference of opinion then why should they be now the same difference would of course exist in the supposed case of religion when parties or combinations of men therefore so form themselves must it not be assumed to arise not from reason or any sense of justice but from fanaticism the motive can spring from no other source and when men come under the influence of fanaticism there is no telling where their impulses or passions may drive them this is what creates our discontent and apprehension conciliation and harmony in my judgment can never be established by force nor can the union under the constitution be maintained by force the union was formed by the consent of independent sovereign states ultimate sovereignty still resides with them separately which can be resumed and will be if their safety tranquillity and security in their judgment require it under our system as i view it there is no rightful power in the general government to coerce a state in case any one of them should throw herself upon her reserve rights and resume the full exercise of her sovereign powers force may perpetuate a union that depends upon the contingencies of war but such a union would not be the union of the constitution it would be nothing short of a consolidated despotism mr lincoln could not of course enter upon a further discussion of the topics raised and made no reply to mr stevens's letter the correspondence is noteworthy as showing how both writers agreed upon the actual and underlying cause of the political crisis namely that the south believed slavery to be right and ought to be extended while the north believed it was wrong and ought to be restricted 
It was a conflict of opinion. Such conflicts have come in all times, in all nations, and under all forms of government. But admitting the existence of such a conflict of opinion, the legitimate inquiry arises, was it a proper cause of war? History must answer this question unhesitatingly and emphatically in the negative. In ages happily past, the anger of a king, the caprice of a mistress, or the ambition of a minister has often deluged a nation in blood. But in our day, the conscience of civilization demands that the sword shall only defend the life of governments and the life, liberty, and property of their subjects. It has ordained that written constitutions shall decide claims of rulers and rights of citizens. Casuistry, the most adroit, could not prove the right of the free states to expel the slave states for believing the institution of slavery to be a substantial blessing. Equally absurd was the doctrine that the slave states had a right to destroy the Union by secession because the free states thought slavery a moral, social, and political evil. Upon this question, as upon all others, public opinion was the arbiter appointed by the Constitution and laws. Upon this question, the lawful and constitutional verdict had been pronounced by the election of Lincoln, and the proper duty of the South under the circumstances had been admirably stated by Mr. Stevens himself in his Milledgeville speech. In my judgment, the election of no man constitutionally chosen to that high office is sufficient cause for any state to separate from the Union. It ought to stand by and still in maintain the constitution of the country. Mr. Stevens's letter ignored the existence of the pro-slavery sentiment in the South, which had for six years been united and unceasing in party affiliation and action, and that this party action had wrought the repeal of the Missouri Compromise in violation of plighted political faith and generous comedy between sections. Moreover, that anti-slavery opinions had not only been under ban of public sentiment there, but had notoriously for years been visited with mob violence and been made the subject of prohibitory penal statutes. The experiment of a sentimental union dreamed of by Stevens and others had been fully tried in the Compromise of 1850 and first and flagrantly violated by the South herself against every appeal and protest. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of Abraham Lincoln, a History, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Calamity the Willing Williams, Malati Manila, Philippines. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, by John Hay and John George Nicolai. One of the vexatious duties of Lincoln was to answer the importunings of a class of sincere but timid men, alarmed by the signs of disunion, who besought him to make some public statement to quiet the South. Requests of this character were not confined to one party, but came from all, the more considerable number being from Republicans and from Southern Unionists or followers of Bell and Everett. The great bulk of these letters was, of course, never answered, but occasionally one was received from a man of such standing and influence that to ignore it would not only seem ungracious, but might subject the president-elect to more serious misrepresentation than had already been his lot to endure. To show both a prominent phase of current politics and his manner of dealing with it, we print several replies of this class. Thus, for instance, he wrote confidentially to Mr. William S. Spear, a citizen of Tennessee, under date of October 23. I appreciate your motive when you suggest the propriety of my writing for the public something disclaiming all intention to interfere with slaves or slavery in the States. But in my judgment, it would do no good. I have already done this many, many times, and it is in print and open to all who will read. Those who will not read or heed what I have already publicly said would not read or heed a repetition of it. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Among the newspapers of the West, none had taken a higher rank or wielded a greater influence than the Louisville Journal. It had in a manner been Mr. Lincoln's primer in politics in those early days when he labored through Blackstone, or even farther back when he was yet struggling with Kirkham's grammar on the shady knolls of New Salem. Compared with these rocks and pitfalls of letters, the anecdotes, the wit, the epigrammic arguments of the Louisville Journal were a very garden of delight, not only to Lincoln, but to the crude yet knowledge-hungry intellects of the whole Mississippi Valley. In time, the journal became a great luminary, and the name of its witty editor a household word. For many years, it was a beacon and watchtower of the Whig Party. Then the Pandora's box of the Nebraska Bill was opened, 
and when finally, in the extraordinary campaign of 1860, Lincoln read this once favorite sheet, it was to find himself the victim of its satire and depreciation. Victory, however, is a sovereign bomb for detraction, and it must have been easy for him to forgive his old friend, George D. Prentice, when the latter wrote him October 26. There is evidently a very strong probability of your being elected to the presidency by the popular vote. Expressing the strongest confidence in both his personal and political integrity, he suggested that in the event of his election, he should publish a letter setting forth his conservative views and intention to assure all good citizens of the South and to take from the disunionists every excuse or pretext for treason. To this appeal, Mr. Lincoln prepared to reply October 29, though it was not then sent. Your suggestion that I, in a certain event, shall write a letter setting forth my conservative views and intentions is certainly a very worthy one. But would it do any good? If I were to labor a month, I could not express my conservative views and intentions more clearly and strongly than they are expressed in our platform, and in my many speeches already in print and before the public. And yet even you, who do occasionally speak of me in terms of personal kindness, give no prominence to these oft-repeated expressions of conservative views and intentions, but busy yourself with appeals to all conservative men to vote for Douglas, to vote in any which way which can possibly defeat me, thus impressing your readers that you think I am the very worst man living. If what I have already said has failed to convince you, no repetition of it would convince you. A writing of your letter now before me, gives assurance that you would publish such a letter for me as you suggest. But till now, what reason had I to suppose the Louisville Journal even would publish a repetition of that which is already at its command, and which it does not press upon the public attention? And now, my friend, for such I esteem you personally, do not misunderstand me. I have not decided that I will not do substantially what you suggest. I will not forbear from doing so merely on punctilio and pluck. If I do finally abstain, it will be because of apprehension that it would do harm. But the good men of the South, and I regard the majority of them as such, I have no objection to repeat seventy and seven times. But I have bad men also to deal with, both North and South, men who are eager for something new upon which to base new misrepresentation, men who would like to frighten me, or at least to fix upon me the character of timidity and cowardice. They would seize upon almost any letter I could write as being an awful coming down. I intend keeping my eye upon these gentlemen, and do not unnecessarily put any weapons in their hands. This letter was withheld till after election. On the 16th of November, he wrote a letter of very similar purport to Mr. N. Pashal, editor of the Missouri Republican. I could say nothing which I have not already said, and which is in print and accessible to the public. Pardon me for suggesting that if the papers like yours, which have heretofore persistently garbled and misrepresented what I have said, will now fully and fairly place it before their readers, there can be no further misunderstanding. I beg you to believe me sincere when I declare I do not say this in a spirit of complaint or resentment, but that I urge it as the true cure for any real uneasiness in the country that my course may be other than conservative. The Republican newspapers now and for some time past are and have been republishing copious extracts from my many published speeches, which would at once reach the whole public if your class of papers would also publish them. I am not at liberty to shift my ground. That is out of the question. If I thought a repetition would do any good, I would make it. But in my judgment, it would do positive harm. The secessionists, per se, believing they had alarmed me, would clamor all the louder. With the solicitations of this nature coming from his political friends, Mr. Lincoln was not only as firm and decided, but more emphatic in criticism. On November 5th, the day before the presidential election, there arrived at Springfield and called upon him a gentleman from New England of prominence in political and official life who brought and presented letters of the same tenor from a considerable number of citizens representing commercial and manufacturing industries in that region. He was one of those keen, incisive talkers who go direct to the heart of a mission. I have called to see, he said. If the alarms of many persons in New England engaged in commerce and manufactures cannot by some means be relieved. I am myself largely interested in manufactures. Our trade has fallen off. Our workmen are idle. We get no orders from the South. And with the increasing chances of civil war, bankruptcy, and ruin stare us in the face. 
Something in the persistence and manner of the interlocutor, something in the tone of the letters presented, and still more in the character of the signers, irritated Lincoln to a warmth of retort he seldom reached. He divined at once the mercenary nature of the appeal, and it roused in him to repel the pressure. His visitor closed by asking some conservative promise to reassure the men honestly alarmed. There are no such men, bluntly replied Lincoln. This is the same old trick by which the South breaks down every northern victory. Even if I were personally willing to barter away the moral principle involved in this contest for the commercial gain of a new submission to the South, I would go to Washington without the countenance of the men who supported me and were my friends before the election. I would be as powerless as a block of buckeye would. The man still insisted, and Lincoln continued. The honest men, you are talking of honest men, will look at our platform and what I have said. There they will find everything I could now say or which they would ask me to say. All I could add would be but repetition. Having told them all these things ten times already, would they believe the eleventh declaration? Let us be practical. There are many general terms afloat, such as conservatism, enforcement of the irrepressible conflict at the point of the bayonet, hostility to the South, etc., all of which mean nothing without definition. What then could I say to ally their fears, if they would not define what particular act or acts they fear for me or my friends? At this stage of the conversation, his visitor, who with true military foresight had provided a reserve, handed him an additional letter, numerously signed, asking if he did not there recognize names that were a power. Yes, retorted Lincoln sharply, glancing at the document. I recognize them as a set of liars and knaves who signed that statement about Seward last year. The visitor was taken aback at his familiarity with the local politics of his state, but rallied and insisted that there was also other names on the list. Lincoln now looked through the paper more carefully, his warmth, meanwhile, cooling down a little. Well, <laughs> answered he, laughing, after reading it, it is about as I expected to find it. It annoyed me to hear that gang of men called respectable. Their conduct at Gibergum was a disgrace to any civilized citizen. Here his visitor suggested that the South was making armed preparations. The North, answered Lincoln, does not fear invasion from the slave states, and we of the North certainly have no desire and never had to invade the South. They have talked about what they intend to do in the event of a black Republican victory, until they have convinced themselves there is really no courage left in the North. Have we back this time, interrupted the visitor. That is just what I am pressed to do now, replied Lincoln. If I shall begin to yield to these threats, if I begin dallying with them, the men who have elected me, if I shall be elected, would give me up before my election, and the South, seeing it, would deliberately kick me out. If my friends should desire me to repeat anything I have before said, I should have no objection to do so. If they required me to say something I had not yet said, I would either do so or get out of the way. If I should be elected, the first duty to the country would be to stand by the men who elected me. Still from time to time, the point was pressed upon him from other influential quarters. Henry J. Raymond, editor of the New York Times, joined in urging it. Lincoln, on November 28th, answered him confidentially as follows. Yours of the 14th was received in due course. I have delayed so long to answer it, because my reasons for not coming before the public in any form just now had substantially appeared in your paper, the time, and hence I fear they were not deemed sufficient by you, else you would not have written me as you did. I now think we have a demonstration in favor of my view. On the 20th instant, Senator Trumbull made a short speech which I suppose you have both seen and approved. As a single newspaper heretofore against us, urged that speech upon the public with a purpose to quiet public anxiety. Not one, so far as I know. On the contrary, the Boston Courier and its class hold me responsible for that speech and endeavor to inflame the North with the belief that it foreshadows an abandonment of Republican ground by the incoming administration, while the Washington Constitution and its class hold the same speech up to the South as an open declaration of war against them. This is just as I expected and just what would happen with any declaration I could make. These political fiends are not half sick enough yet. Party malice and not public good possesses them entirely. They seek a sign, and no sign shall be given them. At least such is my present feeling and purpose. And in this purpose you remain steadfast to the end. They'll put to yet more trying tests. 
It has been mentioned that with the opening of Congress and the formation of the Senate Committee of 13, the House Committee of 33, certain conservative men from the border slave states endeavored to gain control of the political situation by forming a neutral or mediating party between the disunionists and the Republicans. Their policy was a mistake, but while reprobating present dismemberment, their attitude on the slavery question indicated clearly enough that if clung to, it would inevitably drive them to the extreme plans of the cotton states. Some of these would-be neutral states eventually went that direful road, and those which did not were saved only by the restraint of the Union Army. But for the time, their leaders were sincerely patriotic. From one of the most prominent of these, John A. Gilmer of North Carolina, to whom Lincoln afterwards made a tender of a cabinet appointment, he received an inquiry, dated December 10th, concerning his opinions on several points of the slave controversy, saying, I am not without hope that a clear and definite exposition of your views on the questions mentioned may go far to quiet, if not satisfy, all reasonable minds, that on most of them it will become plain that there is much more misunderstanding than difference, and that the balance are so much more abstract than practical. However difficult to resist this appeal, so influential, so respectful, so promising, the president-elect felt himself bound to adhere to his policy of refusing any public utterance for reasons which he set forth at some length in a confidential answer written on the 15th of December. I am greatly disinclined to write a letter on the subject embraced in yours, and I would not do so, even privately as I do, were it not that I fear you might misconstrue my silence. Is it desired that I shall shift the ground upon which I have been elected? I cannot do it. You need only to acquaint yourself with that ground and press it on the attention of the South. It is all in print and easy of access. May I be pardoned if I ask whether even you have ever attempted to procure the reading of the Republican platform or my speeches by the Southern people? If not, what reason have I to expect that any additional production of mine would meet a better fate? It would make me appear as if I repented for the crime of having been elected and was anxious to apologize and beg forgiveness. To so represent me would be the principal use made of any letter I might now thrust upon the public. My old record cannot be so used, and that is precisely the reason that some new declaration is so much sought. Now, my dear sir, be assured I am not questioning your candor. I am only pointing out that while a new letter would hurt the cause which I think a just one, you can quite as well affect every patriotic object with the old record. Carefully read pages 18, 19, 74, 75, 88, 89 and 267 of the volume of joint debates between Senator Douglas and myself, with the Republican platform adopted at Chicago, and all your questions will be substantially answered. I have no thought of recommending the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, nor the slave trade among the slave states, even on the conditions indicated. And if I were to make such recommendation, it is quite clear Congress would not follow it. As to employing slaves in arsenals and dockyards, it is a thing I never thought of in my life, to my recollection, till I saw your letter, and I may say of it precisely as I have said of the two points above. As to the use of patronage in the slave states, where there are few or no Republicans, I do not expect to inquire for the politics of the appointee, or whether he does or not own slaves. I intend in that matter to accommodate the people in the several localities, if they themselves would allow me to accommodate them. In one word, I never have been, and not now, and probably never shall be, in a mood of harassing the people either north or south. On the territorial question, I am inflexible, as you see my position in the book. On that there is a difference between you and us, and it is the only substantial difference. You think slavery is right and ought to be extended. We think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. For this, neither has any just occasion to be angry with the other. As to the state laws mentioned in your sixth question, I really know very little of them. I never have read one. If any of them are in conflict with the Fugitive Slate Clause or any other part of the Constitution, I certainly shall be glad of the repeal. But I could hardly be justified as a citizen of Illinois or as President of the United States to recommend the repeal of a statute of Vermont or South Carolina. We have given samples of these solicitations coming from Republicans, from Douglas Democrats, and from the adherents of Bell. The following coming from the fourth political school will be found of equal interest. Its origin is given in the words of the principal actor, General Duff Green, who in a letter nearly three years afterwards thus described it. 
In December 1860, at the request of the President of the United States, I went to Springfield to see Mr. Lincoln and urge him to go to Washington and exert his influence in aid of the adjustment of the questions then pending between the North and the South. I was authorized by Mr. Buchanan to say to him that if he came, he would be received and treated with the courtesy due to the President-elect. I saw Mr. Lincoln at his house and did urge the necessity of his going to Washington and uniting his efforts in behalf of peace, telling him that, in my opinion, he alone could prevent a civil war, and that if he did not go, upon his conscience must rest the blood that would be shed. Whether this proposition came by authority or not, Lincoln could not question either the truth of the envoy or the motive of the mission. In either case, the appeal was adroitly laid. Of course, it was impossible to accept or even to entertain it. On the other hand, a simple refusal might be made the basis of very serious misrepresentation. He therefore wrote the following reply, Springfield, Illinois, December 28, 1860. General Duff Green, my dear sir, I do not desire any amendment of the Constitution, recognizing, however, that the questions of such amendment rightfully belong to the American people. I should not feel justified nor inclined to withhold from them, if I could, a fair opportunity of expressing their will thereon through, either of the modes prescribed in the instrument. In addition, I declare that the maintenance and violate of the rights of the states, and especially the right of each state, to order and control its own domestic institutions, according to its own judgment exclusively, is essential to that balance of powers on which the perfection and endurance of our political fabric depend. And I denounce the lawless invasion by armed forces of the soil of any state or territory, no matter under what pretext, as the gravest of crimes. I am greatly averse to writing anything for the public at this time, and I consent to the publication of this only upon the condition that six of the twelve United States Senators for the states of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, and Texas shall sign their names to what is written on this sheet below my name, and allow the whole to be published together. Yours truly, A. Lincoln. Lincoln to Duff Green, December 28, 1860. We recommend to the people of the states we represent respectively to suspend all action for dismemberment of the Union, at least until some act deemed to be violative of our rights shall be done by the incoming administration. This letter Lincoln transmitted to Senator Trumbull at Washington with the following direction. General Duff Green is out here endeavoring to draw a letter out of me. I have written one herewith I enclose to you, which I believe could not be used to our disadvantage. Still, upon consultation with our discreet friends, you conclude that it may do us harm. Do not deliver it. You need not mention that the second clause of the letter is copied from the Chicago platform. If on consultation, our friends, including yourself, think it can do no harm, keep a copy and deliver the letter to General Green. It is not definitely known whether this letter was delivered. Nothing further came of Duff Green's mission except a letter from himself in the New York Herald, mentioning his visit and his failure in the Vegas generalities. His aim had apparently been to induce Lincoln tacitly to assume responsibility for the Southern Revolt, and when the latter, by his skillful answer, pointed out the real conspirators, they were no longer anxious to have a publication made. The whole attitude and issue of the controversy was so tersely summed up by Lincoln in a confidential letter to a Republican friend, under date of January 11, 1861, that we cannot forbear citing it in conclusion. Yours of the sixth is received. I answer it only because I fear you would misconstrue my silence. What is our present condition? We have just carried an election on principles fairly stated to the people. Now we are told in advance, the government shall be broken up unless we surrender to those we have beaten before we take the offices. In this, they are either attempting to play upon us or they are in dead earnest. Either way, if we surrender, it is the end of us and of the government. They will repeat the experiment upon us ad libitum. A year will not pass till we shall have to take Cuba as a condition upon which they will stay in the Union. They now have the Constitution under which we have lived over 70 years and acts of Congress of their own framing with no prospect of their being changed. And they can never have a more shallow pretext for breaking up the government or extorting a compromise than now. There is, in my judgment, but one compromise which would really settle the slavery question, and that would be a prohibition against acquiring any more territory. End of chapter 18. Recording by Kalyman Llewellyn Williams, Malate, Manila, Philippines.
Chapter 19 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 19. Springfield to Washington. As the date of inauguration approached, formal invitations, without party distinction, came from the legislatures of Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, tendering Mr. Lincoln the hospitalities of those states and their people, and inviting him to visit their capitals on his journey to Washington. Similar invitations also came to him from the municipal authorities of many cities and towns on the route, and railroads tendered him special trains for the use of himself and family. Mr. Lincoln had no fondness for public display, but in his long political career he had learned the importance of personal confidence and live sympathy between representatives and constituents, leaders and people. About to assume unusual duties in extraordinary times, he doubtless felt that it would not be only a gracious act to accept so far as he could these invitations, in which all parties had freely joined, but that both people and executive would be strengthened in their faith and patriotism by a closer acquaintance, even of so brief and ceremonial a character. Accordingly, he answered the governors and committees that he would visit the cities of Indianapolis, Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Albany, New York, Trenton, Philadelphia, and Harrisburg, while to the governor of Massachusetts he replied that the want of time alone constrained him to omit that state from his route of travel. Monday, the 11th day of February, was fixed as the time of departure, and a program and schedule of special trains from point to point were arranged, extending to Saturday, the 23rd, the time appointed for his arrival in Washington. Early Monday morning, the 11th, found Mr. Lincoln, his family, and suite at the rather dingy little railroad station in Springfield, with a throng of at least a thousand of his neighbors who had come to bid him goodbye. It was a stormy morning which served to add gloom and depression to their spirits. The leave-taking presented a scene of subdued anxiety, almost of solemnity. Mr. Lincoln took a position in the waiting-room, where his friends filed past him, often merely pressing his hand in silent emotion. The half-finished ceremony was broken in upon by the ringing bells and rushing train. The crowd closed about the railroad car into which the president-elect and his party made their way. Then came the central incident of the morning. The bell gave notice of starting, but as the conductor paused with his hand lifted to the bell rope, Mr. Lincoln appeared on the platform of the car and raised his hand to command attention. The bystanders bared their heads to the falling snowflakes, and standing thus, his neighbors heard his voice for the last time, in the city of his home, in a farewell address so chaste and pathetic that it reads as if he already felt the tragic shadow of forecasting fate. My friends, no one not in my situation can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. To this place and the kindness of these people I owe everything. Here I have lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born and one is buried. I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington." Without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance I cannot fail. Trusting in him, who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me, I bid you an affectionate farewell. A proper description of the presidential tour which followed would fill a volume. It embraced two weeks of official receptions by committees, mayors, governors, and legislatures, of crowded evening receptions and interminable handshakings, of impromptu or formal address, 
at every ceremony, of cheers, salutes, bonfires, military parades, and imposing processions amid miles of spectators. Political dissension was for the moment hushed in the general curiosity to see and hear the man who, by the free and lawful choice of the nation, had been called to exercise the duties of the presidential office. The universal eagerness was perhaps heightened by the fact that during the same two weeks the delegates from the states in insurrection were in session at Montgomery, Alabama, occupied with the temporary organization of a government openly pledged to rebellion, and whose doings were daily reported by the telegraph and printed in every newspaper. Personal curiosity was thus supplemented by growing political anxiety, and every word of the president-elect was scanned for some light by which to read the troubled and uncertain future. Mr. Lincoln was therefore obliged to measure his public utterances with unusual caution, and while he managed to avoid any announcement of policy, the country was nevertheless able to read between the lines that it had made no mistake in the man to whom it had confided the preservation of the government. It would, of course, be impossible in a single chapter to cite his many speeches on his journey, in which there occurred, of necessity, a great deal of repetition. It will perhaps give a better idea of their general tenor to reproduce passages from a few of the most noteworthy. In reading these, it must be borne in mind that they were reported and printed under such circumstances of haste and confusion that verbal accuracy could not be expected, and that they are but abstracts in which the full structure of his sentences is often abridged or transposed to permit the whole to be brought within the limits of an ordinary press dispatch. The train which left Springfield in the morning arrived in Indianapolis before nightfall, where, in response to an address from Governor Oliver P. Morton, Mr. Lincoln said, Most heartily do I thank you for this magnificent reception, and while I cannot take to myself any share of the compliment thus paid, more than that which pertains to a mere instrument, an accidental instrument, perhaps, I should say, of a great cause, I yet must look upon it as a most magnificent reception, and as such most heartily do I thank you for it. You have been pleased to address yourself to me chiefly in behalf of this glorious union in which we live, in all of which you have my hearty sympathy, and, as far as may be within my power, will have one and inseparably my hearty cooperation. While I do not expect, upon this occasion, or until I get to Washington, to attempt any lengthy speech, I will only say that to the salvation of the Union there needs but one single thing, the hearts of a people like yours. The people, when they rise in mass in behalf of the Union and the liberties of this country, truly may it be said, the gates of hell cannot prevail against them. In all trying positions in which I shall be placed, and doubtless I shall be placed in many such, my reliance will be upon you and the people of the United States, and I wish you to remember now and forever that it is your business and not mine, that if the union of these states and the liberties of this people shall be lost, it is but little to any one man of fifty-two years of age, but a great deal to the thirty millions of people who inhabit these United States, and to their posterity in all coming time. It is your business to rise up and preserve the union and liberty for yourselves, and not for me. I appeal to you again to constantly bear in mind that not with politicians, not with presidents, not with office seekers, but with you, is the question, shall the Union and shall the liberties of this country be preserved to the latest generations? The ceremonies during his stay here called out another address from him, in which he asked the following pertinent questions. I am here to thank you much for this magnificent welcome, and still more for the generous support given by your state to that political cause which I think is the true and just cause of the whole country and the whole world. Solomon says there is a time to keep silence, and when men wrangle by the month with no certainty that they mean the same thing while using the same word, it perhaps were as well if they would keep silence. The words coercion and invasion are much used in these days, and often with some temper and hot blood. 
let us make sure, if we can, that we do not misunderstand the meaning of those who use them. Let us get exact definitions of these words, not from dictionaries, but from the men themselves, who certainly appreciate the things they would represent by the use of words. What then is coercion? What is invasion? Would the marching of an army into South Carolina without the consent of her people and with hostile intent toward them be invasion? I certainly think it would. And it would be coercion also if the South Carolinians were forced to submit. But if the United States should merely hold and retake its own forts and other property and collect the duties on foreign importation, or even withhold the mails from places where they were habitually violated, would any or all of these things be invasion or coercion? Do our professed lovers of the Union, but who spitefully resolve that they will resist coercion and invasion, understand that such things as these on the part of the United States would be coercion or invasion of a state? If so, their idea of means to preserve the object of their affection would seem exceedingly thin and airy. If sick, the little pills of the homeopathist would be much too large for them to swallow. In their view, the union, as a family relation, would seem to be no regular marriage, but a sort of free love arrangement, to be maintained only on passional attraction. By the way, in what consists the special sacredness of a state? I speak not of the position assigned to a state in the Union by the Constitution, for that by the bond we all recognize. That position, however, a state cannot carry out of the Union with it. I speak of that assumed primary right of a state to rule all which is less than itself and ruin all which is larger than itself. If a state and a county, in a given case, should be equal in extent of territory and equal in number of inhabitants, in what, as a matter of principle, is the state better than the county? Would an exchange of names be an exchange of rights upon principle? On what rightful principle may a state, being not more than one-fiftieth part of the nation in soil and population, break up the nation and then coerce a proportionally larger subdivision of itself in the most arbitrary way? What mysterious right to play tyrant is conferred upon a district of country with its people by merely calling it a state? Fellow citizens, I am not asserting anything. I am merely asking questions for you to consider. At Columbus, Ohio, he said to the legislature of that state, convened in joint session in the hall of the assembly, It is true, as has been said by the President of the Senate, that very great responsibility rests upon me in the position to which the votes of the American people have called me. I am deeply sensible of that weighty responsibility. I cannot but know what you all know, that without a name, perhaps without a reason why I should have a name, there has fallen upon me a task such as did not rest even upon the father of his country, and so feeling I cannot but turn and look for that support without which, it will be impossible for me to perform that great task. I turn then and look to the American people and to that God who has never forsaken them. Allusion has been made to the interest felt in relation to the policy of the new administration. In this I have received from some a degree of credit for having kept silence and from others some deprecation. I still think that I was right. I have not maintained silence from any want of real anxiety. It is a good thing that there is no more than anxiety, for there is nothing going wrong. It is a consoling circumstance that when we look out there is nothing that really hurts anybody. We entertain different views upon political questions, but nobody is suffering anything. This is a most consoling circumstance, and from it we may conclude that all we want is time, patience, and a reliance on that God who has never forsaken his people. During a brief halt of the train at Steubenville, where a large crowd was assembled, he made the following short statement of the fundamental question at issue. I fear that the great confidence placed in my ability is unfounded. Indeed, I am sure it is. Encompassed by vast difficulties as I am, nothing shall be wanting on my part if sustained by the American people and God. I believe the devotion to the Constitution is equally great on both sides of the river. It is only the different understanding of that instrument that causes difficulty. 
The only dispute on both sides is, what are their rights? If the majority should not rule, who would be the judge? Where is such a judge to be found? We should all be bound by the majority of the American people. If not, then the minority must control. Would that be right? Would it be just or generous? Assuredly not. I reiterate that the majority should rule. If I adopt a wrong policy, the opportunity for condemnation will occur in four years' time. Then I can be turned out and a better man with better views put in my place. Necessarily omitting any description of the magnificent demonstrations and the multiplied speeches in the state and city of New York, his addresses in the capital of New Jersey must be quoted because they show a culminating earnestness of thought and purpose. To the Senate he said, I am very grateful to you for the honorable reception of which I have been the object. I cannot but remember the place that New Jersey holds in our early history. In the revolutionary struggle, few of the states among the old thirteen had more of the battlefields of the country within their limits than New Jersey. May I be pardoned if, upon this occasion, I mention that away back in my childhood, the earliest days of my being able to read, I got a hold of a small book, such a one as few of the younger members have ever seen, Weems' Life of Washington. I remember all the accounts there given of the battlefields and struggles for the liberties of the country, and none fixed themselves upon my imagination so deeply as the struggle here at Trenton, New Jersey, the crossing of the river, the contest with the Hessians, the great hardships endured at that time, all fixed themselves on my memory more than any single revolutionary event. And you all know, for you have all been boys, how these early impressions last longer than any others. I recollect thinking then, boy even though I was, that there must have been something more than common that these men struggled for. I am exceedingly anxious that that thing, that something even more than national independence, that something that held out a great promise to all the people of the world, to all time to come. I am exceedingly anxious that this union, the Constitution, and the liberties of the people shall be perpetuated in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made, and I shall be most happy indeed if I shall be an humble instrument in the hands of the Almighty, and of this his almost chosen people, for perpetuating the object of that great struggle. You have given me this reception, as I understand, without distinction of party. I learned that this body is composed of a majority of gentlemen who, in the exercise of their best judgment in the choice of a chief magistrate, did not think I was the man. I understand, nevertheless, that they came forward here to greet me as the constitutionally elected President of the United States, as citizens of the United States, to meet the man who, for the time being, is the representative of the majesty of the nation. United by a single purpose, to perpetuate the Constitution, the Union, and the liberties of the people. As such, I accept this reception more gratefully than I could do, did I believe it were tendered to me as an individual. Passing then to the Assembly Chamber, he addressed the members of the lower house in conclusion. You, Mr. Speaker, have well said that this is a time when the bravest and wisest look back with doubt and awe upon the aspect presented by our national affairs. Under these circumstances you will readily see why I should not speak in detail of the course I shall deem it best to pursue. It is proper that I should avail myself of all the information and all the time at my command in order that when the time arrives in which I must speak officially, I shall be able to take the ground which I deem the best and safest, and from which I may have no occasion to swerve. I shall endeavor to take the ground I deem most just to the north, the east, the west, the south, and the whole country. I take it, I hope, in good temper, certainly with no malice towards any section. I shall do all that may be in my power to promote a peaceful settlement of all our difficulties. The man does not live who is more devoted to peace than I am, none who would do more to preserve it, but it may be necessary to put the foot down firmly. Here the audience broke out into cheers so loud and long that for some moments it was impossible to hear Mr. Lincoln's voice. 
and if I do my duty and do right, you will sustain me, will you not? Loud cheers and cries of yes, yes, we will. Received as I am by the members of a legislature, the majority of whom do not agree with me in political sentiments, I trust that I may have your assistance in piloting the ship of state through this voyage, surrounded by perils as it is, for if it should suffer wreck now, there will be no pilot ever needed for another voyage. Perhaps in no one of the many addresses delivered during his tour was he so visibly moved and affected by his surroundings as when he spoke in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, which he visited on the 22nd of February, the anniversary of Washington's birthday. He said, I am filled with deep emotion at finding myself standing in this place, where were collected together the wisdom, the patriotism, the devotion to principle from which sprang the institutions under which we live. You have kindly suggested to me that in my hands is the task of restoring peace to our distracted country. I can say in return, sirs, that all the political sentiments I entertain have been drawn so far as I have been able to draw them from the sentiments which originated in and were given to the world from this hall. I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. I have often pondered over the dangers which were incurred by the men who assembled here and framed and adopted that declaration. I have pondered over the toils that were endured by the officers and soldiers of the army who achieved that independence. I have often inquired of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this confederacy so long together. It was not the mere matter of separation of the colonies from the motherland, but that sentiment in the Declaration of Independence, which gave liberty, not alone to the people of this country, but hope to all the world for all future time. It was that which gave promise that in due time the weight would be lifted from the shoulders of all men, and that all should have an equal chance. This is the sentiment embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Now, my friends, can this country be saved on that basis? If it can, I will consider myself one of the happiest men in the world if I can help to save it. If it cannot be saved upon that principle, it will be truly awful. But if this country cannot be saved without giving up that principle, I was about to say I would rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender it. Now, in my view of the present aspect of affairs, there is no need of bloodshed and war. There is no necessity for it. I am not in favor of such a course, and I may say in advance that there will be no bloodshed unless it be forced upon the government. The government will not use force unless force is used against it. My friends, this is wholly an unprepared speech. I did not expect to be called on to say a word when I came here. I supposed it was merely to do something towards raising a flag. I may, therefore, have said something indiscreet. Cries of, no, no. But I have said nothing but what I am willing to live by, and, if it be the pleasure of Almighty God, die by. In his last speech of the series, delivered in Harrisburg, before the assembled legislature of Pennsylvania, he happily described an interesting ceremony which had taken place that same morning before leaving Philadelphia. I appear before you only for a very few brief remarks, in response to what has been said to me. I thank you most sincerely for this reception and the generous words in which support has been promised me upon this occasion. I thank your great commonwealth for the overwhelming support it recently gave, not me personally, but the cause, which I think a just one, in the late election. Allusion has been made to the fact the interesting fact, perhaps, we should say, that I, for the first time, appear at the capital of the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania upon the birthday of the father of his country. In connection with that beloved anniversary, connected with the history of this country, I have already gone through one exceedingly interesting scene this morning in the ceremonies at Philadelphia. Under the conduct of gentlemen there, I was for the first time allowed the privilege of standing in the old Independence Hall to have a few words addressed to me there, and opening up to me an opportunity of expressing, with much regret, that I had not more time to express something of my own feelings. 
excited by the occasion somewhat to harmonize and give shape to the feelings that had really been the feelings of my whole life. Besides this, our friends there had provided a magnificent flag of the country. They had arranged it so that I was given the honor of raising it, and when it went up I was pleased that it went to its place by the strength of my own feeble arm. When, according to the arrangement, the cord was pulled and it floated gloriously to the wind without an accident, in the bright glowing sunshine of the morning, I could not help hoping that there was, in the entire success of that beautiful ceremony, at least something of an omen of what is to come. Nor could I help feeling then, as I have often felt, in the whole of that proceeding I was a very humble instrument. I had not provided the flag, I had not made the arrangements for elevating it to its place, I had applied but a very small portion of my feeble strength in raising it. In the whole transaction I was in the hands of the people who had arranged it, and if I can have the same generous cooperation of the people of the nation, I think the flag of our country may yet be kept flaunting gloriously. I recur for a moment, but to repeat some words uttered at the hotel in regard to what has been said about the military support which the general government may expect from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in a proper emergency. To guard against any possible mistake do I recur to this. It is not with any pleasure that I contemplate the possibility that a necessity may arise in this country for the use of the military arm. While I am exceedingly gratified to see the manifestation upon your streets of your military force here, and exceedingly gratified at your promise to use that force upon a proper emergency, while I make these acknowledgments, I desire to repeat, in order to preclude any possible misconstruction, that I do most sincerely hope that we shall have no use for them, that it will never become their duty to shed blood, and most especially never to shed fraternal blood. I promise that so far as I may have wisdom to direct, if so painful a result shall in any wise be brought about, it shall be through no fault of mine. End of chapter 19 Read by Veronica Jenkins in Ottawa, Illinois Chapter 20 from Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, Chapter 20. On the morning of February 23, the whole country was surprised at the telegraphic announcement, coupled with diverse and generally very foggy explanations, that the president-elect, after his long and almost triumphal journey in the utmost publicity and with well-nigh universal greetings of goodwill, had suddenly abandoned his announced program and made a quick and secret night journey through Baltimore to the federal capital. Public opinion at the time and for years afterwards was puzzled by the event and the utmost contrariety of comment ranging from the highest praise to the severest detraction which caricature, ridicule, and denunciation could express was long current. In the course of time, the narratives of the principal actors in the affair have been published and a sufficient statement of the facts and motives involved may at length be made. The newspaper stated without any prompting or suggestion from Mr. Lincoln that an extensive plot to assassinate him on his expected trip through Baltimore about midday of Saturday had been discovered, which plot, the earlier and unknown passage on Friday night, disconcerted and prevented. This theory has neither been proved nor disproved by the lapse of time. Mr. Lincoln did not entertain it in this form, nor base his course upon it. But subsequent events did clearly demonstrate the possibility and probability of attempted personal violence from the fanatical impulse of individuals or the sudden anger of a mob, and confirmed the propriety of his decision. 
The threats of secession, revolution, plots to seize Washington, to burn the public buildings, to prevent the count of electoral votes, and the inauguration of the new president, which had for six weeks filled the newspapers of the country, caused much uneasiness about the personal safety of Mr. Lincoln, particularly among the railroad officials over whose lines he was making his journey, and to no one of them so much as to Mr. S. M. Felton, the president of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railway, whose line formed the connecting link from the north to the south, from a free to a slave state, from the region of absolute loyalty to the territory of quasi-rebellion. Independently of politics, the city of Baltimore at that time bore an unenviable reputation as containing a dangerous and disorderly element. Her roughs had a degree of newspaper notoriety by no means agreeable to quiet and non-combative strangers. But Baltimore and other portions of Maryland were also profoundly moved by the incipient rebellion. Governor Hicks had been plied with persuasion, protest, and even threats of personal violence to induce him to convene the legislature of that state so that secession might begin under a legal pretext. The investigation of the Select Committee of Five, though it found no organized plot to seize the capital of the nation, gave abundant traces of secession conspiracy of various degrees especially of half-formed military companies organizing to prevent northern troops from passing through Baltimore to Washington or other points in the south. As part and parcel of this scheme, the railroads were to be destroyed and the bridges burned. The events of April as they actually occurred had already been planned, informally at least, in January. Aside from patriotism, the duty of protecting the tracks and bridges of the railroad of which he was president induced Mr. Felton to call to his aid Mr. Allen Pinkerton, chief of a Chicago detective agency whom he had employed on an important matter before. He was a man of great skill and resources, writes Mr. Felton. I furnished him with a few hints and at once set him on the track with eight assistants. There were then drilling upon the line of the railroad some three military organizations professedly for home defense, pretending to be union men, and in one or two instances tendering their services to the railroad in case of trouble. Their propositions were duly considered, but the defense of the road was never entrusted to their tender mercies. The first thing done was to enlist a volunteer in each of these military companies. They pretended to come from New Orleans and Mobile, and did not appear to be wanting in sympathy for the South. They were furnished with uniforms at the expense of the road, and drilled as often as their associates in arms, became initiated into all the secrets of the organization, and reported every day or two to their chief who immediately reported to me the designs and plans of these military companies. One of these organizations was loyal, but the other two were disloyal, and fully in the plot to destroy the bridges and march to Washington to wrest it from the hands of the legally constituted authorities. Every nook and corner of the road and its vicinity was explored by the chief and his detectives, and the secret working of secession and treason laid bare and brought to light. Societies were joined in Baltimore, and various modes known to and practiced only by detectives were resorted to to win the confidence of the conspirators and get into their secrets. The plan worked well, and the midnight plottings and daily consultations of the conspirators were treasured up as a guide to our future plans for thwarting them. It was made as certain as strong circumstantial and positive evidence could make it that there was a plot to burn the bridges and destroy the road and murder Mr. Lincoln 
on his way to Washington if it turned out that he went there before troops were called. If troops were first called, then the bridges were to be destroyed and Washington cut off and taken possession of by the South. I at once organized and armed a force of about 200 men whom I distributed along the line between the Susquehanna and Baltimore, principally at the bridges. These men were drilled secretly and regularly by drill masters and were apparently employed in whitewashing the bridges, putting on some six or seven coats of whitewash saturated with salt and alum to make the outside of the bridges as nearly fireproof as possible. This whitewashing, so extensive in its application, became the nine days' wonder of the neighborhood. Thus the bridges were strongly guarded, and a train was arranged so as to concentrate all the forces at one point in case of trouble. The program of Mr. Lincoln was changed, and it was decided by him that he would go to Harrisburg from Philadelphia, and thence over the northern central road by, by day to Baltimore, and thence to Washington. We were then informed by our detective that the attention of the conspirators was turned from our road to the northern central, and that they would be there awaiting the coming of Mr. Lincoln. It appeared from the reports of Pinkerton's detectives that among the more suspicious indications were the very free and threatening expressions of a man named Farandini, an Italian, sometime a barber at Barnum's Hotel in Baltimore, but who had become captain of one of the military companies organized in the city to promote secession. Farandini's talk may not have been conclusive proof of a conspiracy, but it showed his own intent to commit assassination and conveyed the inference of a plot. Coupled with the fact that the Baltimore air was full of similar threats, it established the probability of a mob and a riot. Add to this Farandini's testimony, February 5, 1861, that he was then drilling a company, 15 members of constitutional guards in Baltimore, formed for the express purpose to prevent northern volunteer companies from passing through the state of Maryland to come here, Washington, to help the United States troops or anybody else to invade the South in any shape whatever. Also that another corps called the National Volunteers had formed to protect their state and began drilling the previous Saturday. Also that he had heard that the Minutemen have 15 companies in Baltimore, and we have the direct evidence of extensive organization and strong presumption of the uses to which it could be turned. Then, if we remember that riot, murder, and bridge burning actually took place in Baltimore two months later, in exact accordance with the plans and ideas formulated, both in the loose talk and the solemn testimony by Ferrandini and others, we are unavoidably driven to the conclusion that Mr. Felton, General Scott, Governor Hicks, and others had abundant cause for the very serious apprehensions under which they acted. N. B. Judd, a resident of Chicago of peculiar prominence in Illinois politics and a personal friend of Lincoln, was perhaps the most active and influential member of the suite of the president-elect. Pinkerton, the detective, knew Judd personally, and as the presidential party approached, notified him by letter at Buffalo and by special messenger at New York of the investigations he was making in Baltimore. Judd as yet said nothing of the matter to anyone. When the party arrived in Philadelphia, however, he was instantly called to a conference with Mr. Felton and the detective. Pinkerton laid his reports before the two, and after an hour's examination, both were convinced that the proofs of the plot to assassinate the president-elect were as serious and important as in the nature of things such evidence can ever be. He immediately took Pinkerton with him to Mr. Lincoln's room at the Continental Hotel, to whom the whole story was repeated, and where Judd advised that in the opinion both of Mr. Felton and himself, Mr. Lincoln's safety required him to proceed that same evening on the 11 o'clock train. If you follow the course suggested, continued Judd, 
you will necessarily be subjected to the scoffs and sneers of your enemies and the disapproval of your friends who cannot be made to believe in the existence of so desperate a plot. Mr. Lincoln replied that he appreciated these suggestions, but that he could stand anything that was necessary. Then rising from his seat, he said, I cannot go tonight. I have promised to raise the flag over Independence Hall tomorrow morning and to visit the legislature at Harrisburg. Beyond that, I have no engagements. Hitherto, all Lincoln's movements had been made under the invitation, arrangement, direction, and responsibility of committees of legislatures, governors of states, and municipal authorities of towns and cities. No such call or greeting, however, had come from Maryland. No resolutions of welcome from her legislature, no invitation from her governor, no municipal committee from Baltimore. The sole proffers of friendship and hospitality from the Commonwealth came from two citizens in their private capacity, Mr. Jiddings, president of the Northern Central Railroad, who tendered a dinner to Mr. Lincoln and his family, and Mr. Coleman of the Utah House, who extended a similar invitation to the president-elect and his suite. Appreciating fully these acts of personal courtesy, Mr. Lincoln yet felt that there was no evidence before him that the official authority of the city would be exercised to restrain the unruly elements which would on such an occasion densely pack the streets of Baltimore. During their ten days' experience on the journey thus far, both he and his suite had had abundant evidence as to how completely exposed and perfectly helpless every individual of the party, and especially Mr. Lincoln, was at times, even amid the friendliest feeling and the kindest attention. He had been almost crushed in the corridor of the State House at Columbus. Arriving after dark in the Pittsburgh depot, a stampede of the horses of a small cavalry escort had seriously endangered his carriage and its occupants. At Buffalo, Major Hunter of his suite had his arm broken by a sudden rush of the crowd. If with all the goodwill and precautions of police and military such perils were unavoidable in friendly cities, what might happen where authorities were indifferent? where municipal control and public order were lax, and where prejudice, hostility, and smoldering insurrection animated the masses of people surging about the carriages of an unprotected street procession. Yet with all these considerations, Mr. Lincoln could not entirely convince himself that a deliberate plot to murder him was in existence. I made arrangements, however, with Mr. Judd for my return to Philadelphia the next night if I should be convinced that there was danger in going through Baltimore. I told him that if I should meet at Harrisburg, as I had at other places, a delegation to go with me to Baltimore, I should feel safe and go on. Mr. Judd devoted the remainder of the afternoon and nearly the whole of the night of February 21 to the discussion and perfection of arrangements for a night journey through Baltimore as suggested by himself and Mr. Felton, and as conditionally accepted by the President-elect. Only four persons joined in this discussion, Mr. Judd, Mr. Pinkerton, Mr. Franciscus, General Manager of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and Mr. Henry Sanford, representing Colonel E. S. Sanford, President of the American Telegraph Company. At four o'clock a.m., the party separated, having agreed on the following plan. That after the reception at Harrisburg, a special train consisting of a baggage car and one passenger car, starting at 6 p.m., should convey Mr. Lincoln and one companion back to Philadelphia, the track between the two cities to be kept clear of everything. That Mr. Felton at Philadelphia should detain the 11 o'clock clock p.m. Baltimore train until the arrival of the special train from Harrisburg, that Pinkerton should have a carriage ready in which to proceed through Philadelphia from one depot to the other, that an employee of his should engage berths in the sleeping car of the Baltimore train, 
that Mr. Sanford should so disconnect the wires as to make any telegraphing between the several points within certain hours impossible, and that Mr. Lincoln should have for his single escort and companion Ward H. Lehman of his suite, a devoted personal friend from Illinois, young, active, and of almost Herculean frame and strength. At six o'clock on the morning of February 22, the appointed flag raising by the president-elect over Independence Hall in Philadelphia was duly celebrated. And on the trip to Harrisburg, which followed as soon as possible, Mr. Judd communicated the details of his plan to Mr. Lincoln. Before leaving Philadelphia, Lincoln had received at the Continental Hotel the visit of Frederick W. Seward, who came as a special messenger from his father in Washington to place the following correspondence in his hands. Seward to Lincoln, Washington, February 21, 1861. My dear sir, my son goes express to you. He will show you a report made by our detective to General Scott and by him communicated to me this morning. I deem it so important as to dispatch my son to meet you wherever he may find you. I concur with General Scott in thinking it best for you to reconsider your arrangement. No one here but General Scott, myself, and the bearer is aware of this communication. I should have gone with it myself, but for the peculiar sensitiveness about my attendance at the Senate at this crisis. Very truly yours, William H. Seward. General Scott to Seward, February 21, 1861. My dear sir, please receive my friend Colonel Stone, chief of General Waitman's staff and a distinguished young officer with me in Mexico. He has an important communication to make. Yours truly, Winfield Scott. Colonel Stone's report, February 21, 1861. A New York detective officer who has been on duty in Baltimore for three weeks past reports this morning that there is serious danger of violence and the assassination of Mr. Lincoln in his passage through that city should the time of that passage be known. He states that there are banded rowdies holding secret meetings and that he has heard threats of mobbing and violence and has himself heard men declare that if Mr. Lincoln was to be assassinated, they would like to be the men. He states further that it is only within the past few days that he has considered there was any danger, but now he deems it imminent. He deems the danger one which the authorities and people in Baltimore cannot guard against. All risk might be easily avoided by a change in the traveling arrangements, which would bring Mr. Lincoln and a portion of his party through Baltimore by a night train without previous notice. Here was a new and most serious additional warning. The investigation on which it was based was altogether independent of that made by Pinkerton and entirely unknown to him. Colonel Stone, it will be remembered, was the officer to whom General Scott entrusted the organization and command of the district militia for the defense of Washington and the general supervision and control of the city. The detectives, three in number, were from New York and at the request of Colonel Stone, had been selected and placed on duty by Mr. Kennedy, Superintendent of Police of New York City. In both cases, similar observations had been made and similar conclusions arrived at. Warned thus of danger by concurrent evidence too grave to be disregarded and advised to avoid it, not only by Judd and Felton in Philadelphia, but now also by Mr. Seward, the chief of his new cabinet, and by General Scott, the chief of the army, Mr. Lincoln could no longer hesitate to adopt their suggestion. Whether the evidence would prove ultimately true or whether a violence upon him would be attempted was not the question. The existence of the danger was pointed out and certified by an authority he had no right to disregard. 
The trust he bore was not merely the personal safety of an individual, but the fortune and perhaps the fate of the government of the nation. It was his imperative duty to shun all possible and unnecessary peril. A man of less courage would have shrunk from what must inevitably appear to the public like a sign of timidity. But Lincoln on this and other occasions concerned himself only with the larger issues at stake, leaving minor and especially personal consequences to take care of themselves. Frederick W. Seward was therefore informed by Judd that he could say to his father that all had been arranged and that so far as human foresight could predict, Mr. Lincoln would be in Washington at six o'clock the next morning. With this message, Mr. Seward returned to Washington, while Mr. Lincoln and his suite proceeded to Harrisburg, where on that same Friday, the 22nd of February, he was officially received by the governor and the legislature of Pennsylvania. No other member of Mr. Lincoln's suite had as yet been notified of anything connected with the matter, but Mr. Judd had suggested to him that he felt exceedingly the responsibility of the advice he had given and the steps he had taken, and that he thought it due to the age and standing of the leading gentlemen of the president-elect's party that at least they should be informed and consulted. To the above suggestions, writes Judd, Mr. Lincoln assented, adding, I reckon they will laugh at us, Judd, but you'd better get them together. It was arranged that after the reception at the State House and before dinner, the matter should be fully laid before the following gentlemen of the party, Judge David Davis, Colonel E. V. Sumner, Major David Hunter, Captain John Pope, and Ward H. Lehman. Mr. Judd's narrative then further recites what occurred. The meeting thus arranged took place in the parlor of the hotel, Mr. Lincoln being present. The facts were laid before them by me, together with the details of the proposed plan of action. There was a diversity of opinion and some warm discussion, and I was subjected to a very rigid cross-examination. Judge Davis, who had expressed no opinion but contented himself with asking rather pointed questions, turned to Mr. Lincoln, who had been listening to the whole discussion, and said, Well, Mr. Lincoln, what is your own judgment upon this matter? Mr. Lincoln replied, I have thought over this matter considerably since I went over the ground with Pinkerton last night. The appearance of Mr. Frederick Seward with warning from another source confirms Mr. Pinkerton's belief. Unless there are some other reasons besides fear of ridicule, I am disposed to carry out Judd's plan. Judge Davis then said, That settles the matter, gentlemen. Colonel Sumner said, So be it, gentlemen. It is against my judgment, but I have undertaken to go to Washington with Mr. Lincoln, and I shall do it. I tried to convince him that any additional person added to the risk, but the spirit of the gallant old soldier was up, and debate was useless. The party separated about 4 p.m., the others to go to the dinner table, and myself to go to the railroad station and the telegraph office. At a quarter to six, I was back at the hotel, and Mr. Lincoln was still at the table. In a few moments, the carriage drove up to the side door of the hotel. Either Mr. Nicolay or Mr. Lehman called Mr. Lincoln from the table. He went to his room, changed his dinner dress for a traveling suit, and came down with a soft hat sticking in his pocket and his shawl on his arm. As the party passed through the hall, I said in a low tone, Lehman, go ahead. As soon as Mr. Lincoln is in the carriage, drive off. The crowd must not be allowed to identify him. Mr. Lehman went first to the carriage. Colonel Sumner was following close after Mr. Lincoln. I put my hand gently on his shoulder. He turned to see what was wanted, and before I could explain, the carriage was off. The situation was a little awkward, to use no stronger terms, for a few moments until I said to the colonel, when we get to Washington, Mr. Lincoln shall determine what apology is due to you. It is needless to describe the various stages of Mr. Lincoln's journey. 
The plan arranged by the railroad and telegraph officials was carried out to the smallest detail without delay or special incident, and without coming to the knowledge of any person on the train or elsewhere except those to whom the secret was confided. The President-elect and his single companion were safely and comfortably carried from Harrisburg to Philadelphia, and at midnight took their berths in the sleeping car of the regular train from New York passing through Baltimore, unrecognized and undisturbed, and arriving in Washington at six o'clock on the morning of February 23. Here they were met by Mr. Seward and E.B. Washburn and conducted to Willard's Hotel. The family, Sweet, made the journey direct from Harrisburg to Baltimore according to the program, arriving in Washington late that evening. They encountered in Baltimore no incivility nor any unusual disorder, though, as elsewhere, dense crowds very inadequately controlled by the police surrounded the railroad depots and filled the streets through which their carriages passed. All motive, however, to commit an assault was now passed, since it was everywhere known that Mr. Lincoln was not with the party, but already at his destination. End of ch chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Nordell. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3 by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 21, Lincoln's Inauguration. Arrived in Washington and installed in the spacious parlors of Willard's Hotel fronting on Pennsylvania Avenue, Mr. Lincoln had a little more than a week to prepare for the inauguration. Of this, a part was taken up with the customary introductory visits to the outgoing president and cabinet, where Mr. Buchanan and his counselors received him with cordial politeness, to the two houses of Congress where he was enthusiastically welcomed by friends and somewhat sullenly greeted by opponents, and to the Supreme Court of the United States, whose venerable chief and associate justices extended to him an affable recognition as the lawful successor in constitutional rulership. In his own parlors also the President-elect received numerous demonstrations of respect. President Buchanan at his cabinet officially returned his visit. The peace conference embracing distinguished delegates from all the free states and the border slave states and headed by their chairman, ex-President Tyler, waited upon him in a body in pursuance of a formal and unanimous peace resolution. His presidential rivals, Douglas and Breckinridge, each made him a call of courtesy. The mayor and the municipal council came in an official visit of welcome. Several delegations and many high functionaries repeated these ceremonial calls, which again were supplemented by numerous cordial invitations to private hospitality. While all these tokens of respect were sincere and loyal, there was a deep anxiety in public feeling to learn how the new president would deal with an organized rebellion, which had been allowed by his predecessor to establish itself without the least hindrance, and which, while committing repeated acts of war, had as yet perpetrated no violence or bloodshed, only, however, because it had met neither official nor military resistance. Mr. Lincoln's chief labor during this interim was consultation with the more influential leaders of the Republican Party who, either as members of Congress, delegates in the Peace Conference, or as casual or special visitors to the Capitol, had a final word to offer about the composition of his cabinet or the policy of his administration. Thus, from the 23rd of February to the 4th of March, every moment of the day and many hours of the night were occupied. As his doors were at all times freely opened, and as his lifelong habit was to listen patiently to counsel from all quarters, it is safe to say that no president ever approached his task better informed of the temper of his followers and decided more deliberately upon his general course of conduct yet here as afterwards he followed the practice of holding his convictions open to the latest moment and of not irrevocably committing himself to specific acts till the instant of their execution but neither in the formation of his cabinet nor in his proposed administrative policy did this final consultation with his party friends work any essential alteration of his own well-formed opinions 
his executive counselors were chosen upon plans long since matured in his own mind and his inaugural address composed and privately printed at springfield received on the last days several slight changes in the text and a number of verbal changes mainly suggested by the very few individuals to whom he submitted it judge david davis read it while in springfield o h browning read it in indianapolis after the presidential journey was begun and suggested perhaps the most important modification which was made francis p blair senior read it in washington and highly commended it suggesting no changes as would be natural in any great political leader scanning his successful rival's first act of practical statesmanship the most careful scrutiny of the document was made by mr seward the president-elect handed him a copy some time during the day of his arrival and the next day being sunday mr seward spent part of it in examining the inaugural and in writing out the list of alterations and amendments which he thought advisable on sunday evening he wrote the following letter which with his list of suggestions he sent to mr lincoln sunday evening february twenty fourth eighteen sixty one my dear sir i have suggested many changes of little importance severally but in their general effect tending to soothe the public mind of course the concessions are as they ought to be if they are to be of avail at the cost of the winning the triumphant party i do not fear their displeasure they will be loyal whatever is said not so the defeated irritated angered frenzied party i my dear sir have devoted myself singly to the study of the case here with advantages of access and free communication with all parties of all sections i have a common responsibility and interest with you and i shall adhere to you faithfully in every case you must therefore allow me to speak frankly and candidly in this spirit i declare to you my conviction that the second and third paragraphs even if modified as i propose in my amendments will give such advantages to the disunionists that virginia and maryland will secede and we shall within ninety perhaps within sixty days be obliged to fight the south for this capital with a divided north for our alliance and we shall not have one loyal magistrate or ministerial officer south of the potomac in that case the dismemberment of the republic would date from the inauguration of a republican administration i therefore most respectfully counsel the omission of those paragraphs i know the tenacity of party friends and i honor and respect it but i know also that they know nothing of the real peril of the crisis it has not been their duty to study it as it has been mine only the soothing words which i have spoken have saved us and carried us along thus far every loyal man and indeed every disloyal man in the south will tell you this your case is quite like that of jefferson he brought the first republican party into power against and over a party ready to resist and dismember the government partisan as he was he sank the partisan in the patriot in his inaugural address and propitiated his adversaries by declaring we are all federalists all republicans i could wish that you would think it wise to follow this example in this crisis be sure that while all your administrative conduct will be in harmony with republican principles and policy you cannot lose the republican party by practicing in your advent to office the magnanimity of a victor very faithfully your friend william h seward general remarks the argument is strong and conclusive and ought not to be in any way abridged or modified but something besides or in addition to argument is needful to meet and remove prejudice and passion in the south and despondency and fear in the east some words of affection some of calm and cheerful confidence mr seward only suggested two important changes one to omit the reference to the chicago platform mentioned in his letter with the announcement that the president would follow the principles therein declared two instead of a declaration of intention to reclaim hold occupy and possess the places and property belonging to the government to speak ambiguously about the exercise of power and to hint rather at forbearance the other modifications in his list were simple changes of phraseology affecting only the style and changing no argument or proposition of policy whether these were on the whole an improvement depends perhaps upon the taste of the critic whether he prefers a full and formal or a direct and sententious diction the literary styles of mr seward and mr lincoln differed essentially mr seward was strongly addicted to long sonorous sentences and unusually felicitous in them amplifying his thought to general application and to philosophic breadth 
mr lincoln liked to condense his idea into a short sentence with legal conciseness and specific point in the present crisis mr seward's policy as announced in his twelfth of january speech was quote, to meet prejudice with conciliation exaction with concession which surrenders no principle and violence with the right hand of peace End quote. mr lincoln's policy was without prejudice or passion to state frankly and maintain firmly the position and doctrines assumed by the american people in the late presidential election mr seward believed himself to be the past and the coming peacemaker and thus his whole effort was to soften to postpone to use diplomacy his corrections of the inaugural were in this vein a more careful qualification of statement a greater ambiguity of phrase a gain in smoothness but a loss in brevity and force mr lincoln adopted either in whole or in part nearly all the amendments proposed by mr seward but those which he himself modified and such further alterations as he added of his own accord show that whatever the inaugural gained in form and style in these final touches came as much through his own power of literary criticism as from the more practised pen of mr seward the most vital change in the document was in adopting a suggestion of his friend browning not to announce a purpose to recapture moultrie and other forts and places already seized by the rebels but for the present to declare only that he would hold those yet in possession of the government one other important change mr lincoln himself made in the original draft any idea of an amendment of the constitution was rather repelled than invited in the revision mr lincoln said he should quote, favor rather than oppose a fair opportunity being afforded the people to act upon it end quote, and further expressed his willingness to accept the amendment recently proposed by congress all these various alterations proposed or adopted are added as notes to the text of the inaugural in this chapter where the critical student may compare them it was in the closing paragraph of the inaugural that mr lincoln's mastery in literary art clearly revealed itself mr seward as we have seen in the postscript of his letter thought that quote, some words of affection some of calm and cheerful confidence to meet and remove prejudice and passion in the south and despondency and fear in the east end quote, ought to be added in the original draft the concluding sentence addressed itself to quote, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen end quote, was quote, with you and not with me is the solemn question shall it be peace or a sword end quote this ending mr seward proposed to strike out and submitted two drafts of a closing paragraph to take its place one of them was long and commonplace under the other lurked a fine poetic thought cumbrously expressed this mr lincoln took and with his more artistic sense transformed it into an illustration of perfect and tender beauty the acts of the last ten days of mr buchanan's administration were entirely colorless and negative the deliberations and recommendations of the much vaunted peace conference proved as worthless as dead sea fruit the concluding labors of congress were of considerable importance but of no immediate effect there was therefore as little in public affairs as in public advice to cause the president-elect to reconsider or remodel his thoughts and purposes inauguration day fell on monday and the ceremonies took place with unusual attention to display and uncommon precautions to ensure public order and the safety of all the participants general stone who had charge of the military arrangements has related them with some minuteness on the afternoon of the third of march general scott held a conference at his headquarters there being present his staff general sumner and myself and there was arranged the program of the procession president buchanan was to drive to willard's hotel and call upon the president-elect the two were to ride in the same carriage between double files of a squadron of the district of columbia cavalry the company of sappers and miners were to march in front of the presidential carriage and the infantry and riflemen of the district of columbia were to follow it riflemen in squads were to be placed on the roofs of certain commanding houses which i had selected along pennsylvania avenue with orders to watch the windows on the opposite side and to fire upon them in case any attempt should be made to fire from those windows on the presidential carriage the small force of regular cavalry which had arrived was to guard the side street crossings of pennsylvania avenue and to move from one to another during the passage of the procession a battalion of district of columbia troops were to be placed near the steps of the capitol and riflemen in the windows of the wings of the capitol on the arrival of the presidential party at the capitol the troops were to be stationed so as to return in the same order after the ceremony general stone does not mention another item of preparation that on the brow of the hill not far from the north entrance to the capitol 
commanding both the approach and the broad plateau of the east front was stationed a battery of flying artillery in the immediate vicinity of which general scott remained a careful observer of the scene during the entire ceremonies ready to take personal command and direction should any untoward occurrence render it necessary the closing duties of the session which expired at noon kept president buchanan at the capitol till the last moment accompanied by the committee of the senate he reached willard's hotel and conducted the president-elect to his carriage in which side by side they rode in the procession undisturbed by the slightest disorder when they reached the senate chamber already densely packed with officials and civilians the ceremony of swearing in the vice-president was soon performed then in a new procession of dignitaries mr lincoln was escorted through the corridor of the great edifice to the east portico where below the platform stood an immense throng in waiting the principal actors the senate committee of arrangements the outgoing president the president-elect and his family the chief justice in his robe the clerk of the court with the bible took their places in a central group on the front of the platform in full view of the waiting multitude around this central group other justices in their robes senators representatives officials and prominent guests crowded to their seats to the imaginative spectator there might have been something emblematic in the architectural features of the scene the construction of the great dome of the capitol was in mid-progress and huge derricks held by a network of steel ropes towered over the incomplete structure in the grounds in front stood the bronze statue of liberty not then lifted to the pedestal from which she now greets the rising sun at that moment indeed it required little poetic illusion to fancy her looking with a mute appeal for help to the man who was the centre of all eyes and hearts and could she have done so her gaze would already have been rewarded with a vision of fateful prophecy for in the central group of this inauguration ceremony there confronted each other four historic personages in the final act of a political drama which in its scope completeness and consequence will bear comparison with those most famous in human record senator douglas the author of the repeal of the missouri compromise representing the legislative power of the american government chief justice tawney author of the dred scott decision representing the influence of the judiciary and president buchanan who by his lecompton measures and messages had used the whole executive power and patronage to intensify and perpetuate the mischiefs born of the repeal and the dictum fourth in the group stood abraham lincoln president-elect illustrating the vital political truth announced in that sentence of his cincinnati speech in which he declared the people of these united states are the rightful masters of both congresses and courts not to overthrow the constitution but to overthrow the men who pervert the constitution when the cheers which greeted his appearance had somewhat abated senator edward d baker of oregon rose and introduced mr lincoln to the audience and stepping forward the president-elect in a firm clear voice thoroughly practiced in addressing the huge open-air assemblages of the west read his inaugural address to which every ear listened with eagerness the inaugural address fellow citizens of the united states in compliance with a custom as old as the government itself i appear before you to address you briefly and to take in your presence the oath prescribed by the constitution of the united states to be taken by the president before he enters on the execution of his office i do not consider it necessary at present for me to discuss those matters of administration about which there is no special anxiety or excitement apprehension seems to exist among the people of the southern states that by the accession of a republican administration their property and their peace and personal security are to be endangered there has never been any reasonable cause for such apprehension indeed the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and been open to their inspection it is found in nearly all the published speeches of him who now addresses you i do but quote from one of those speeches when i declare that i have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists i believe i have no lawful right to do so and i have no inclination to do so those who nominated and elected me did so with full knowledge that i had made this and many similar declarations and had never recanted them and more than this they placed in the platform for my acceptance and as a law to themselves and to me the clear and emphatic resolution which i now read 
resolved that the maintenance inviolate of the rights of the states and especially the right of each state to order and control its own domestic institutions according to its own judgment exclusively is essential to that balance of power on which the perfection and endurance of our political fabric depend and we denounce the lawless invasion by armed force of the soil of any state or territory no matter under what pretext as among the gravest of crimes i now reiterate these sentiments and in doing so i only press upon the public attention the most conclusive evidence of which the case is susceptible that the property peace and security of no section are to be in any wise endangered by the now incoming administration i add too that all the protection which consistently with the constitution and the laws can be given will be cheerfully given to all the states when lawfully demanded for whatever cause as cheerfully to one section as to another there is much controversy about the delivering up of fugitives from service or labor the clause i now read is as plainly written in the constitution as any other of its provisions no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due it is scarcely questioned that this provision was intended by those who made it for the reclaiming of what we call fugitive slaves, and the intention of the lawgiver is the law. All members of Congress swear their support to the whole Constitution, to this provision as much as to any other. To the proposition, then, that slaves, whose cases come within the terms of this clause, shall be delivered up, their oaths are unanimous now if they would make the effort in good temper could they not with nearly equal unanimity frame and pass a law by means of which to keep good that unanimous oath there is some difference of opinion whether this clause should be enforced by national or by state authority but surely that difference is not a very material one if the slave is to be surrendered it can be of but little consequence to him or to others by which authority it is done and should any one in any case be content that his oath shall go unkept on a mere unsubstantial controversy as to how it shall be kept again in any law upon this subject ought not all the safeguards of liberty known in civilized and humane jurisprudence to be introduced so that a free man be not in any case surrendered as a slave and might it not be well at the same time to provide by law for the enforcement of that clause in the constitution which guarantees that the citizen of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states i take the oath of office to-day with no mental reservations and with no purpose to construe the constitution or laws by any hypercritical rules and while i do not choose now to specify particular acts of congress as proper to be enforced i do suggest that it will be much safer for all both in official and private stations to conform to and abide by all those acts which stand unrepealed than to violate any of them trusting to find impunity in having them held to be unconstitutional it is seventy-two years since the first inauguration of a president under our national constitution during that period fifteen different and greatly distinguished citizens have in succession administered the executive branch of the government they have conducted it through many perils and generally with great success yet with all this scope of precedent i now enter upon the same task for the brief constitutional term of four years under great and peculiar difficulty a disruption of the federal union heretofore only menaced is now formidably attempted i hold that in contemplation of universal law and of the constitution the union of these states is perpetual perpetuity is implied if not expressed in the fundamental law of all national governments it is safe to assert that no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination continue to execute all the express provisions of our national constitution and the union will endure for ever it being impossible to destroy it except by some action not provided for in the instrument itself again if the united states be not a government proper but an association of states in the nature of contract merely can it as a contract be peaceably unmade by less than all the parties who made it one party to a contract may violate it break it so to speak but does it not require all to lawfully rescind it descending from these general principles we find the proposition that in legal contemplation the union is perpetual confirmed by the history of the union itself 
the union is much older than the constitution it was formed in fact by the articles of association in seventeen seventy four it was matured and continued by the declaration of independence in seventeen seventy six it was further matured and the faith of all the then thirteen states expressly plighted and engaged that it should be perpetual by the articles of confederation in seventeen seventy eight and finally in seventeen eighty seven one of the declared objects for ordaining and establishing the constitution was to form a more perfect union but if destruction of the union by one or by a part only of the states be lawfully possible the union is less perfect than before the constitution having lost the vital element of perpetuity it follows from these views that no state upon its own mere motion can lawfully get out of the union that resolves and ordinances to that effect are legally void and that acts of violence within any state or states against the authority of the united states are insurrectionary or revolutionary according to circumstances i therefore consider that in view of the constitution and the laws the union is unbroken and to the extent of my ability i shall take care as the constitution itself expressly enjoins upon me that the laws of the union be faithfully executed in all the states doing this i deem to be only a simple duty on my part and i shall perform it so far as practicable unless my rightful masters the american people shall withhold the requisite means or in some authoritative manner direct the contrary i trust this will not be regarded as a menace but only as the declared purpose of the union that it will constitutionally defend and maintain itself in doing this there needs to be no bloodshed or violence and there shall be none unless it be forced upon the national authority the power confided to me will be used to hold occupy and possess the property and places belonging to the government and to collect the duties and imposts but beyond what may be necessary for these objects there will be no invasion no using of force against or among the people anywhere where hostility to the united states in any interior locality shall be so great and universal as to prevent competent resident citizens from holding the federal offices there will be no attempt to force obnoxious strangers among the people for that object while the strict legal right may exist in the government to enforce the exercise of these offices the attempt to do so would be so irritating and so nearly impracticable withal that i deem it better to forego for the time the uses of such offices the mails unless repelled will continue to be furnished in all parts of the union so far as possible the people everywhere shall have that sense of perfect security which is most favorable to calm thought and reflection the course here indicated will be followed unless current events and experience shall show a modification or change to be proper and in every case and exigency my best discretion will be exercised according to circumstances actually existing and with a view and a hope of a peaceful solution of the national troubles and the restoration of fraternal sympathies and affections that there are persons in one section or another who seek to destroy the union at all events and are glad of any pretext to do it i will neither affirm nor deny but if there be such i need address no word to them to those however who really love the union may i not speak before entering upon so grave a matter as the destruction of our national fabric with all its benefits its memories and its hopes would it not be wise to ascertain precisely why we do it will you hazard so desperate a step while there is any possibility that any portion of the ills you fly from have no real existence will you while the certain ills you fly to are greater than all the real ones you fly from will you risk the commission of so fearful a mistake all profess to be content in the union if all constitutional rights can be maintained is it true then that any right plainly written in the constitution has been denied i think not happily the human mind is so constituted that no party can reach to the audacity of doing this think if you can of a single instance in which a plainly written provision of the constitution has ever been denied if by the mere force of numbers a majority should deprive a minority of any clearly written constitutional right it might in a moral point of view justify revolution certainly would if such right were a vital one but such is not our case all the vital rights of minorities and of individuals are so plainly assured to them by affirmations and negations guarantees and prohibitions in the constitution that controversies never arise concerning them 
but no organic law can ever be framed with a provision specifically applicable to every question which may occur in practical administration no foresight can anticipate nor any document of reasonable length contain express provisions for all possible questions shall fugitives from labor be surrendered by national or by state authority the constitution does not expressly say may congress prohibit slavery in the territories the constitution does not expressly say must congress protect slavery in the territories the constitution does not expressly say from questions of this class spring all our constitutional controversies and we divide upon them into majorities and minorities if the minority will not acquiesce the majority must or the government must cease there is no other alternative for continuing the government is acquiescence on one side or the other if a minority in such case will secede rather than acquiesce they make a precedent which in turn will divide and ruin them for a minority of their own will secede from them whenever a majority refuses to be controlled by such minority for instance why may not any portion of a new confederacy a year or two hence arbitrarily secede again precisely as portions of the present union now claim to secede from it all who cherish disunion sentiments are now being educated to the exact temper of doing this is there such perfect identity of interests among the states to compose a new union as to produce harmony only and prevent renewed secession plainly the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy a majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations and always changing easily with deliberate changes of popular opinions and sentiments is the only true sovereign of a free people whoever rejects it does of necessity fly to anarchy or to despotism unanimity is impossible the rule of a minority as a permanent arrangement is wholly inadmissible so that rejecting the majority principle anarchy or despotism in some form is all that is left i do not forget the position assumed by some that constitutional questions are to be decided by the supreme court nor do i deny that such decisions must be binding in any case upon the parties to a suit as to the object of that suit while they are also entitled to very high respect and consideration in all parallel cases by all other departments of the governments and while it is obviously possible that such decision may be erroneous in any given case still the evil effect following it being limited to that particular case with the chance that it may be overruled and never become a precedent for other cases can better be borne than could the evils of a different practice at the same time the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the supreme court the instant they are made in ordinary litigation between parties in personal actions the people will have ceased to be their own rulers having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal nor is there in this view any assault upon the court or the judges it is a duty from which they may not shrink to decide cases properly brought before them and it is no fault of theirs if others seek to turn their decisions to political purposes one section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended this is the only substantial dispute the fugitive slave clause of the constitution and the law for the suppression of the foreign slave trade are each as well enforced perhaps as any law can ever be in a community where the moral sense of the people imperfectly supports the law itself the great body of the people abide by the dry legal obligation in both cases and a few break over in each this i think cannot be perfectly cured and it would be worse in both cases after the separation of the sections than before the foreign slave trade now imperfectly suppressed would be ultimately revived without restriction in one section while fugitive slaves now only partially surrendered would not be surrendered at all by the other physically speaking we cannot separate we cannot remove our respective sections from each other nor build an impassable wall between them a husband and wife may be divorced and go out of the presence and beyond the reach of each other but the different parts of our country cannot do this they cannot but remain face to face and intercourse either amicable or hostile must continue between them is it possible then to make that intercourse more advantageous or more satisfactory after separation than before can aliens make treaties easier than friends can make laws 
Can treaties be more faithfully enforced between aliens than laws can among friends? Suppose you go to war, you cannot fight always, and when, after much loss on both sides and no gain on either, you cease fighting, the identical old questions as to terms of intercourse are again upon you. This country with its institutions belongs to the people who inhabit it. Whenever they shall grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it, or their revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it. I cannot be ignorant of the fact that many worthy and patriotic citizens are desirous of having the national constitution amended. While I make no recommendation of amendments, I fully recognize the rightful authority of the people over the whole subject, to be exercised in either of the modes prescribed in the instrument itself, and I should, under existing circumstances, favor rather than oppose a fair opportunity being afforded the people to act upon it i will venture to add that to me the convention mode seems preferable in that it allows amendments to originate with the people themselves instead of only permitting them to take or reject propositions originated by others not especially chosen for the purpose and which might not be precisely such as they would wish to either accept or refuse I understand a proposed amendment to the Constitution, which amendment, however, I have not seen, has passed Congress to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the domestic institutions of the states, including that of persons held to service. To avoid misconstruction of what I have said, I depart from my purpose, not to speak of particular amendments, so far as to say that, holding such a provision to now be implied constitutional law, I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. The chief magistrate derives all his authority from the people, and they have conferred none upon him to fix terms for the separation of the states. The people themselves can do this also if they choose, but the executive as such has nothing to do with it. His duty is to administer the present government as it came to his hands and to transmit it, unimpaired by him, to his successor. Why should there not be a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people? is there any better or equal hope in the world in our present differences is either party without faith of being in the right if the almighty ruler of nations with his eternal truth and justice be on your side of the north or on yours of the south that truth and that justice will surely prevail by the judgment of this great tribunal of the american people by the frame of the government under which we live this same people have wisely given their public servants but little power for mischief and have with equal wisdom provided for the return of that little to their own hands at very short intervals while the people retain their virtue and vigilance no administration by any extreme of wickedness or folly can very seriously injure the government in the short space of four years my countrymen one and all think calmly and well upon this whole subject nothing valuable can be lost by taking time if there be an object to hurry any of you in hot haste to a step which you would never take deliberately that object will be frustrated by taking time but no good object can be frustrated by it such of you as are now dissatisfied still have the old constitution unimpaired and on the sensitive point the laws of your own framing under it while the new administration will have no immediate power if it would to change either if it were admitted that you who are dissatisfied hold the right side in the dispute there still is no single good reason for precipitate action intelligence patriotism christianity and a firm reliance on him who has never yet forsaken this favored land are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulty in your hands my dissatisfied fellow-countrymen and not in mine is the momentous issue of civil war the government will not assail you you can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. I am loath to close. We are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. 
a cheer greeted the conclusion chief justice tawney arose the clerk opened his bible and mr lincoln laying his hand upon it with deliberation pronounced the oath i abraham lincoln do solemnly swear that i will faithfully execute the office of president of the united states and will to the best of my ability preserve protect and defend the constitution of the united states then while the battery on the brow of the hill thundered its salute citizen buchanan and president lincoln returned to their carriage and the military procession escorted them from the capitol to the executive mansion on the threshold of which mr buchanan warmly shook the hand of his successor with cordial good wishes for his personal happiness and the national peace and prosperity end of section twenty one recording by denise nordell modesto california Chapter 22 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3 by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 22, Lincoln's Cabinet. The work of framing the new cabinet was mainly performed on the evening of the presidential election. After the polls were closed on the 6th of November, so Mr. Lincoln related a year or two later, the superintendent of the telegraph at Springfield invited him to his office to remain and read the dispatches as they should come in. He accepted the offer and reporting himself in due time at the telegraph office from which all other visitors were excluded at nine o'clock awaited the result of the eventful day soon the telegrams came thick and fast first from the neighboring precincts and counties then from the great western cities chicago st louis cincinnati and finally from the capitals of the doubtful states indiana ohio pennsylvania and the empire state of new york here in this little room in the company of two or three silent operators moving about their mysteriously clicking instruments and recording with imperturbable gravity the swift throbbing messages from near and far mr lincoln read the reports as they came first in fragmentary driblets and later in the rising and swelling stream of cheering news there was never a closer calculator of political probabilities than himself he was completely at home among election figures all his political life he had scanned tables of returns with as much care and accuracy as he analyzed and scrutinized maxims of government and platforms of parties now as formerly he was familiar with all the turning points in contested counties and close districts and knew by heart the value of each and every local loss or gain and its relation to the grand result in past years at the close of many a hot campaign he had searched out the comfort of victory from a discouraging and adverse looking column of figures or correctly read the fatal omen of defeat in some single announcement from a precinct or county silently as they were transcribed the operators handed him the messages which he laid on his knee while he adjusted his spectacles and then read and re-read several times with deliberation he had not long to wait for indications from a scattering beginning made up of encouraging local fragments the hopeful news rose to almost uninterrupted tidings of victory soon a shower of congratulatory telegrams fell from the wires and while his partisans and friends in all parts of the country were thus shaking hands with him by lightning over the result he could hear the shouts and speeches of his springfield followers gathered in the great hall of the state house across the street of course his first emotions were those of a kindling pleasure and pride at the completeness of his success but this was only a momentary glow he was indeed president-elect but with that consciousness there fell upon him the appalling shadow of his mighty task and responsibility it seemed as if he suddenly bore the whole world upon his shoulders and could not shake it off and sitting there in the yet early watches of the night he read the still coming telegrams in a sort of absent-minded mechanical routine while his inner man 
took up the crushing burden of his country's troubles and traced out the laborious path of future duties when i finally bade my friends good night and left that room said lincoln i had substantially completed the framework of my cabinet as it now exists though the grouping and combining of the new president's intended counselors occurred at this time it is no less true that some of them were selected at a much earlier date for a month after the election he gave no intimation whatever of his purpose cabinet making is at all times difficult as mr lincoln felt and acknowledged even though he had progressed thus far in his task up to the early days of december he followed the current of newspaper criticism daily read his budget of private letters gave numerous interviews to visiting politicians of prominence and influence and on the occasion of a short visit to chicago met and conferred with mr hamlin the vice president-elect all constituting most probably little else than a continued study of the cabinet question never arbitrary or dictatorial in the decision of any matter he took unusual care on this point to receive patiently and consider seriously all the advice recommendations and objections which his friends from different states had to offer his personal experience during his service as a member of congress had given him an insight into the sharp and bitter contentions which grow out of office seeking and the distribution of patronage it was therefore doubtless with the view to fortify himself in his selections that he now determined to make definite offers of some at least of the cabinet appointments the question of taking part of his constitutional advisers from among his political opponents and from the hostile or complaining southern states had been thoroughly debated in his own mind the conclusion arrived at is plainly evinced by the following written by him and inserted as a short leading editorial in the springfield journal on the morning of december twelve or thirteen eighteen sixty we hear such frequent allusions to a supposed purpose on the part of mr lincoln to call into his cabinet two or three southern gentlemen from the parties opposed to him politically that we are prompted to ask a few questions first is it known that any such gentleman of character would accept a place in the cabinet second if yea on what terms does he surrender to mr lincoln or mr lincoln to him on the political differences between them or do they enter upon the administration in open opposition to each other the high authorship of these paragraphs was not announced but the reductio ad absurdum was so complete that the newspapers were not amiss in guessing whence they emanated the selection of enemies being out of the question mr lincoln chose his ablest friends on the morning of december eighth eighteen sixty he penned the following letters springfield illinois december eighth eighteen sixty my dear sir with your permission i shall at the proper time nominate you to the senate for confirmation as secretary of state for the united states please let me hear from you at your own earliest convenience your friend and obedient servant a lincoln hon william h seward washington d c private and confidential springfield illinois december eighth eighteen sixty my dear sir in addition to the accompanying and more formal note inviting you to take charge of the state department i deem it proper to address you this rumors have got into the newspapers to the effect that the department named above would be tendered you as a compliment and with the expectation that you would decline it i beg you to be assured that i have said nothing to justify these rumors on the contrary it has been my purpose from the day of the nomination at chicago to assign you by your leave this place in the administration i have delayed so long to communicate that purpose in deference to what appeared to me a proper caution in the case nothing has been developed to change my view in the premises and i now offer you the place in the hope that you will accept it and with the belief that your position in the public eye 
your integrity ability learning and great experience all combine to render it an appointment preeminently fit to be made one word more in regard to the patronage sought with so much eagerness and jealousy i have prescribed for myself the maxim justice to all and i earnestly beseech your cooperation in keeping the maxim good your friend and obedient servant a lincoln hon william h seward washington d c this letter so full of frankness and delicate courtesy together with the brief note preceding it was sent to two intimate friends of the president-elect at washington with the request if their judgment concurred in the step to hand them to mr seward they were at once delivered and the recipient wrote the following equally courteous and characteristic answer washington december thirteenth eighteen sixty my dear sir i have had the honor of receiving as well your note which tenders to me a nomination to the senate for the office of secretary of state as also your private and confidential letter on the same subject it would be a violation of my own feelings as well as a great injustice to you if i were to leave occasion for any doubt on your part that i appreciate as highly as i ought the distinction which as the chief magistrate of the republic you propose to confer upon me and that i am fully perfectly and entirely satisfied with the sincerity and kindness of your sentiments and wishes in regard to my acceptance of it you will readily believe that coming to the consideration of so grave a subject all at once i need a little time to consider whether i possess the qualifications and temper of a minister and whether it is in such a capacity that my friends would wish that i should act if i am to continue at all in the public service these questions are moreover to be considered in view of a very anomalous condition of public affairs i wish indeed that a conference with you upon them were possible but i do not see how it could prudently be held under existing circumstances without publishing the fact of your invitation i will with your leave reflect upon it a few days and then give you my definite answer which if i know myself will be made under the influence exclusively of the most earnest desire for the success of your administration and through it for the safety honor and welfare of the union whatever may be my conclusion you may rest assured of my hearty concurrence in your views in regard to the distribution of the public offices as you have communicated them believe me my dear sir most respectfully and most faithfully your friend and humble servant william h seward the hon abraham lincoln president-elect of the united states before the end of the month mr lincoln received a short and simple note from mr seward signifying his acceptance meanwhile he had sent december thirteenth a verbal message to edward bates of st louis missouri that he would go there the next day to see and consult him about some points connected with the formation of his cabinet i thought i saw an unfitness in his coming to me and that i ought to go to him writes mr bates with his old school politeness accordingly the following saturday december fifteenth found him at mr lincoln's office in springfield they had had a personal acquaintance of some eight years and after a cordial greetings the president-elect proceeded without further prelude to tell him that since the day of the chicago nomination it had been his purpose to tender him one of the places in his cabinet some of his friends had asked the state department for him he could not now offer him this which was usually considered the first place in the cabinet for the reason that he should offer that place to mr seward in view of his ability his integrity his commanding influence and his fitness for the place he did this as a matter of duty to the party and to mr seward's many and strong friends while at the same time it accorded perfectly with his own personal inclinations notwithstanding some opposition on the part of sincere and warm friends he would therefore offer mr bates what he supposed would be more congenial and for which he was certainly in every way qualified the attorney-generalship 
Within a few days it was announced by authority that Mr. Bates had been tendered and had accepted a place in the new cabinet. His adhesion was looked upon as a sure indication of a moderate and constitutional policy by the incoming administration. The choice of Mr. Seward as the head of the cabinet, as well as his probable acceptance, was also soon whispered about among leading Republicans in Congress, rumored in the public press, and in time confirmed by a semi-official statement in the Albany Evening Journal, the organ of Mr. Seward's friend Thurlow Weed. This action of Mr. Lincoln gave the party at large general gratification, since up to the Chicago Convention, Mr. Seward had been its chief favorite. Whatever of antagonism existed between pronounced and conservative Republicans was thus happily neutralized, and the respective partisans of Mr. Seward and Mr. Bates each felt themselves bound to the new administration through the presence of a trusted leader in Mr. Lincoln's councils. To these two selections, a third had in the meantime been virtually added, as the individual held a less prominent position in the nation, and as the choice was merely provisional, it provoked no contest. On December 11, three days after writing his letter to Mr. Seward, two gentlemen called upon the president-elect to present the claims of Caleb B. Smith of Indiana, one of the pivotal states in the November election, to a seat in the cabinet. After a short talk, showing that the question had already gone through the crucible of his judgment, Mr. Lincoln replied that, being determined to act with caution and not embarrass himself with promises, he could only say that he saw no insuperable objections to Indiana's having a place or to Smith being the man. To this decision, Mr. Lincoln held firm, though very considerable pressure came upon him in behalf of another citizen of Indiana, already then distinguished and destined to attain still greater eminence. A letter which Mr. Lincoln wrote explaining why he adhered to his original choice will be of interest in this connection as illustrating one of his rules of conduct which contributed so much to his popular strength, namely neither to forget a friendship nor remember a grudge. Executive Mansion, March 8, 1861. Honorable Schuler Colfax. My dear sir, your letter of the 6th has just been handed me by Mr. Baker of Minnesota. When I said to you the other day that I wished to write you a letter, I had reference, of course, to my not having offered you a cabinet appointment. I meant to say, and now do say, you were most honorably and amply recommended, and a tender of the appointment was not withheld in any part because of anything happening in 1858. Indeed, I should have decided, as I did, easier than I did had that matter never existed. I had partly made up my mind in favor of Mr. Smith, not conclusively, of course, before your name was mentioned in that connection. When you were brought forward, I said Colfax is a young man, is already in position, is running a brilliant career, and is sure of a bright future in any event. With Smith, it is now or never. I considered either abundantly competent and decided on the ground I have stated, I now have to beg that you will not do me the injustice to suppose for a moment that I remember anything against you in malice. Yours very truly, A. Lincoln. The next step in cabinet making was much more complex as a political and personal adjustment and proved for the moment too difficult of execution. Mr. Lincoln had frequently and without reserve expressed his decided preference for ex-governor Salmon P. Chase of Ohio as his secretary of the treasury, not only on account of his acknowledged executive talent, but above all because his spotless integrity of character would at once impart confidence in the national credit, now greatly impaired by recent maladministration and liable to be lost in the convulsions of civil war. There seemed, too, an eminent fitness in this selection. He was looked upon as the most prominent and able representative of the second great constituent element of the Republican Party. The former Democrats of the northern states whose anti-slavery convictions had joined them to the new party of freedom. 
but against this preference there rose up the local claim of the state of pennsylvania and of senator simon cameron as her most prominent citizen the manufacturing industry of that state created a local sentiment in behalf of a protective tariff stronger than all other party issues protection had not indeed been a prominent question in the late election yet the republican platform proclaimed that the industrial interests should be encouraged the bulk of the new party were former tariff men mr lincoln himself had been an avowed protectionist in other political campaigns and was known not to have changed his convictions on this point stronger than all was the implied understanding in favor of protection unwritten indeed but none the less relied upon by politicians and parties now that the election was won pennsylvania claimed control of the treasury department as that branch of the government which could wield the greatest influence both upon legislation and administration for the promotion of her industrial prosperity governor chase had a wider national reputation than senator cameron but each was a leader in his own state each had received the almost unanimous complimentary vote of his own state in the chicago convention in view of these conflicting motives and interests the president-elect invited mr cameron to visit him at springfield and interviews took place between them on the thirtieth and thirty-first of december their conversations were undoubtedly intended to be frank and explicit and yet it would appear that a temporary misunderstanding grew out of them the precise nature of which has never become public history when mr cameron returned to his home he bore with him the following note springfield illinois december thirty one eighteen sixty honorable simon cameron my dear sir i think fit to notify you now that by your permission i shall at the proper time nominate you to the u s senate for the confirmation as secretary of the treasury or as secretary of war which of the two i have not yet definitely decided please answer at your earliest convenience your obedient servant a lincoln the purpose of the president-elect evidently formed with deliberation was suddenly changed but as the sequel proved for a time only if he ever explained his reason for so doing it was to witnesses who are long since dead one of the secondary causes he has himself left on record it happened that just at this juncture he received both by letter and through personal visits from pennsylvania politicians the indications of a bitter hostility to cameron from an influential and very active minority in that state headed by the newly elected governor and the chairman of the state central committee who protested in severe terms against cameron's appointment the situation required prompt action and keeping his own counsel mr lincoln wrote private springfield illinois january three eighteen sixty one honorable simon cameron my dear sir since seeing you things have developed which make it impossible for me to take you into the cabinet you will say this comes of an interview with mcclure and this is partly but not wholly true the more potent matter is wholly outside of pennsylvania and yet i am not at liberty to specify it enough that it appears to me to be sufficient and now i suggest that you write me declining the appointment in which case i do not object to its being known that it was tendered you better do this at once before things so change that you cannot honorably decline and i be compelled to openly recall the tender no person living knows or has an intimation that i write this letter yours truly a lincoln p s telegraph me instantly on receipt of this saying all right a l it will be seen from this that mr lincoln did not offer any explanation of his course also that he had so well kept his secret both of the tender and the recall that since his judgment so dictated he could reverse his own action and the world be none the wiser still further does it appear from this letter that he had either enjoined or expected an equal discretion on the part of mr cameron but the latter in haste to control the party politics of pennsylvania and dictate who from that state should succeed him in the senate had shown mr lincoln's first note 
Mr. Cameron was therefore not only unable to telegraph all right, but was in a measure compelled also to show the recall to a few special friends, and thus the incident, though the correspondence and the actual details were carefully kept out of the newspapers, was more or less understood in confidential circles of politics. As might have been expected, Mr. Cameron's nearest personal friend came at once to Springfield, and the conferences on the subject may be sufficiently inferred from a letter and its enclosure which he carried back private and confidential springfield illinois january thirteenth eighteen sixty one honorable simon cameron my dear sir at the suggestion of mr sanderson and with hearty good will besides i herewith send you a letter dated january three the same in date as the last you received from me i thought best to give it that date as it is in some sort to take the place of that letter i learned both by a letter of mr sweat and from mr sanderson that your feelings were wounded by the terms of my letter really of the third i wrote that letter under great anxiety and perhaps i was not so guarded in its terms as i should have been but i beg you to be assured i intended no offence my great object was to have you act quickly if possible before the matter should be complicated with the pennsylvania senatorial election destroy the offensive letter or return it to me i say to you now i have not doubted that you would perform the duties of a department ably and faithfully nor have i for a moment intended to ostracize your friends if i should make a cabinet appointment for pennsylvania before i reach washington i will not do so without consulting you and giving all the weight to your views and wishes which i consistently can this i have always intended yours truly a lincoln enclosure springfield illinois january three eighteen sixty one honorable simon cameron my dear sir when you were here about the last of december i handed you a letter saying i should at the proper time nominate you to the senate for a place in the cabinet it is due to you and to truth for me to say you were here by my invitation and not upon any suggestion of your own you have not as yet signified to me whether you would accept the appointment and with much pain i now say to you that you will relieve me from great embarrassment by allowing me to recall the offer this springs from an unexpected complication and not from any change of my view as to the ability or faithfulness with which you would discharge the duties of the place i now think i will not definitely fix upon any appointment for pennsylvania until i reach washington your obedient servant a lincoln before further describing this cameron dilemma we must look at another complication which was added to it on the day he had given mr cameron his written tender of a place december thirty one he had also telegraphed to governor chase in these troublous times i would like a conference with you please visit me here at once by a curious coincidence mr chase arrived in springfield on the day january three on which mr lincoln wrote the recall of the tender to mr cameron as in other instances the president-elect waived all ceremony and called on mr chase at his hotel i have done with you said he what i would not perhaps have ventured to do with any other man in the country sent for you to ask you whether you will accept the appointment of secretary of the treasury without however being exactly prepared to offer it to you he also informed him of the selection of mr seward and mr bates which he heartily approved nothing was of course said of the tender to cameron or its recall but the opposition to cameron in pennsylvania and the urging of mr dayton of new jersey instead the apparent acquiescence of all in the choice of mr chase and the threatening affairs of the nation as well as the strife among republican factions were fully talked over during his visit which lasted two days mr chase stated that he was not prepared to say that he would accept that place if offered neither did he positively decline he valued the trust and its opportunities but he was reluctant to leave the senate it was resolved to ask the advice of friends and abide the course of events a good deal of conversation writes mr chase followed in reference to other possible members of the cabinet but everything was left open when we parted 
all these important visits to springfield were heralded in the newspapers and the rumors connected therewith proportionately magnified particularly did the statement of mr cameron's selection and its quick contradiction put both his friends and opponents on the alert pennsylvania politics were for the moment at a white heat and letters showered into springfield politicians are but human mr cameron was sorely wounded in pride and weakened in prestige he felt hurt at the form as well as the substance of the recall which being intended to remain secret was more explicit than conventional while he did not conceal his chagrin on the whole he kept his temper taking the ground that he neither originally solicited the place nor would he now decline it his enemies seeing him at bay redoubled their efforts to defeat him they charged him with unfitness with habitual intrigue with the odium of corrupt practices mr lincoln however soon noticed that these allegations were vaguely based upon newspaper report and public rumor and that when requested to do so no one was willing to make specific charges and furnish tangible proof while the opponents of mr cameron hastened to transmit to springfield protests against his appointment his friends were yet more active in forwarding recommendations in his behalf all through the month of january this epistolary contest seemed the principal occupation of the pennsylvania republicans and to some extent it communicated itself to other localities sharp as were the assaults the defense was yet more earnest and testimonials came from all ranks and classes citizens clergymen editors politicians and officials of all grades and in numbers fully as three to one endorsing his private and personal worth his public services his official uprightness astute washington politicians were nonplussed and frankly confessed that his vindication from aspersion was complete and overwhelming and that they could not account for it attributing it as usual to his personal intrigue reasons aside it was evident that pennsylvania demanded cameron and in the same connection protested against chase in the treasury department insisting that the latter through his democratic teachings and party affiliations was necessarily wedded to the doctrines of free trade and hence inimical to the manufacturing prosperity of that state which was anxiously looking forward to protective legislation mr cameron was highly gratified at this manifestation from his own state as he had a right to be and was thereby able to declare himself entirely satisfied with the situation as thus left and to express his continued good will towards the president-elect pending this incident still another phase of the cabinet question had more fully developed itself at washington the proposition to appoint at least one distinctly southern man continued from time to time to be urged upon mr lincoln notably by some of the most prominent and it may be added most radical republican senators and representatives in congress to the policy of such a step the president-elect cordially assented but the real question was as he had already so sharply defined it would any southern man of character and influence accept such a place since mr seward's selection he too joined in the current suggestion i feel it my duty he wrote december twenty five to submit for your consideration the names of colonel fremont for secretary of war randall hunt of louisiana and john a gilmer or kenneth rayner of north carolina for other places should you think that any of these gentlemen would be likely to be desirable in the administration i should find no difficulty i think in ascertaining whether they would accept without making the matter public in another note of december twenty eighth he added the name of robert e scott of virginia to his list of southern candidates thereupon mr lincoln sent him authority to make the inquiry while he himself wrote directly to john a gilmer asking him to come to springfield mr seward's letters had also urged in this connection that in view of the threatened revolution mr lincoln should come to washington somewhat earlier than usual and should at once select his secretaries of war and navy that they might begin to devise measures of safety to all these suggestions mr lincoln sent the following reply private springfield illinois january three eighteen sixty one honorable w h seward my dear sir 
yours without signature was received last night i have been considering your suggestions as to my reaching washington somewhat earlier than is usual it seems to me the inauguration is not the most dangerous point for us our adversaries have us now clearly at disadvantage on the second wednesday of february when the votes should be officially counted if the two houses refuse to meet at all or meet without a quorum of each where shall we be i do not think that this counting is constitutionally essential to the election but how are we to proceed in absence of it in view of this i think it best for me not to attempt appearing in washington till the result of that ceremony is known it certainly would be of some advantage if you could know who are to be at the heads of the war and navy departments but until i can ascertain definitely whether i can get any suitable men from the south and who and how many i cannot well decide as yet i have no word from mr gilmer in answer to my request for an interview with him i look for something on the subject through you before long yours very truly a lincoln the result of mr seward's inquiries soon came and revealed precisely the hesitation and difficulty which the president-elect had foretold mr g of n c says he will consider of the proposition and that he trusts that before giving an answer he will be able to name a person better calculated than himself for the purpose indicated i do not think he will find such a person he will not reply further until required to do so by you directly or indirectly i will communicate with him if you wish i think he would not decline i have tried to get an interview on my own responsibility with mr scott but he has not yet come though he has promised to do so i still think randall hunt of louisiana would be well chosen and again mr gilmer has written home confidentially and will give me an answer in a few days he is inquiring about randall hunt what do you know of meredith p gentry of tennessee to this mr lincoln answered private springfield illinois january twelfth eighteen sixty one honorable w h seward my dear sir yours of the eighth received i still hope mr gilmer will on a fair understanding with us consent to take a place in the cabinet the preference for him over mr hunt or mr gentry is that up to date he has a living position in the south while they have not he is only better than winter davis and that he is farther south i fear if we could get we could not safely take more than one such man that is not more than one who opposed us in the election the danger being to lose the confidence of our own friends your selection for the state department having become public i am happy to find scarcely any objection to it i shall have trouble with every other northern cabinet appointment so much so that i shall have to defer them as long as possible to avoid being teased to insanity to make changes your obedient servant a lincoln under date of january fifteenth mr seward sent an additional report on the subject i think wrote he mr scott has been terrified into dropping the subject about which i wrote to you he has not come to see me so we will let him pass if you please i still think well and have hopes of gilmer but mr lincoln was by that time thoroughly satisfied that this last hope would also prove idle for he himself had a second letter from mr gilmer dated january twenty nine in which that gentleman declined his invitation to come to springfield and in which having missed receiving mr lincoln's former reply he still pathetically insisted that the president-elect should save the country by writing a letter to satisfy the south mr seward was so much of an optimist that he clung to the idea of securing a southern unionist in another letter which he wrote to the president-elect under date of january twenty seventh it is curious to note how he continues his search after the impossible against the accumulation of evidence which convinced his reason but could not subdue his hope mr cameron showed me the letter you had sent to him and seems entirely satisfied with it i saw mr robert e scott of virginia to-day pursuant to appointment he is a splendid man and he would be a fit and creditable representative of the southern union party whether he is not too exacting for his section to make a practical minister for you is quite doubtful in my mind i will think more recent events in virginia have opened access for me to union men in virginia and other southern states 
among others mr james barber of the state of virginia has visited me he is a democrat but the master spirit of the union party and he left upon my mind a most favorable impression as a man of talent spirit loyalty and practicability we will talk of him when you come here the appeals from the union men in the border states for something of concession or compromise are very painful since they say that without it their states must all go with the tide and your administration must begin with the free states meeting all southern states in a hostile confederacy chance might render the separation perpetual disunion has been contemplated and discussed so long there that they have become frightfully familiar with it and even such men as mr scott and william c rives are so far disunionists as to think that they would have the right and be wise in going if we will not execute new guarantees which would be abhorrent in the north it is almost in vain that i tell them to wait let us have a truce on slavery put our issue on disunion and seek remedies for ultimate griefs in a constitutional question this is the dark side of the picture now for the brighter one beyond a peradventure disunion is falling and union rising in the popular mind our friends say we are safe in maryland and mr scott and others tell us that union is gaining rapidly as an element in virginia in any case you are to meet a hostile armed confederacy when you commence you must reduce it by force or conciliation the resort to force would very soon be denounced by the north although so many are anxious for a fray the north will not consent to a long civil war a large portion much the largest portion of the republican party are reckless now of the crisis before us and compromise or concession though as a means of averting dissolution is intolerable to them they believe that either it will not come at all or be less disastrous than i think it will be for my own part i think that we must collect the revenues regain the forts in the gulf and if need be maintain ourselves here but that every thought that we think ought to be conciliatory forbearing and paternal and so open the way for the rising of a union party in the seceding states which will bring them back into the union it would be very important that your inaugural address be wise and winning i am glad that you have suspended making cabinet appointments the temper of your administration whether generous and hopeful of union or harsh and reckless will probably determine the fate of our country may god give you wisdom for the great trust and responsibility in this attitude matters remained until towards the end of february when mr lincoln arrived in washington namely mr seward of new york and mr bates of missouri had positively accepted definite places in the cabinet mr chase of ohio and mr smith of indiana had been virtually chosen but were yet held under advisement a tender had been made to mr cameron of pennsylvania and recalled but not declined and southern men like gilmer of north carolina and scott of virginia had not the courage to accept in addition to these mr lincoln had by this time practically settled in his own judgment upon gideon wells of connecticut as the new england member though no interview had been held nor tender made but as early as the meeting november twenty two between the president and vice president-elect at chicago this name had been the subject of special consultation and a friend had obtained from mr wells the latter's written views upon current political questions especially the fugitive slave clause of the constitution a great number of letters and formal recommendations since received had been confirmed mr lincoln's first impressions as to his fitness availability and representative character washington was thronged with politicians called there by the proceedings of congress by the peace convention just closing by the secession excitement and especially by the advent of a new and yet untried party in administration willard's then the principal hotel was never in its history more busy nor more brilliant here mr lincoln and his suite had spacious and accessible rooms and here during the six or eight working days which intervened between his arrival and the inauguration was the great political exchange where politicians editors committee men delegations congressmen governors and senators congregated and besieged the doors of the coming power from morning till midnight mr lincoln had a sincere respect for great names in politics and statesmanship the more so because his own life had in the main been provincial nevertheless he quickly noted that here at the centre as well as in lesser and more distant circles 
there was present harmony in the chief party tenets but that great diversity and cross-purpose even serious antagonism as to men and measures in detail were likely to arise in the future that the powerful cross-lights of the capital only intensified the factional contests local jealousies and the national difficulties and dangers he had already viewed more remotely but quite as accurately from springfield that the wisdom of trained actors in the political drama was as much beclouded by interest or prejudice as was his own by inexperience and diffidence after a week's patient listening he found his well-formed judgment about the composition of his cabinet unshaken he had by this time finally determined to place cameron in the war department and chase was understood to have accepted the treasury hence the east and the west the great pivotal states the whig and democratic elements of the republican party each by three members were all believed to be fairly and acceptably represented the slave states too through mr bates of missouri had a voice in the new council but the charge of sectionalism had been so persistently iterated by the south that it was thought best to give the single remaining place to maryland even then balancing between loyalty and open secession and the final controversy was whether that choice should fall upon montgomery blair a democrat and member of the historic and influential family or upon henry winter davis a young whig of rising fame something of the obstinacy and bitterness of the entire contest was infused into this last struggle over a really minor place this was partly because so little remained to quarrel about but mainly because it was supposed to be the casting vote of the new cabinet which should decide the dominancy of the whig republicans or democratic republicans in mr lincoln's administration in the momentary heat and excitement this phase of the matter expanded beyond any original design until mr lincoln realized that it was no longer a merely local strife between blair and davis in maryland but the closing trial of strength and supremacy between whigs and democrats of the new party throughout the union headed respectively though perhaps unconsciously by seward and chase this contingency too had been foreseen by the president-elect and he had long ago determined not to allow himself to be made the football between rival factions carrying out therefore his motto of justice to all as formulated in his tender to seward he determined to appoint mr blair when reminded that by such selection he placed four democrats and only three whigs in his cabinet he promptly replied that he was himself an old line whig and he should be there to make the parties even a declaration which he repeated sometimes jocularly sometimes earnestly often afterwards heated partisans from both factions doubtless found it difficult to persuade themselves that this inexperienced man would persist in attempting to hold an even and just balance between the two but he had already made up his mind that if the quarrel became irrepressible it should be carried on outside of his administration during the two or three days which elapsed after his selections were finally determined upon and before their actual transmission to the senate for confirmation there were interminable rumors of changes and of course a corresponding rush to influence new combinations late one night a friend gained access to him and in great excitement asked is it true mr lincoln as i have just heard that we are to have a new deal after all and that you intend to nominate winter davis instead of blair judd replied he when that slate breaks again it will break at the top these plottings at last bore mischievous fruit super serviceable friends doubtless persuaded seward that the alleged ascendancy of the chase faction in the cabinet was real and ominous hence possibly the subjoined note washington march two eighteen sixty one my dear sir circumstances which have occurred since i expressed to you in december last my willingness to accept the office of secretary of state seemed to me to render it my duty to ask leave to withdraw that consent tendering to you my best wishes for the success of your administration with my sincere and grateful acknowledgments of all your acts of kindness and confidence towards me i remain very respectfully and sincerely your obedient servant william h seward the hon abraham lincoln president-elect this from the man who for several months had held intimate counsel with him 
had taken active part in the formation of the cabinet and had read and partly revised the inaugural was unexpected did it mean that he would withdraw and complain that he was forced out because a preponderating influence was given to his rival the note was received on saturday and mr lincoln pondered the situation till monday morning while the inauguration procession was forming in the streets he wrote the following and handed it to his private secretary to copy with the remark i can't afford to let seward take the first trick it was dated for form's sake at the executive mansion though it was written and copied at willard's executive mansion march four eighteen sixty one my dear sir your note of the second instant asking to withdraw your acceptance of my invitation to take charge of the state department was duly received it is the subject of the most painful solicitude with me and i feel constrained to beg that you will countermand the withdrawal the public interest i think demands that you should and my personal feelings are deeply enlisted in the same direction please consider an answer by nine o'clock a m to-morrow your obedient servant a lincoln hon william h seward when the inauguration pageant was ended and the usual public reception and handshaking were concluded mr seward called upon the president at the executive mansion and the two men had a long and confidential talk in which seward's answer sent the following morning was perhaps already foreshadowed my dear sir deferring to your opinions and wishes as expressed in your letter of yesterday and in our conversation of last evening i withdraw my letter to you of the second instant and remain with great respect and esteem your most obedient servant william h seward the president of the united states whereupon at twelve o'clock the senate being convened in extra session the president sent to that body the names of his proposed cabinet as follows for secretary of state william h seward of new york for secretary of the treasury salmon p chase of ohio for secretary of war simon cameron of pennsylvania for secretary of the navy gideon wells of connecticut for secretary of the interior caleb b smith of indiana for attorney general edward bates of missouri for postmaster general montgomery blair of maryland the senate confirmed all these nominations without delay and on the day after march sixth most of the appointees were formally inducted into office that evening occurred the first cabinet meeting for introduction and acquaintance and the new president greeted his cabinet at the executive mansion substantially as he had planned it on the night of, of the november election in the little telegraph office at springfield carping critics might indeed at the moment have specified defects incongruities jealousies and seeds of possible discord and disaster in the new cabinet but we can now understand that they neither comprehended the man who was to dominate and govern it nor the storms of state which as captain and crew he and they were to encounter and outride he needed advisers helpers executive eyes and hands not alone in department routine but in the higher qualities above all his principal motive seems to have been representative character varied talent in a word combination statesmanship implies success success demands cooperation popular sympathy and support he wished to combine the experience of seward the integrity of chase the popularity of cameron to hold the west with bates attract new england with wells please the whigs through smith and convince the democrats through blair mr lincoln possessed a quick intuition of human nature and of the strength or weakness of individual character his whole life had been a practical study of the details and rivalries of local partisanship he was moreover endowed in yet unsuspected measure with a comprehensive grasp of great causes and results in national politics he had noted and heralded the alarming portent of the slavery struggle with more precision than any contemporary he had defined the depth and breadth of the moral issues and rights it involved he had led the preliminary victory at the november polls now that secession was proclaimed in every cotton state his simple logic rose above minor considerations to the peril and the protection of the nation to the assault on and the defense of the constitution he saw but the ominous cloud of civil war in front and the patriotic faith and enthusiasm of the people behind him the slogan of a seward committee a chase delegation or a cameron clan was but the symbol and promise of a wide-awake club to vote for freedom or of an armed regiment on the battlefield to maintain it 
neither did any one yet suspect his delicate tact in management strength of will and firmness of purpose in weaker hands such a cabinet would have been a hotbed of strife under him it became a tower of strength he made these selections because he wanted a council of distinctive and diverse yet able influential and representative men who should be a harmonious group of constitutional advisers and executive lieutenants not a board of regents holding the great seal and commission and intriguing for the succession end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three from abraham lincoln a history volume three by john hay and john george nicolay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume three chapter twenty three in his letter of january four general scott had promised mr lincoln that from time to time he would keep him informed of the situation of military affairs this promise the general failed to redeem probably not through any intentional neglect but more likely because in the first place buchanan's policy of delay indecision and informal negotiation with the conspirators left everything in uncertainty and secondly because the attention of the administration and measurably of the whole country was turned to hopes of compromise especially through the labors of the peace convention the rebels on their part were absorbed in the formation of the provisional government at montgomery lincoln was making his memorable journey from springfield to washington by way of the chief cities of the north the fort pickens truce was practically a secret and thus the military status was for the time being lost sight of beyond the immediate neighborhood of charleston since the reorganization of buchanan's cabinet on december thirty one and the expulsion or defection of traitors from the departments and from congress the whole north had breathed somewhat easier the firing on the star of the west had created a storm of indignation but this too quickly subsided and by a sort of common consent all parties and sections looked to the incoming administration as the only power which could solve the national crisis the keynote of such a solution was given in the inaugural of the new president this announced a decided though not a violent change of policy buchanan's course had been one professedly of conciliation but practically of ruinous concession lincoln receiving from his hands the precious trust of the government not in its original integrity but humbled impaired diminished and threatened announced his purpose of conciliation conservation and restoration the policy chosen said he looked to the exhaustion of all peaceful measures before a resort to any stronger ones it sought only to hold the public places and property not already wrested from the government and to collect the revenue relying for the rest on time discussion and the ballot box it promised a continuance of the mails at government expense to the very people who were resisting the government and it gave repeated pledges against any disturbance to any of the people or any of their rights of all that which a president might constitutionally and justifiably do in such a case everything was forborne without which it was believed possible to keep the government on foot this pacific purpose was now however destined to receive a rude shock when on the morning of the fifth of march lincoln went to his office in the executive mansion he found a letter from mr holt still acting as secretary of war giving him news of vital importance received on the morning of the inauguration namely that fort sumter 
must in the lapse of a few weeks at most be strongly reinforced or summarily abandoned major anderson had in the previous week made an examination of his provisions there was bread for twenty-eight days pork for a somewhat longer time beans rice coffee and sugar for different periods from eight to forty days he had at the same time consulted his officers on the prospects and possibilities of relief and reinforcement they unanimously reported that before sumter could be permanently or effectively succored a combined land and naval force must attack and carry the besieging forts and batteries and hold the secession militia at bay and that such an undertaking would at once concentrate at charleston all the volunteers not alone of south carolina but of the adjacent states as well i confess wrote anderson transmitting the reports and estimates of his nine officers that i would not be willing to risk my reputation on an attempt to throw reinforcements into this harbor within the time for our relief rendered necessary by the limited supply of our provisions and with a view of holding possession of the same with a force of less than twenty thousand good and well-disciplined men mr holt quoting from previous instructions to and reports from the major added that this declaration takes the department by surprise as his previous correspondence contained no such intimation retrospective criticism as to why or how such a state of things had been permitted to grow up was of course useless here was a most portentous complication not of lincoln's own creating but which he must nevertheless meet and overcome he had counted on the soothing aid of time time on the contrary was in this emergency working in the interest of rebellion general scott was at once called into council but his sagacity and experience could afford neither suggestion nor encouragement that same night he returned the papers to the president with a somewhat lengthy endorsement reciting the several events which led to and his own personal efforts to avert this contingency but ending with the gloomy conclusion evacuation seems almost inevitable and in this view our distinguished chief engineer brigadier totten concurs if indeed the worn-out garrison be not assaulted and carried in the present week this was a disheartening almost a disastrous beginning for the administration the cabinet had only that day been appointed and confirmed the presidential advisers had not yet taken their posts all had not even signified their acceptance there was an impatient multitude clamoring for audience and behind these swarmed an army of office seekers everything was urgency and confusion everywhere was ignorance of method and routine rancor and hatred filled the breasts of political opponents departing from power suspicion and rivalry possessed partisan adherents seeking advantage and promotion as yet lincoln virtually stood alone face to face with the appalling problems of the present and the threatening responsibilities of the future doubtless in this juncture he remembered and acted upon a biblical precedent which in after days of trouble and despondency he was wont to quote for justification or consolation when the children of israel murmured on the shore of the red sea moses told them to stand still and see the salvation of the lord here at the very threshold of his presidential career lincoln had need to practice the virtue of patience one of the cardinal elements of his character acquired in many a personal and political tribulation he referred the papers back to general scott to make a more thorough investigation of all the questions involved at the same time he gave him a verbal order touching his future policy which a few days later was reduced to writing and on the installation of the new secretary of war transmitted by that functionary to the general-in-chief through the regular official channels as follows 
I am directed by the President to say he desires you to exercise all possible vigilance for the maintenance of all the places within the military department of the United States, and to promptly call upon all the departments of the government for the means necessary to that end. On the 9th of March, in written questions, Lincoln, in substance, asked General Scott to inform him, first, to what point of time can Anderson maintain his position in Sumter? Second, can you, with present means, relieve him within that time? Third, what additional means would enable you to do so? This was on Saturday following the inauguration. The chiefs of the several departments, with the exception of Cameron, Secretary of War, had been, during the week, inducted into office. That night, the President held his first Cabinet Council on the State of the Country, and the crisis at Sumter, with the question of relieving the fort, were, for the first time, communicated to his assembled advisers. The general effect was one of dismay, if not consternation. For such a discussion, all were unprepared. Naturally, all decision must be postponed, and the assistance of professional advice be sought. What followed has been written down by an eyewitness and participant. March 9, 1861, Saturday night, a cabinet council upon the state of the country. I was astonished to be informed that Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor must be evacuated, and that General Scott, General Totten, and Major Anderson concur in opinion that as the place has but 28 days provision, it must be relieved, if at all, in that time, and that it will take a force of 20,000 men at least, and a bloody battle to relieve it. For several days after this, consultations were held as to the feasibility of relieving Fort Sumter, at which were present explaining and aiding General Scott, General Totten, Commodore Stringham, and Mr. Fox, who seems to be au fait in both nautical and military matters. The Army officers and Navy officers differ widely about the degree of danger to rapid-moving vessels passing under the fire of land batteries. The Army officers think destruction almost inevitable, where the Navy officers think the danger but slight. The one believe that Sumter cannot be relieved, not even provisioned, without an army of 20,000 men and a bloody battle. The other, the naval, believe that with light, rapid vessels, they can cross the bar at high tide of a dark night, run the enemy's forts, Moultrie and Cummings Point, and reach Sumter with little risk. They say that the greatest danger will be in landing at Sumter, upon which point there may be a concentrated fire. They do not doubt that the place can be and ought to be relieved. Mr. Fox is anxious to risk his life in leading the relief, and Commodore Stringham seems equally confident of success. The naval men have convinced me fully that the thing can be done, and yet, as the doing of it would be almost certain to begin the war, and as Charleston is of little importance as compared with the chief points in the Gulf, I am willing to yield to the military council and evacuate Fort Sumter, at the same time strengthening the forts in the Gulf so as to look down opposition and guarding the coast with all our naval power, if need be, so as to close any port at pleasure. And to this effect, I gave the President my written opinion on the 16th of March. This extract from the diary of Edward Bates, the Attorney General in the new administration, shows us the drift and scope of the official discussions on the Sumter question. To understand its full bearings, however, we must examine it a little more specifically. The idea of the evacuation and abandonment of the fort was so repugnant that Mr. Lincoln could scarcely bring himself to entertain it. We have his own forcible statement of how the apparently crushing necessity presented itself to his mind. General Scott, on March 11 and 12, made written replies to the questions the President had propounded and submitted the draft of an order for evacuation. 
he believed anderson could in respect to provisions hold out some forty days without much suffering but that the assailants having overpowering numbers could easily wear out the garrison by a succession of pretended night attacks and when ready take it easily by a single real assault to supply or reinforce the fort successfully he should need a fleet of war vessels and transports which it would take four months to collect and besides five thousand regulars and twenty thousand volunteers which it would require new acts of congress to authorize and from six to eight months to raise organize and discipline it is therefore my opinion and advice wrote scott that major anderson be instructed to evacuate the fort so long gallantly held by him and his companions immediately on procuring suitable water transportation and that he embark with his command for new york in a purely military point of view says lincoln this reduced the duty of the administration in the case to the mere matter of getting the garrison safely out of the fort it was believed however that to so abandon that position under the circumstances would be utterly ruinous that the necessity under which it was to be done would not be fully understood that by many it would be construed as a part of a voluntary policy that at home it would discourage the friends of the union embolden its adversaries and go far to ensure to the latter a recognition abroad that in fact it would be our national destruction consummated this could not be allowed the dire alternative presented caused a thorough re-examination and discussion of the various plans of relief which had been suggested and since the army and the navy showed some considerable disagreement in opinions these discussions were held before the president and cabinet in the executive council chamber itself general scott's first impulse had been to revive and recognize the ward expedition prepared about the middle of february which was to have consisted of several small coast survey steamers to this end he called captain ward to washington and again discussed the plan but considering the increase of batteries and channel obstructions it was now by both of them pronounced impracticable one other offer seemed worthy of consideration this was the plan proposed by gustavus v fox a gentleman thirty-nine years of age who had been nineteen years in the united states navy had been engaged in the survey of the southern coast had commanded united states mail steamers and had resigned from the navy in eighteen fifty six to engage in civil pursuits he was a brother-in-law of the new postmaster general blair who seconded his project with persistence he had made his proposal to general scott early in february and backed by prominent new york merchants and shippers urged it as he best might through the whole of that month in his various communications captain fox thus described his plan i propose to put the troops on board of a large comfortable sea steamer and hire two or three powerful light draft new york tugboats having the necessary stores on board these to be convoyed by the united states steamer pawnee now at philadelphia and the revenue cutter harriet lane arriving off the bar at charleston i propose to examine by day the naval preparations and obstructions if their vessels determined to oppose our entrance and a feint or flag of truce would ascertain this the armed ships must approach the bar and destroy or drive them on shore major anderson would do the same upon any vessels within the range of his guns and would also prevent any naval succor being sent down from the city having dispersed this force the only obstacles are the forts on cummings point and fort moultrie and whatever adjacent batteries they may have erected distant on either hand from mid-channel about three-quarters of a mile at night two hours before high water with half of the force on board of each tug within relieving distance of each other i should run in to fort sumter these tugs are sea-boats six feet draft speed fourteen knots 
The boilers are below with three and a half feet space on each side to be filled with coal. The machinery comes up between the wheelhouses with a gangway on either hand of five or six feet, enabling us to pack the machinery with two or three thicknesses of bales of cotton or hay. This renders the vulnerable parts of the steamer proof against grape and fragments of shells, but the momentum of a solid shot would probably move the whole mass and disable the engine. The men are below, entirely protected from grape, provisions on deck. The first tug to lead in empty to open there the enemy's fire. The other two to follow with the force divided and towing the large iron boats of the Baltic, which would hold the whole force should every tug be disabled, and empty they would not impede the tugs. The feasibility of Captain Fox's plan thus rested upon his ability to run the batteries, and on this point the main discussion now turned. As recorded in the diary we have quoted, the army officers believed destruction almost inevitable, while the naval officers thought a successful passage might be effected. Captain Fox, who had come to Washington, finally argued the question in person before the president, cabinet, and assembled military officers, adducing the recorded evidence of examples and incidents which had occurred in the Crimean War and the results of Dahlgren's experiments in firing at stationary targets, maintaining that there was no certainty whatever, and even only a minimum of chance, that land batteries could hit a small object moving rapidly at right angles to their line of fire at a distance of 1,300 yards, especially at night. So far as mere theory could do it, he successfully demonstrated his plan, convincing the president and at least a majority of the cabinet against the objections of General Scott and his subordinate officers. Nevertheless, the political question, the more important of the two, yet remained to be considered. Resolved on prudent deliberation, President Lincoln now, on March 15, asked the written answer of his constitutional advisers to the following inquiry. Assuming it to be possible to now provision Fort Sumter, under all the circumstances, is it wise to attempt it? As requested, the members of the cabinet returned somewhat elaborate replies, setting forth their reasons and conclusions. Two of them, Chase and Blair, agreeing with the president's own inclinations, responded in the affirmative. The five others, Seward, Cameron, Wells, Smith, and Bates, advised against the measure. I have not reached my own conclusion, wrote Chase, without much difficulty. If the proposed enterprise will so influence civil war as to involve an immediate necessity for the enlistment of armies and the expenditure of millions, I cannot, in the existing circumstances of the country and in the present condition of the national finances, advise it. He argued, however, that an immediate proclamation of reasons and the manifestation of a kind and liberal spirit towards the South would avert such a result, and he would therefore return an affirmative answer. Blair had been from the first in favor of prompt and vigorous measures against the insurrection. A Democrat of the Jackson School, he would repeat Jackson's policy against nullification, he had brought forward and urged the scheme of Captain Fox. By the connivance of Buchanan's administration, he argued, the rebellion had been permitted unchecked to grow into an organized government in seven states. It had been treated practically as a lawful proceeding, and if allowed to continue, all southern people must become reconciled to it. The rebels believed northern men deficient in courage to maintain the government, the evacuation of Sumter would convince them that the administration lacked firmness. Sumter, reinforced, would become invulnerable and would completely demoralize the rebellion. No expense or care should be spared to achieve this result. The appreciation of our stocks would it reimburse the most lavish outlay for this purpose. You should give no thought for the commander and his comrades in this enterprise. They willingly take the hazard for the sake of the country, and the honor which, successful or not, they will receive from you and the lovers of free government in all lands. 
Seward, in the negative, argued the political issue at great length. To attempt to provision Sumter would provoke combat and open civil war. A desperate and defeated majority in the South had organized revolutionary government in seven states. The other slave states were balancing between sympathy for the seceders and loyalty to the Union, but indicated a disposition to adhere to the latter. The Union must be maintained peaceably if it could, forcibly if it must, to every extremity. But civil war was the most uncertain and fearful of all remedies for political disorders. He would save the Union by peaceful policy without civil war. Disunion was without justification. Devotion to the Union was a profound and permanent national sentiment. Silenced by terror, it would, if encouraged, rally and reverse the popular action of the seceding states. The policy of the time was conciliation. Sumter was practically useless. I would not provoke war in any way now. I would resort to force to protect the collection of the revenue, because this is a necessary as well as a legitimate Union object. Even then it should be only a naval force that I would employ for that necessary purpose, while I would defer military action on land until a case should arise when we would hold the defense. In that case, we should have the spirit of the country and the approval of mankind on our side. Cameron followed the reasoning of the army officers. Captain Fox, he said, did not propose to supply provisions for more than one or two months. The abandonment of Sumter seemed an inevitable necessity, and therefore the sooner the better. Wells thought the public mind was becoming reconciled to the idea of evacuation as a necessity. The strength, dignity, and character of the government would not be promoted by a successful attempt, while a failure would be disastrous. Smith argued that Sumter was not essential to any of the duties imposed on the government. There were other and more effective means to vindicate its honor and compel South Carolina to obey the laws. Bates believed the hazard greater than the gain. True, wrote he, war already exists by the act of South Carolina, but this government has thus far magnanimously forborne to retort the outrage, and I am willing to forbear yet longer in the hope of a peaceful solution of our present difficulties. Pickens, Key West, etc., should, on the contrary, be strongly defended, and the whole coast from South Carolina to Texas be guarded by the entire power of the Navy. Against the advice of so decided a majority, Lincoln did not deem it prudent to order the proposed expedition. Neither did his own sense of duty permit him entirely to abandon it. Postponing, therefore, a present final decision of the point, he turned his attention to the investigation of the question immediately and vitally connected with it, the collection of the revenue. On the 18th of March, he directed written inquiries to three of his cabinet officers, to the Attorney General, whether under the Constitution and laws, the Executive has power to collect duties on shipboard offshore, to the Secretary of the Treasury, whether and where and for what cause any importations are taking place without payment of duties, whether vessels offshore could prevent such importations or enforce payment, and what number and description of vessels besides those already in the Revenue Service, to the Secretary of the Navy, what amount of naval force he could place at the control of the Revenue Service and how much additional in the future. Pending the receipt of replies to these inquiries, Lincoln determined to obtain information on two other points. The first as to the present actual condition and feeling of Major Anderson. The second as to the real temper and intentions of the people of Charleston. Captain Fox had suggested the possibility of obtaining leave to visit Sumter through the influence of Captain Hartstein, then in the rebel service at Charleston, but who had in former years been his intimate friend and comrade in command of a companion steamer of the California line. 
By order of the President, General Scott therefore sent him to obtain accurate information in regard to the command of Major Anderson in Fort Sumter. As Fox anticipated, Hartstein introduced him to Governor Pickens, to whom he showed his order, and having meanwhile had an interview with General Beauregard, was after some delay permitted to go to the fort under Hartstein's escort. He reported, we reached Fort Sumter after dark, March 21, and I remained about two hours. Major Anderson seemed to think it was too late to relieve the fort by any other means than by landing an army on Morris Island. He agreed with General Scott that an entrance from the sea was impossible, but as we looked out upon the water from the parapet, it seemed very feasible, more especially as we heard the oars of a boat near the fort, which the sentry hailed, but we could not see her through the darkness until she almost touched the landing. I found the garrison getting short of supplies, and it was agreed that I might report that the 15th of April at noon would be the period beyond which the fort could not be held unless supplies were furnished. I made no arrangements with Major Anderson for reinforcing or supplying the fort, nor did I inform him of my plan. Unlike fox anderson was in no wise encouraged by the conversation and wrote i have examined the point alluded to by mr fox last night a vessel lying there will be under the fire of thirteen guns from fort moultrie and captain foster says that at the pan coupe or immediately on its right the best place for her to land she would require even at high tide if drawing ten feet a staging of forty feet the department can decide what the chances will be of a safe debarkation and unloading at that point under these circumstances. The other point on which the President sought information revealed equally decisive features. It so happened that S. A. Hurlbut of Illinois, afterwards Major General of Volunteers, a personal friend of Lincoln, was at the moment in Washington. This gentleman was of Charleston birth four years a law student of the foremost citizen and jurist of south carolina james l pettigrew and then in frequent correspondence with him on march twenty one the president called mr hurlbut to him and explaining that mr seward insisted that there was a strong union party in the south even in south carolina asked him to go personally and ascertain the facts Mr. Hurlbut telegraphed his sister in Charleston that he was coming on a visit, which, in the threatening aspect of affairs, he might not soon be able to repeat. He traveled as a private citizen, though purposely with some show of publicity. Curiosity, however, centered itself upon his traveling companion, Ward H. Lehman, who, coming with an ostensible government mission to examine some post office matters, was looked upon as the real presidential messenger was treated to a formal audience with the governor and permitted to make a visit to fort sumter while layman was hobnobbing with the young secessionists at the charleston hotel hurlbut quartered at the house of his sister and thus free from the inquisitive scrutiny of newspaper reporters was quietly visiting his former neighbors and friends in various walks of life and being visited by them of greater value than all was his confidential interview with his former legal preceptor, Mr. Pettigrew, was at that time the best lawyer in the South and the strongest man in the state of South Carolina so far as character, ability, and purity went, and he never surrendered nor disguised his union convictions. Mr. Hurlbut was himself an able lawyer, a man of experience and force in politics, and a shrewd and sagacious judge of human nature. His mission remained entirely unsuspected, and after two days' sojourn, he returned to Washington and made a long written report to the President. By appointment, I met Mr. Pettigrew at 1 p.m. and had a private conversation with him for more than two hours. I was at liberty to state to him that my object was to ascertain and report the actual state of feeling in the city and state. Our conversation was entirely free and confidential. He is now the only man in the city of Charleston who avowedly adheres to the Union. From these sources, I have no hesitation in reporting as unquestionable that separate nationality is a fixed fact, that there is an unanimity of sentiment which is to my mind astonishing, that there is no attachment to the Union. There is positively nothing 
to appeal to. The sentiment of national patriotism, always feeble in Carolina, has been extinguished and overridden by the acknowledged doctrine of the paramount allegiance to the state. False political economy, diligently taught for years, has now become an axiom, and merchants and businessmen believe and act upon the belief that great growth of trade and expansion of material prosperity will and must follow the establishment of a southern republic. They expect a golden era when Charleston shall be a great commercial emporium and control for the South as New York does for the North. These visits to Charleston added two very important factors to the problem from which the cabinet and chiefly the president were to deduce the unknown. Very unexpectedly to the latter, and no doubt to all the former as well, a new light was now suddenly thrown upon the complicated question. The fate of Sumter had been under general discussion nearly three weeks. The cabinet and the high military and naval officers had divided in opinion and separated into opposing camps. As always happens in such cases, suspicion and criticism of personal motives began to develop themselves, though at this very beginning, as throughout his whole after administration, they were held in check by the generous faith and unvarying impartiality of the president. Hitherto the sole issue was the relief or abandonment of Sumter, but now, by an apparent change of advice and attitude on the part of General Scott, the fate of Fort Pickens was also drawn into discussion. So far as is known, the loyalty and devotion of General Scott never wavered for an instant, but his proneness to mingle political with military considerations had already been twice manifested. The first was when, in his memorial entitled Views, etc., addressed to President Buchanan, October 29, 1860, he suggested the formation of four new American unions if the old should be dismembered. The second was more recent. On the day preceding Lincoln's inauguration, the general had written a letter to Seward. In this, he advanced the opinion that the new president would have to choose one of four plans or policies. First, to adopt the Crittenden compromise and change the republican to a union party second by closing or blockading rebel ports or collecting the duties on shipboard outside third conquer the states by invading armies which he deprecated and fourth say to the seceded states wayward sisters depart in peace it must be noted that between three of these alternatives he gives no intimation of preference the letter was simply a sign of the prevailing political unrest, and therefore remained unnoticed by the president to whom it was referred. When Lincoln assumed the duties of government, Scott had, among other things, briefly pointed out the existing danger at Fort Pickens, and the president, by his verbal order of March 5, directing all possible vigilance for maintenance of all the places, had intended that the stronghold should be promptly reinforced. He made inquiries on this head four days later, and to his surprise, found nothing yet done. Hence he put his order in writing and sent it to the War Department for record March 11, and once more gave special directions in regard to Pickens, assuming the omission had occurred through preoccupation about Sumter. Upon this reminder, Scott bestirred himself, and at his instance, the war steamer Mohawk was dispatched March 12, carrying a messenger with orders to Captain Bogdus to land his company at Fort Pickens and increase the garrison. Both President and Cabinet had since then considered that point disposed of for the moment. On the evening of March 28, the first state dinner was given by the new occupants of the executive mansion. Just before the hour of leave-taking, Lincoln invited the members of his Cabinet into an adjoining room for a moment's consultation and when they were alone he informed them with evident emotion that general scott had that day advised the evacuation of fort pickens as well as fort sumter the general's recommendation was formulated as follows in his written memorandum to the secretary of war it is doubtful however according to recent information from the south whether the voluntary evacuation of Fort Sumter alone would have a decisive effect upon the states now wavering between adherence to the Union and secession. 
It is known, indeed, that it would be charged to necessity, and the holding of Fort Pickens would be adduced in support of that view. Our southern friends, however, are clear that the evacuation of both the forts would instantly soothe and give confidence to the eight remaining slaveholding states and render their cordial adherence to this union perpetual. The holding of Forts Jefferson and Taylor on the ocean keys depends on entirely different principles and should never be abandoned, and indeed the giving up of Fort Sumter and Pickens may be best justified by the hope that we should thereby recover the states to which they geographically belong by the liberality of the act, besides retaining the eight doubtful states. A long pause of blank amazement followed the President's recital, broken at length by Blair in strong denunciation, not only of this advice, but of Scott's general course regarding Sumter. He charged that Scott was transcending his professional duties and playing politician. Blair's gestures and remarks, moreover, were understood by those present as being aimed specially at Seward, whose peace policy he had with his usual impulsive aggressiveness freely criticized without any formal vote there was a unanimous expression of dissent from scott's suggestion and under the president's request to meet in formal council next day the cabinet retired that night lincoln's eyes did not close in sleep it was apparent that the time had come when he must meet the nation's crisis his judgment alone must guide his soul will determine his own lips utter the word that should save or lose the most precious inheritance of humanity the last hope of free government on the earth only the imagination may picture that intense and weary vigil End of chapter twenty three Chapter 24 from Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, Chapter 24. The rebel conspirators were not unmindful of the great advantages they had hitherto derived from their complaints, their intrigues, their assumptions, their arrogant demands. No sooner was the provisional government organized at Montgomery than they appointed a new embassy of three commissioners to proceed to Washington and make the fourth effort to assist, protect, and if possible to establish the rebellion through negotiation they not only desired to avert a war but reasoning from the past had a well-grounded faith that they would secure peaceful acquiescence in their schemes the commissioners were instructed to solicit a reception in their official character and if that were refused to accept an unofficial interview to insist on the de facto and de jure independence of the confederate states but nevertheless to accede to a proposition to refer the subject of their mission to the united states senate or to withhold an answer until the congress of the united states should assemble and pronounce a decision in the premises provided the existing peaceful status were rigidly maintained this modest program was made necessary by the half-fledged condition of the rebellion. Its personal jealousies were not yet hushed. Its notions of states' rights were not yet swallowed up in an imperious military dictatorship. Above all, its military preparation consisted mainly of a self-sacrificing enthusiasm. Notwithstanding the two months' drill and battery building at Charleston, Davis did not agree with Governor Pickens that the moment had come to storm Sumter. Fort Sumter should be in our possession at the earliest moment possible, wrote the rebel war secretary, but thorough preparation must be made before an attack is attempted. A failure would demoralize our people and injuriously affect us in the opinion of the world as reckless and precipitate. 
Therefore they made Beauregard a brigadier general and sent him to command in the harbor of Charleston. Beauregard's professional inspection justified this prudence. He wrote, If Sumter was properly garrisoned and armed, it would be a perfect Gibraltar to anything but constant shelling night and day from the four points of the compass. As it is, the weakness of the garrison constitutes our greatest advantage, and we must for the present turn our attention to preventing it from being reinforced. This idea I am gradually and cautiously infusing into the minds of all here, but should we have to open our batteries upon it, I hope to be able to do so with all the advantages the condition of things here will permit. All that I ask is time for completing my batteries and preparing and organizing properly my command. The first of the three commissioners, Martin J. Crawford, arrived in Washington the day before Lincoln's inauguration. He would have nothing more to do with Buchanan. He wrote, his fears for his personal safety, the apprehensions for the security of his property, together with the cares of state and his advanced age, render him wholly disqualified for his present position. He is as incapable now of purpose as a child. With the arrival of the second commissioner, John Forsyth, they prepared to begin operations upon the new administration. It was comparatively easy to call into caucus the active and disguised secessionists who yet remained in the city. Wigfall, Mason, Hunter, and Breckinridge were still in the Senate. Virginia and the other border states had a number of sympathizing congressmen in the House. Bell, Crittenden, and Douglas, though loyal, could be approached with professions of peace. Seward, in order to gain information, had kept himself during the whole winter in relation with all parties, and had openly proclaimed that his policy was one of peace and conciliation. The prospect of beginning negotiations seemed flattering. Nevertheless, their first caucus over the inaugural agreed that it was Lincoln's purpose at once to attempt the collection of the revenue, to reinforce and hold Fort Sumter and Pickens, and to retake the other places. A day or two later, on comparing the fragmentary gossip they had raked together, in which the difficulties of reinforcing Sumter were dimly reflected, with a general conversation alleged to have been held by one of their informants with Seward, they framed and reported to Montgomery a theory of probable success in their mission. Seward, they thought, was to be the ruling power of the new administration. Seward and Cameron were publicly committed to a peace policy. They would establish an understanding with the Secretary of State. This gentleman is urgent for delay. The tenor of his language is to this effect. I have built up the Republican Party. I have brought it to triumph, but its advent to power is accompanied by great difficulties and perils. I must save the party and save the government in its hands. To do this, war must be averted. The Negro question must be dropped, the irrepressible conflict ignored, and a Union party to embrace the border slave states inaugurated. I have already whipped Mason and Hunter in their own state. I must crush out Davis, Toombs, and their colleagues in sedition in their respective states. Saving the border states to the Union by moderation and justice, the people of the cotton states unwillingly led into secession, will rebel against their leaders, and reconstruction will follow. The commissioners therefore deemed it their duty to support Mr. Seward's policy, until we reach the point of pacific negotiations, it is unimportant what may be his subsequent hopes and plans. It is well that he should indulge in dreams which we know are not to be realized. They, of course, make no mention of the arguments, agencies, and influences which we may infer they employed in their deceitful intent to foster these dreams, unless, indeed, they were instrumental in provoking the Senate debate of March 6 and 7, in which Clingman attacked the inaugural as an announcement of war, while Douglas defended it 
as a manifesto of peace for the purpose as mr forsyth wrote that douglas told him of fixing that construction on it and of tomahawking it afterwards if it the administration departed from it acting upon this asserted anxiety of seward for delay and for peace the commissioners now agreed upon what they elaborately described in a long dispatch to montgomery as a most ingenious plan they would force the administration to accept or reject their mission and thereby confront the immediate issue of peace or war unless seward would consent to maintain the present military status having reached this conclusion they laboriously drew up memorandum which they purposed to ask seward to sign and sent it to the state department by an agent but mr seward was at home ill and could not be seen their long dispatches home and their mysterious allusions to conversations to agents and intermediaries convey the impression that they were in relation with the secretary of state but whether they were duped by others or whether they were themselves duping the montgomery cabinet indisputable indications in these documents contradict their assertions at last however their vigilance was rewarded with what they considered an item of important news and they hurried off several telegrams to montgomery things look better here than was believed the impression prevails in administration circles that fort sumter will be evacuated within ten days this was on saturday night march nine and so far from being exclusive or advance information it was substantially printed in next morning's newspapers after four days consideration by the lincoln government and extended discussion in a cabinet meeting the loss of sumter seemed unavoidable and the rumor was purposely given out to prepare the public mind if the need should finally come for the great sacrifice the jefferson davis cabinet at montgomery clutched at the report with avidity under this hope they were no longer satisfied with the existing peaceful status specified in their instructions of february twenty seven and repeated in the prepared memorandum of the commissioners can't bind our hands a day without evacuation of sumter and pickens replied toombs imperatively by telegraph on monday march eleven until sumter should be evacuated it was idle to talk of peaceful negotiation he added in his written dispatch to the commissioners while they were further instructed to pertinaciously demand the withdrawal of the troops and vessels from pickens and pensacola thus spurred into activity the commissioners deemed it incumbent on them to make an effort the whole tenor of their previous dispatches was calculated to convey the impression that they were twisting the secretary of state at pleasure between their diplomatic thumb and finger on monday march eleven they sent him their first message not the demand of tombs that day received by telegraph not even the mild suggestion of their original instructions to maintain the status and appeal to congress but a meek inquiry whether they would be allowed to make a sort of back-door visit to the state department to describe it in their own words we availed ourselves of the kind consent of senator hunter of virginia to see mr seward and learn if he would consent to an informal interview with us mr seward of course received senator hunter politely for he still professed to be a loyal senator representing a loyal state and gave him the stereotyped diplomatic reply that he would be obliged to consult the president the next morning seward sent hunter a note of irreproachable courtesy but of freezing conclusiveness it will not be in my power he wrote to receive the gentlemen of whom we conversed yesterday you will please explain to them that this decision proceeds solely on public grounds and not from any want of personal respect this was a cold bath to the commissioners and the theories of their own finesse and of the torturing perplexities into which seward had been thrown became untenable and they reported to-day at eleven o'clock mr hunter brought us the promised reply a copy of which is appended to this dispatch 
it is polite but it was considered by us at once as decisive of our course we deemed it not compatible with the dignity of our government to make a second effort and took for granted that having failed in obtaining an unofficial interview with the secretary of state we should equally fail with the president our only remaining course was plain and we followed it at once in the preparation of a formal note to the state department informing the united states government of our official presence here the objects of our mission and asking an early day to be appointed for an official interview they then repeat the gossip of the day what mr lincoln was said to have told a gentleman from louisiana that there would be no war and that he was determined to keep the peace and what crittenden told crawford that general scott was also for peace and would sustain mr seward's policy finally showing in what complete ignorance they were of events happening about them they asked with bewildered curiosity can it be that while they refuse to negotiate with us to keep the republican party in heart they mean to abandon both forts on militia grounds and thus avoid the occasion of a collision or do they mean to refer the questions raised by our note to the senate time only can determine and we await the result we are still of the opinion that fort sumter will be evacuated the opinion gains ground here that lieutenant slemmer and garrison will also be withdrawn from fort pickens toombs was ready to sue or bluster as occasion demanded you have shown to the government of the united states he wrote back to the commissioners with commendable promptness and becoming dignity that you were not supplicants for its grace and favor and willing to loiter in the antechambers of officials to patiently await their answer to your petition but that you are the envoys of a powerful confederacy of sovereignties instructed to present and demand their rights nevertheless instead of recalling these neglected envoys he instructs them to communicate freely and often and to employ a secretary to assist them at such monthly compensation as you may deem reasonable the hint to remain was hardly necessary the commissioners apparently had no idea of abandoning their intrigues unpromising as they were their secretary john t pickett now went to the state department for an answer to the commissioner's formal note seward replied march fifteenth in a lengthy and courteous but dignified memorandum that he did not perceive in the confederate states a rightful and accomplished revolution or an independent nation that he could not act on the assumption or in any way admit that they constituted a foreign power with which diplomatic relations ought to be established that he had no authority nor was he at liberty to recognize the commissioners as diplomatic agents or hold correspondence or other communication with them this paper if delivered would have terminated the labors and functions of the commissioners but they were in no hurry to return empty-handed to montgomery and still fondly nursed the theory so elaborately described in their long dispatches one of them repeated it with emphasis in a private letter to a member of the montgomery cabinet we are feeling our way here cautiously we are playing a game in which time is our best advocate and if our government could afford the time i feel confident of winning there is a terrible fight in the cabinet our policy is to encourage the peace element in the fight and at least blow up the cabinet on the question this dispatch is a frank confession that the rebel embassy was so far a failure and that its future opportunity lay solely in the barren regions of hotel gossip and newspaper rumors the commissioners would merit no further historic mention had they not unexpectedly secured a most important ally john a campbell an associate justice of the supreme court of the united states appointed from alabama and in the confidence and as it soon turned out in the secret interest of the south and the rebellion justice campbell now made himself the voluntary intermediary between the commissioners and the secretary of state owing to his station and professions seward gave him undue intimacy and confidence enabling campbell under guise of promoting peace to give aid and comfort to the enemies of the united states in violation of his oath and duty 
the details of the intrigue rest entirely upon rebel statements and mainly upon those of campbell himself who gave both a confidential and a semi-official version to jefferson davis the latter davis transmitted in a special message to the confederate congress to fire the southern heart campbell having thus made his share of the transaction official and having for a quarter of a century stood before the public accusing seward and the lincoln administration of equivocating conduct and systematic duplicity history must adjudge the question as well as it may with the help of his own testimony it has already been stated that seward's official refusal to receive the commissioners was being prepared at the state department the assistant secretary had promised to send it to the commissioner's hotel the commissioners thus relate the beginning of campbell's intrigue the interview between colonel pickett and the assistant secretary of state occurred on friday morning the fourteenth inst immediately thereafter and within a brief space of time after colonel pickett's statement to us the hon john a campbell of the supreme court of the united states sought an interview with mr crawford of this commission and after stating what he knew to be the wish and desire of mr seward to preserve the peace between the two governments asked if there could be no further delay for an answer to our note to the government stating at the same time that he had no doubt if it were pressed that a most positive though polite rejection would be the result Commissioner Crawford's official reply to this overture is best described by Toombs's formula that he should pertinaciously demand the evacuation of Sumter and maintenance of the status elsewhere. The alternative and confidential reply we can only conjecture, but it may well be presumed that Campbell fully revealed to Crawford his sympathy with the rebellion and his purpose to aid it, and that he was in return thoroughly instructed in the game which was to encourage the peace element in the fight and at least blow up the cabinet on the question thus instructed and prepared justice campbell on the same day march fourteen or fifteen made a voluntary call on mr seward and in the general conversation which he induced evidently played his part of the game of peace and reconciliation with consummate ability he probably painted the dreams which we know are not to be realized in such rosy colors as to call forth from seward the hopeful observation that a civil war might be prevented by the success of my campbell's mediation the impression upon seward that campbell was laboring honestly for the preservation of the union was also strengthened by his having brought with him justice nelson to whom the slightest suspicion of disloyalty has never attached it seems clear that these professions of patriotic zeal threw mr seward off his guard as to campbell's motives and that he accepted his intervention as a union peacemaker not as a rebel emissary seward replied confidentially that it was impossible to receive the commissioners in any diplomatic capacity or character or even to see them personally campbell adds that he said it was not desirable to deny them or to answer them as part of a general policy of delay and avoidance of conflict he may have said and meant it as an immediate and urgent diplomatic step he certainly did not mean it because his assistant secretary had already promised to send the answer to the commissioner's hotel when for mere temporary delay some other expedient might have been used continuing his conversation and unguardedly enlarging his confidence seward in answer to campbell's direct inquiry ventured the opinion that sumter would be evacuated and collision avoided at charleston the idea was now new the rumor was not new the rumor had been openly and half officially printed in the newspapers nearly a whole week the commissioners had telegraphed it to montgomery campbell however caught eagerly at the suggestion and proposed to write the peaceful news to jefferson davis and seward with a momentary excess of enthusiasm authorized him so campbell re relates to write before this letter reaches you sumter will be evacuated or the orders will have issued for that purpose and no change is contemplated at present in respect to pickens campbell rushed off in a fever of delight to tell the commissioners and magnified the confidence to the proportions of a pledge 
The incident began to grow more rapidly than the story of the three black crows. The commissioners, on their part, hurried a telegram to Montgomery. By pressing, we can get an answer to our official note tomorrow. If we do, we believe it will be adverse to recognition and peace. We are sure that within five days, Sumter will be evacuated. We are sure that no steps will be taken to change the military status. With a few days' delay, a favorable answer may be had. Our personal interests command us to press. Duty to our country commands us to wait. What shall we do? To all of which Toombs answered laconically, wait a reasonable time and then ask for instructions. It is needless to point out the absurd variance of this announcement with Seward's alleged statement, which was simply an opinion, that orders would be issued to evacuate Sumter within five days. He undoubtedly believed every word of this at the moment. Seward was then, as he declared to Lincoln in writing, in favor of evacuation, and Scott's written draft of an order to that effect, under date of the 11th, was in the President's hands. The President had as yet announced no decision. On the 15th, for the first time, the Cabinet voted five to evacuate, two to attempt to supply. Seward had still every reason to suppose that the necessity that the Cabinet majority General Scott's influence and Lincoln's desire to avoid war would, acting together, verify his prediction. Presuming that he was talking to a friend and not an enemy, to a judge and not an advocate, to a unionist and not a rebel, he undoubtedly and properly thought his words were received as a prediction and not as a pledge. The five days elapsed, but Lincoln sent no order to Anderson and announced no decision to the cabinet. He was still patiently seeking and had not found his way out of the dilemma. He had not yet beheld the salvation of the Lord. He wished to decide not upon impulse or even necessity, but upon judgment and advantage. If, like the farmer in his favorite illustration, he could not plow through the log, perhaps he might plow around it. He was meditating on the visit of Fox to Sumter, of Lehman and Hurlbut to Charleston. He was deliberating about a diversion upon the Virginia Convention. Above all, he was waiting to hear from his order to reinforce Fort Pickens, dispatched on the 12th of March. His cabinet ministers did not yet understand him. Seward, on the one hand, and Blair, on the other, unused to men of his fiber, began to fear this was vacillation, indecision, executive incompetence. The atmosphere of Washington had hitherto largely produced two classes of men, those who bluster and domineer, those who protest and yield. Lincoln belonged to neither class, and his persistent non-committal, his silent hopefulness, his patient and well-considered inaction baffled their prophecy. Such tenacity of purpose combined with such reticence of declaration was an anomaly in recent federal administration. The hopes of the rebels, so unexpectedly inflated, began once more to collapse. Governor Pickens sent inquiries to the commissioners. Toombs telegraphed them, we can't hear from you. Campbell was summoned and dispatched to the State Department. He had interviews on March 21 and 22, but in reality, Seward was no wiser than he had been in the previous interviews and could only repeat his beliefs and his predictions and declare in his philosophical vein that governments could not move with bank accuracy. For a third time, the conspirators grew impatient, and again Campbell on Saturday, March 30, and Monday, April 1, went to the State Department as the messenger of rebellion. By this time, Seward had real information. A second cabinet vote had been taken on March 29, in which the majority was reversed. The president had ordered the preparation of the Sumter expedition, and Seward himself, though still advising the abandonment of Sumter, was preparing an expedition to reinforce Fort Pickens. Seward at this point must have realized how injudicious he had been to give Campbell any confidence whatever, since to preserve secrecy for his own project he must abruptly break off the intimacy. Perhaps he had by this time divined that he was dealing with a public enemy. At all events, whatever may have been his reasons, he took occasion to correct any misunderstanding, which might previously have sprung up by giving Campbell a written memorandum, April 1, as follows. 
The President may desire to supply Sumter, but will not do so without giving notice to Governor Pickens. Adding verbally, Campbell says, that he still did not believe the attempt would be made and that there was no design to reinforce Sumter. Campbell acknowledges that he took notice of this very important correction and definition. There was a departure here from the pledges of the previous month, he writes, but with the verbal explanation I did not consider it a matter then to complain of. Commissioners and their game here drop into the background, and Justice Campbell takes up the role of leading conspirator. Two days afterwards we find him making a confidential report to the insurrectionary chief at Montgomery as follows. I do not doubt that Sumter will be evacuated shortly without any effort to supply it, but in respect to Pickens I do not think there is any settled plan, and it will not be abandoned spontaneously and under any generous policy, though perhaps they may be quite willing to let it be beleaguered and reduced to extremities. I can only infer as to this. All that I have is a promise that the status will not be attempted to be changed prejudicially to the Confederate States without notice to me. It is known that I make these assurances on my own responsibility. I have no right to mention any name or to pledge any person. I am the only responsible person to you. I consenting to accept such assurances as, as are made to me and to say, I have confidence that this will or will not be done. I have no expectation that there will be bad faith in the dealings with me. Nor I do not see that I can do more. I have felt them in a variety of forms as to the practicability of some armistice or truce that should be durable and would relieve the anxiety of the country, but at present there can be no compact treaty or recognition of any kind. There will be no objection to giving the commissioners their answer, but if the answer is not called for, it will not be sent, and it is intimated that it would be more agreeable to withhold it. So far as I can judge, the present desire is to let things remain as they are without action of any kind. There is a strong indisposition for the call of Congress, and it will not be done except under necessity. The radicals of the Senate went off in anger, and Trumbull's coercion resolution was offered after a contumelious interview with the president. My own notion is that the inactive policy is as favorable to you as any that this administration could adopt for you, and that I would not interrupt it. Here the learned judge might have stopped, and perhaps would have left posterity to question his method rather than his motives. But inexorable history demanded her tribute of truth. Under her master spell, he went on, and in the concluding paragraph of the letter, his own hand recorded a confession, little to have been expected from an officer, whose duty it was to expound and to administer the law of treason as written in the Constitution of the United States and the Acts of Congress. The great want of the Confederate States is peace. I shall remain here some ten or fifteen days. My own future course is in some manner depending upon circumstances and the opinions of friends. At present, I have access to the administration I could not have except under my present relations to the government, and I do not know who could have the same freedom. I have therefore deferred any settlement on the subject until the chance of being of service at this critical period has terminated. This letter is strictly confidential and private. There is no need of comment on this aid and comfort to the enemies of his government by a member of the highest court of the United States. It only remains to note the acknowledgment and estimate of it by Jefferson Davis, replying from Montgomery under date of April 6. Accept my thanks for your kind and valuable services to the cause of the Confederacy and of peace between those who, though separated, have many reasons to feel towards each other more than the friendship common among nations. Our policy is, as you say, peace. In any event, I will gratefully remember your zealous labor in a sacred cause and hope your fellow citizens may at some time give you acceptable recognition of your service and appreciate the heroism with which you have encountered a hazard from which most men would have shrunk. While this direct correspondence between Davis and Campbell was being carried on, the commissioners to whom A.B. Roman had been sent as a reinforcement were 
partly as a matter of form partly for ulterior purposes kept in washington by the montgomery cabinet to loiter in the antechambers of officials the occupation seems to have grown irksome to them for nowise deceived or even encouraged by campbell's pretended pledges they asked under date of march twenty sixth whether we shall dally longer with a government hesitating and doubting as to its own course or shall we demand our answer at once on april two toombs gave them jefferson davis's views at length he thought the policy of mr seward would prevail he cared nothing for seward's motives or calculations so long as the united states neither declare war nor establish peace it affords the confederate states the advantages of both conditions and enables them to make all the necessary arrangements for the public defense and the solidifying of their government more safely cheaply and expeditiously than they could were the attitude of the united states more definite and decided the commissioners were therefore to make no demand for their answer but maintain their present position in view of this confident boast of the chief of the rebellion of the advantages of both conditions his subsequent accusation of bad faith on the part of the lincoln administration is culminating proof of the insincerity and torturous methods of the rebel game End of chapter 24chapter 25 from abraham lincoln a history volume 3 by john hay and john george nicolay this is a librivox recording librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org abraham lincoln a history volume 3 chapter 25 civil war though possible did not at the moment seem imminent or necessary lincoln had declared in his inaugural that he would not begin it jefferson davis had written in his instructions to the commissioners that he did not desire it this threw the immediate contest back upon the secondary question the control and adhesion of the border slave states and of these virginia was the chief subject of solicitude the condition of virginia had become anomalous it was little understood by the north and still less by her own citizens she retained all the ideal sentiment growing out of her early devotion to and sacrifices for the union but it was warped by her coarser and stronger material interest in slavery she still deemed she was the mother of presidents whereas she had degenerated into being like other border states the mother of slave breeders and of an annual crop of black-skinned human chattels to be sold to the cotton rice and sugar planters of her neighboring commonwealths she thought herself the leader of the south whereas she was only a dependent of the gulf states she yet believed herself the teacher of original statesmanship whereas she had become the unreasoning follower of calhoun's disciples the ruffins the rets and the yanceys of the ultra south the political demoralization of virginia was completed by the john brown raid from that time she dragged her anchors of state her faith in both constitution and liberty was gone the true lesson of that affair was indeed the very reverse the overwhelming popular sentiment of the north denounced the outrage the national arms defended virginia and suppressed the invasion the state vindicated her local authority by hanging the captured offenders thus public opinion federal power and state right united in a precedent amounting of itself to an absolute guarantee but which might have been easily crystallized into statute or even constitutional law sagacious statesmanship would have plucked this flower of safety on the contrary her blind partisanship spurned the opportunity distrusted government and sought refuge in force her then governor confesses that from that period 
we began to prepare for the worst. We looked carefully to the state armory, and whilst we had the selection of the state quota of arms, we were particular to take field ordnance instead of altered muskets. And when we left the gubernatorial chair, there was in the state armory at Richmond 85,000 stands of infantry arms and 130 field pieces of artillery, besides $30,000 worth of new revolving arms purchased from Colt. Our decided opinion was that a preparation of the southern states in full panoply of arms and prompt action would have prevented civil war. Many strong external signs indicated the persistent adherence of Virginia to the Union. Her legislature refused the proposition of South Carolina for a conference of the southern states, made in the winter of 1859-60. In the presidential election, her citizens voted by a slight plurality for Bell and Everett and their platform of the Union, the Constitution, and the enforcement of the laws, while the votes cast for Douglas after his strong coercion declaration at Norfolk and the votes cast for Lincoln added to the Bell and Everett vote appeared to indicate a decided Union preponderance. Notwithstanding these manifestations of allegiance, public sentiment took on a tone and a determination which, paradoxical as it may seem, was rebellion in guise of loyalty. It is perhaps best illustrated by the declaration of ex-Governor Wise that he meant to fight in the Union, not out of it. To the nation at large, the phrase had a pretty and patriotic sound, but when explained to be a determination to fight the federal government in the Union, it became as rank treason as secession itself. However counterfeit logic or mental reservations concealed it, the underlying feeling was to fight, no matter whom and little matter how, for the protection of slavery and slave property. In this spirit, Virginia continued her military preparations. To this end, half a million dollars was voted in the winter of 1859-60 and a million more in that of 1860-61. Commissioners were appointed to purchase arms, companies were raised, officers appointed, regiments organized, camps of instruction formed. It was one of these that Floyd sent Hardy to inspect and drill in November 1860. Before the end of January, this appeal to military strength by Virginia was paraded in the United States Senate as a menace to extort a compromise and constitutional guarantees for slavery. Nor did the threat seem an empty one. The state professed to have an actual army of 62 troops of cavalry, numbering 2,547 men, 14 companies of artillery, numbering 820 men, and 149 companies of infantry, numbering 7,180 men. All these were uniformed and armed, while 6,000 men additional were formed into companies, ready to have arms put into their hands. Governor Letcher, the successor of Wise, had begun his administration with the announced belief that disunion was not only a possible but a highly probable event. The defeat of his favorite Douglas and the success of Lincoln served, therefore, as a pretended justification of his fears, if not an actual stimulant of his hopes. The presidential election was scarcely over when he called an extra session of the legislature to take into consideration the condition of public affairs consequent on the excitement produced by the election of sectional candidates for president and vice president. That body met January 7, 1861. The doctrine of non-coercion, South Carolina secession, and the Fort Sumter affair had become everyday topics. On federal affairs, Governor Letcher's message was a medley of heterogeneous and contradictory arguments and recommendations. He declared a disruption of the Union inevitable. He desired a national convention. He thought that four republics might be formed. He scolded South Carolina for her precipitate action. He joined a correct and a false quotation of Lincoln's sentiments. He opposed a state convention. He recommended sending commissioners to other slave states. He proposed terms to the North and thought they would be freely, cheerfully, and promptly assented to. 
He said, let the New England states and western New York be sloughed off. He wanted railroads to Kansas and direct trade to Europe. And finally, he summed up, events crowd upon each other with astonishing rapidity. The scenes of today are dissolved by the developments of tomorrow. The opinions now entertained may be totally revolutionized by unforeseen and unanticipated occurrences that an hour or a day may bring forth. The truth was that in Governor Letcher's hand, the old dominion was adrift towards rebellion without rudder or compass. His quarrel with South Carolina turned upon an important point. The irascible Palmetto State was offended that Virginia had a year before rejected her proposal for a southern conference. In retaliation, she now intimated that she would help to destroy Virginia's slave market. The introduction of slaves from other states, said her governor, which may not become members of the Southern Confederacy, and particularly the border states, should be prohibited by legislative enactment, and by this means they will be brought to see that their safety depends upon a withdrawal from their enemies and a union with their friends and natural allies. Mississippi made a similar threat. As it is more than probable, said her executive, that many of the citizens of the border states may seek a market for their slaves in the cotton states, I recommend the passage of an act prohibiting the introduction of slaves into this state unless their owners come with them and become citizens, and prohibiting the introduction of slaves for sale by all persons whomsoever. Governor Letcher grew very indignant over these declarations. These references to the border states, said he, are pregnant with meaning, and no one can be at a loss to understand what that meaning is. While disavowing any unkind feeling towards South Carolina and Mississippi, I must still say that I will resist the coercion of Virginia into the adoption of a line of policy whenever the attempt is made by northern or southern states. Incensed against the north and distrustful of the south, the governor pushed forward his military preparations. Especially did he cast a longing eye at Fort Monroe. As far back as January 8, 1861, says he, I consulted with a gentleman whose position enabled him to know the strength of that fortress, and whose experience in military matters enabled him to form an opinion as to the number of men that would be required to capture it. He represented it to be one of the strongest fortifications in the world and expressed his doubts whether it could be taken unless assailed by water as well as by land and simultaneously. Since Governor Letcher had neither a fleet nor a properly equipped army, he did not follow up this design. The discussion of the project, however, illustrates the condition of his allegiance to the flag of his country and the constitution he was then under oath to uphold. Like the governor, the legislature at once put itself in an attitude of quasi-rebellion, by resolving on the second day of the session that it would resist any attempt of the federal government to coerce a seceding state. It soon passed an act to assemble a convention, and by a large appropriation for defense, already mentioned, by issuing treasury notes, by amending the militia laws, and by authorizing counties to borrow money to purchase arms, and especially by its debates, further increased the prevailing secession undertow during the whole of its extra session from January 7 to April 4. The election for a convention was held February 4 and prov provoked a stirring contest. Its result was apparently for union. The union members claimed a majority of three to one, but this was evidently an exaggerated estimate. The precise result could not be well defined. Politics had become a babble. Discussion was a mere confusion of tongues. Party organization was swallowed up in intrigue, and conspiracy, not constitutional majorities, became the basis and impulse of legislation. The Virginia Convention met February 13, and its proceedings reflect a maze of loose declamation and purposeless resolves. It had no fixed mind, and could therefore form no permanent conclusion. The prevailing idea of the majority seemed to be expressed in a single phrase of one of its members that he would neither be driven by the North nor dragged by the cotton states. It was virtually a mere committee of observation waiting the turn of political winds and tides. It gave two encouraging though negative signs of promise. The first, 
that it had undoubtedly been chosen by a majority of voters really attached to the Union and desiring to remain in it. The second, that during a session of well nigh a month, it had not as yet passed an ordinance of secession, which had so far been a quick result in other state conventions. As said at the beginning of this chapter, the course of the border states, and especially of Virginia, was on all hands the subject of chief, chief solicitude. Her cooperation was absolutely essential to the secession government at Montgomery. This point, though not proclaimed, was understood by Jefferson Davis, and to powerful intrigues from that quarter, many otherwise unaccountable movements may doubtless be ascribed. Neither was her adherence to the Union undervalued by Lincoln. Seward was deeply impressed both with the necessity and the possibility of saving her from secession as a brand from the burning. He relied, too confidently as the event proved, on the significance of the late popular vote. He sent an agent to Richmond who brought him hopeful news. He had already proposed to strengthen the hands of the Virginia Unionists by advising Lincoln to nominate George W. Summers to fill the existing vacancy on the bench of the United States Supreme Court. Under his promptings, perhaps Lincoln now thought it possible to bring his personal influence to bear on the Virginia Convention. He authorized Seward to invite Summers, or some equally influential and determined Union leader, to come to Washington. It is not likely that he had any great faith in such an effort, for the refusal or neglect of Scott, Gilmer, and Hunt to accept a cabinet appointment offered to each of them with more or less distinctness had proved that Southern Unionism of this type was mere lip service and not a living principle. It so turned out in this instance. Summers, pleading important business in the convention, excused himself from coming. It would appear, however, that he and others selected one John B. Baldwin as a proper representative who came to Washington and had an interview with the President on the morning of April 4, 1861. There is a direct conflict of evidence as to what occurred at this interview. The witnesses are Mr. Baldwin himself and John Minor Botts, both of whom gave their testimony under oath before the Reconstruction Committee of Congress in 1866 after the close of the war. Mr. Botts testifies that on the 7th of April he called upon the President, who related to him in confidence that a week or ten days previously he had written to Summers to come to Washington, and he, instead of obeying the summons, had after that long delay sent Baldwin. On Baldwin's arrival on the 5th of April, as Botts relates the story, Lincoln took him into a private room in the executive mansion and said to him, in substance, Mr. Baldwin, why did you not come here sooner? I have been waiting and expecting some of you gentlemen of that convention to come to me for more than a week past. I had a most important proposition to make to you, but I am afraid you have come too late. However, I will make the proposition now. We have in Fort Sumter with Major Anderson about 80 men. Their provisions are nearly exhausted. I have not only written to Governor Pickens, but I have sent a special messenger to say to him that I will not permit these people to starve, that I shall send them provisions. If he fires on that vessel, he will fire upon an unarmed vessel loaded with bread. But I shall at the same time send a fleet along with her with instructions not to enter the harbor of Charleston unless that vessel is fired into, and if she is, then the fleet is to enter the harbor and protect her. Now, Mr. Baldwin, that fleet is now lying in the harbor of New York and will be ready to sail this afternoon at five o'clock. And although I fear it is almost too late, yet I will submit the proposition which I intended when I sent for Mr. Summers. Your convention in Richmond has been sitting now nearly two months, and all that they have done has been to shake the rod over my head. You have recently taken a vote in the Virginia Convention on the right of secession, which was rejected by 90 to 45, a majority of two-thirds, showing the strength of the Union Party in that convention. If you will go back to Richmond and get that Union majority to adjourn and go home without passing the ordinance of secession, so anxious am I for the preservation of the peace of this country and to save Virginia and the other border states from going out, that I will take the responsibility of evacuating Fort Sumter and take the chance of negotiating with the cotton states. 
Mr. Botts here asked how Baldwin received that proposition. " Sir," replied Lincoln, with a gesture of impatience, " he would not listen to it for a moment. He hardly treated me with civility. He asked me what I meant by an adjournment. Did I mean an adjournment sine die ?"" Why, of course, Mr. Baldwin," said I, " I mean an adjournment sine die. I do not mean to assume such a responsibility as that of surrendering that fort to the people of Charleston upon your adjournment, and then for you to return in a week or ten days and pass your ordinance of secession." Mr. Botts relates that he asked permission of the President to go himself and submit that proposition to the Union members of the convention, but that Lincoln replied it was too late — the fleet had sailed. Further, that Baldwin returned to Richmond without even disclosing the President's offer, and that he eventually became an active secessionist and held a commission in the rebel army. On the material point, Baldwin's testimony is directly to the contrary. He states that Seward's messenger reached Richmond April 3, that at the request of Summers he immediately returned with him to Washington and called on the President on the morning of April 4, that Lincoln took him into a private room and said in substance, I'm afraid you have come too late. I wish you could have been here three or four days ago. Why do you not adjourn the Virginia Convention? Adjourn it how? asked Baldwin. Do you mean sine die? Yes, said Lincoln, sine die. Why do you not adjourn it? It is a standing menace to me, which embarrasses me very much. Baldwin then relates how he made a grandiloquent speech to the president about the balance of power, the safeguards of the Constitution, and the self-respect of the convention, that the union members had a clear majority of nearly three to one. They were controlling it for conservative results and desired to have their hands upheld by a conciliatory policy that if he had the control of the president's thumb and finger for five minutes, he could settle the whole question. He would issue a proclamation, call a national convention, and withdraw the forces from Sumter and Pickens. But Mr. Baldwin declares and reiterates that he received from Mr. Lincoln no pledge, no undertaking, no offer, no promise of any sort. I am as clear in my recollections, he says, as it is possible to be under the circumstances, that he made no such suggestion as I understood it, and said nothing from which I could infer it. A careful analysis and comparison with established data show many discrepancies and errors in the testimony of both of these witnesses. Making due allowances for the ordinary defects of memory, and especially for the strong personal and political bias and prejudice under which they both receive their impressions, the truth probably lies midway between their extreme contradictory statements. The actual occurrence may therefore be summed up about as follows. Mr. Seward had an abiding faith in the unionism and latent loyalty of Virginia and the border states. He wished by conciliation to reawaken and build them up, and thereby not merely retain these states, but make them the instruments and this feeling the agency to undermine rebellion and finally reclaim the cotton states. Lincoln did not fully share this optimism. Nevertheless, he desired to avoid actual conflict and was willing to make any experimental concession which would not involve the actual loss or abandonment of military or political advantage. The acts of the previous administration had placed Fort Sumter in a peril from which, so the military authorities declared, he could not extricate it. His cabinet advised its evacuation. Public opinion would justify him in sacrificing the fort to save the garrison. He had ordered Fort Pickens reinforced. He was daily awaiting news of the execution of his announced policy to hold, occupy, and possess the government posts. Pickens, once triumphantly secured, the loss of Sumter could be borne. But might not the loss of Sumter be compensated? Might he not utilize that severe necessity and make it the lever to procure the adjournment of the Virginia Convention, which, to use his own figure, was daily shaking the rod over his head? This, we may assume, was his reasoning and purpose when, about March 20, either directly or through Seward, he invited Summers, the acknowledged leader of the Union members of the Convention, to Washington. Summers, however, hesitated delayed and finally refused to come the anxiously looked for news of the reinforcement of fort pickens did not arrive the cabinet once more voted and changed its advice the president ordered the preparation of the sumter expedition a second expedition to fort pickens had begun 
Another perplexing complication to be described in the next chapter had occurred. At this juncture, Baldwin made his appearance, but clearly he had come too late. By this time, April 4, 1861, his presence was an embarrassment and not a relief. Fully to inform him of the situation was hazardous, impossible. To send him back without explanation was impolite and would give alarm at Richmond. Lincoln, therefore, opened conversation with him, manifesting sufficient personal trust to explain what he intended to have told Summers. This called forth Baldwin's dogmatic and dictatorial rejounder, from which Lincoln discovered two things. First, that Baldwin was only an embryo secessionist, and second, that the Virginia Convention was little else than a council of rebellion. Hence the abrupt termination of the interview and the unexplained silence at Richmond. End of chapter 25. Chapter 26 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 26. Premier or President? At noon on the 29th of March, the Cabinet assembled and once more took up the absorbing question of Sumter. All the elements of the problem were now before them. Anderson's condition and the prospects of relief, as newly reported by Fox. The state of public opinion in Charleston as described by Hurlbut. The Attorney General's presentation of the legal aspects of an attempt at collecting the customs on shipboard. The Secretary of the Treasury's statement of the condition and resources of the Revenue Service. The report of the Secretary of the Navy as to what ships of war he could supply to blockade the Port of Charleston. And finally, the unexpected attitude of General Scott in advising the evacuation of Fort Pickens. All these features called out so much and such varied discussion that at length the Attorney General, taking up a pen, rapidly wrote on a slip of paper a short summing up of his own conclusions. This he read aloud to the President, who thereupon asked the other members of the Cabinet to do the same. They all complied, and we have therefore the exact record of the matured opinions of the Cabinet members then present. The importance of the occasion renders these memoranda of enduring interest. Mr. Seward wrote, First, the dispatch of an expedition to supply or reinforce Sumter would provoke an attack, and so involve a war at that point. The fact of preparation for such an expedition would inevitably transpire, and would therefore precipitate the war, and probably defeat the object. I do not think it wise to provoke a civil war beginning at Charleston, and in rescue of an untenable position. Therefore I advise against the expedition in every view. Second, I would call in Captain M. C. Meigs forthwith, Aided by his counsel, I would at once and at every cost prepare for a war at Pensacola and Texas, to be taken, however, only as a consequence of maintaining the possessions and authority of the United States. Third, I would instruct Major Anderson to retire from Sumter forthwith. Mr. Chase wrote, If war is to be the consequence of an attempt to provision Fort Sumter, War will just as certainly result from the attempt to maintain possession of Fort Pickens. I am clearly in favor of maintaining Fort Pickens, and just as clearly in favor of provisioning Fort Sumter. If that attempt be resisted by military force, Fort Sumter should, in my judgment, be reinforced. If war is to be the result, I perceive no reason why it may not be best begun in consequence of military resistance to the efforts of the administration to sustain troops of the Union, stationed under the authority of the government, in a fort of the Union, in the ordinary course of service. Mr. Wells wrote, I concur in the proposition to send an armed force off Charleston, with supplies of provisions and reinforcements for the garrison at Fort Sumter, and of communicating at the proper time the intentions of the government to provision the fort peaceably, if unmolested. There is little probability that this will be permitted if the opposing forces can prevent it. 
An attempt to force in provisions without reinforcing the garrison at the same time might not be advisable. But armed resistance to a peaceable attempt to send provisions to one of our own forts will justify the government in using all the power at its command to reinforce the garrison and furnish the necessary supplies. Fort Pickens and other places retained should be strengthened by additional troops and, if possible, made impregnable. The naval force in the Gulf and on the southern coast should be increased. Accounts are published that vessels having on board marketable products for the crews of the squadron at Pensacola are seized. The inhabitants we know are prohibited from furnishing the ships with provisions or water. And the time has arrived when it is the duty of the government to assert and maintain its authority. Mr. Smith wrote, Viewing the question whether Fort Sumter shall be evacuated as a political one, I remark that the effect of its evacuation upon the public mind will depend upon the concurrent and subsequent action of the government. If it shall be understood that by its evacuation we intend to acknowledge our inability to enforce the laws and our intention to allow treason and rebellion to run their course, the measure will be extremely disastrous and the administration will become very unpopular. If, however, the country can be made to understand that the fort is abandoned from necessity, and at the same time Fort Pickens and other forts in our possession shall be defended, and the power of the government vindicated, the measure will be popular and the country will sustain the administration. Believing that Fort Sumter cannot be successfully defended, I regard its evacuation as a necessity, and I advise that Major Anderson's command shall be unconditionally withdrawn. At the same time, I would adopt the most vigorous measures for the defense of the other forts, and if we have the power, I would blockade the southern ports and enforce the collection of the revenue with all the power of the government. Mr. Blair wrote, First, as regards General Scott, I have no confidence in his judgment on the questions of the day. His political views control his judgment, and his course, as remarked on by the President, shows that, whilst no one will question his patriotism, the results are the same as if he was in fact traitorous. Second, it is acknowledged to be possible to relieve Fort Sumter. It ought to be relieved without reference to Pickens or any other possession. South Carolina is the head and front of this rebellion, and when that state is safely delivered from the authority of the United States, it will strike a blow against our authority from which it will take us years of bloody strife to recover. Third, for my own part, I am unwilling to share in the responsibility of such a policy. Mr. Bates wrote, It is my decided opinion that Fort Pickens and Key West ought to be reinforced and supplied, so as to look down opposition at all hazards, and this whether Fort Sumter be or be not evacuated. It is also my opinion that there ought to be a naval force kept upon the southern coast, sufficient to command it, and, if need be, actually close any port that practically ought to be closed, whatever other station is left unoccupied. It is also my opinion that there ought to be immediately established a line of light, fast-running vessels to pass as rapidly as possible between New York or Norfolk at the north and Key West or other point in the Gulf at the south. As to Fort Sumter, I think the time is come either to evacuate or relieve it. The majority opinion of the cabinet on the 15th of March had been against the expediency of an attempt to provision Fort Sumter, but now, after a lapse of two weeks, the feeling was changed in favor of the proposed measure. Irrespective of this fresh advice, however, the president's opinion was already made up. On the day previous, he had instructed Captain Fox to prepare him a short order for the ships, men, and supplies he would need for his expedition and that officer complied with characteristic and promising brevity. Steamers Pocahontas at Norfolk, Pawnee at Washington, Harriet Lane at New York, to be under sailing orders for sea with stores, etc. for one month. 300 men to be kept ready for departure from on board the receiving ships at New York. 200 men to be ready to leave Governor's Island in New York. Supplies for 12 months for 100 men to be put in portable shape ready for instant shipping a large steamer and three tugs conditionally engaged. The cabinet meeting over, the president wrote at the bottom of this preliminary requisition the following order to the Secretary of War. Sir, I desire that an expedition to move by sea be got ready to sail as early as the 6th of April next. The whole, according to memorandum attached, 
and that you cooperate with the Secretary of the Navy for that object. This order and its duplicate to the Secretary of the Navy, duly signed and transmitted to the two departments, Captain Fox hurried to New York to superintend the details of preparation in person. It will be observed that the President's order is simply to prepare the expedition, which expedition, in his own language, was intended to be ultimately used or not according to circumstances. But he was, by this time, convinced that the necessity would arise. Nothing had yet been heard from the order to reinforce Fort Pickens sent two weeks previously. On the contrary, there were rumors through the southern newspapers that the Brooklyn, containing the troops, had left her anchorage off Pensacola and gone to Key West. As a matter of fact, she had first transferred her troops to the Sabine, but this was not and could not be known, and the necessary inference was that the Brooklyn had carried them away with her. The direction to land them would therefore unavoidably fail, and the fort remain liable to be carried by an assault, and both Sumter and Pickens be thus left within the grasp of the secessionists. Such was the contingency which had decided the President to prepare the Sumter expedition. The logic of daily events had by this time also wrought a change in the mind of Seward. In his written opinion of March 15th, he had declared, I would not provoke war in any way now. But on the 29th, apparently alarmed like the rest at the advice of General Scott to make further concession to the rebels, he wrote, I would at once and at every cost prepare for a war at Pensacola and Texas. That very afternoon, as he had suggested in this same paper, he brought Captain Montgomery C. Meigs, the engineer officer in charge of the work on the new wings of the Capitol building, to the president. One reason for selecting him, in addition to his special training and acknowledged merit, was that he had, in January, personally accompanied the reinforcements then sent to Key West and Tortugas. On the way to and from the President's, Seward explained to Meigs that he wished the President to see some military man who would not talk politics, that they had Scott and Totten, but no one would think of putting either of those old men on horseback. They were in a difficulty. Scott had advised giving up both Sumter and Pickens. For his part, his policy had been to give up Sumter, but he wished to hold Pickens, making the fight there and in Texas throwing the burden of the war, which all men of sense saw must come, upon those who, by revolting, had provoked it. The President talked freely with Captain Meigs, and after some inquiries about Sumter, asked him whether Fort Pickens could be held. Meigs replied, certainly, if the Navy would do its duty. The President then asked him whether he could go down there again and take general command of the three great fortresses, Taylor, Jefferson, and Pickens, and keep them safe. Meigs answered that he was only a captain and could not command the majors who were there. Here Seward broke in with, I understand how that is. Captain Meigs must be promoted. But there is no vacancy, answered the modest captain. Mr. Seward, however, made light of all difficulties and told the president if he wanted this thing done to put it in Meigs' charge. When Pitt wished to conquer Canada, Seward said, he sent for a young man whom he had noticed in the Society of London and told him to take Quebec, to ask for the necessary means and do it, and it was done. Would the President do this now? Lincoln replied he would consider it, and let him know in a day or two. Two days afterward, Sunday, March 31st, Meigs was about to start for church when Colonel Erasmus D. Keyes, General Scott's military secretary, called and took him to Mr. Seward, who requested them to go forthwith and in consultation with General Scott to put upon paper an estimate and project for relieving and holding Fort Pickens, and to bring it to the President before four o'clock that afternoon. The two officers went directly to the Engineers Bureau to inspect the necessary charts of Pensacola Harbor and drawings of the fortifications, and over these they matured their plans. The rapid lapse of the few hours allowed compelled them to report to the President before seeing General Scott. Lincoln heard them read their paper, and then directed them to submit it to the general. Tell him, he said, that I wish this thing done, and not to let it fail unless he can show me that I have refused him something he asked for as necessary. The officers obeyed, and on the way encountered Mr. Seward, who went with them. General Scott, said he, on entering the old sailor's presence, you have formally reported to the president your advice to evacuate Fort Pickens. 
Notwithstanding this, I now come to bring you his order, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, to reinforce and hold it to the last extremity. The old general had his political crotchets, but he was a soldier and a disciplinarian. Sir, replied he, drawing himself up to his full height, the great Frederick used to say, when the king commands, all things are possible. It shall be done. Meigs and Keyes submitted their plan, which he approved in the main, adding a few details that they had in their haste overlooked. The project was further discussed and definitely adopted. Fort Pickens stands on the western extremity of Santa Rosa Island and serves in connection with its twin Fort McRae on the mainland opposite to guard the entrance to Pensacola Harbor. But in this case, the two forts intended to render assistance to each other were held by opposing forces, bent not upon protecting, but upon destroying each other, and restrained only by the existence of the Sumter and Pickens truce, described in a previous chapter. So far as a mere cannonade might go, Pickens was perhaps as strong as McRae, but Lieutenant Slemmer in Pickens had only a handful of Union men, 46 soldiers and 30 ordinary seamen all told, while some thousands of rebels were either encamped near or within reach of the secession general Braxton Bragg, himself a trained and skillful soldier. The chief danger was that Bragg might organize a large body of men and, by means of boats, crossing the bay at night or in a fog, carry Fort Pickens by a sudden assault before the reinforcements in the Union fleet could be landed, as they were, by the terms of the truce, authorized to do in such an emergency. The substance of Meigs' plan was that, while a transport vessel bearing troops and stores landed them at Fort Pickens, outside the harbor, a ship of war, arriving simultaneously, should boldly steam past the hostile batteries of Fort McRae, enter the harbor, and take up such a position within as to be able to prevent any crossing or landing by the rebels. The ship destined to run the batteries would necessarily encounter considerable peril, not only from the guns of McRae, but also from those of Fort Barrancas and supposed batteries at the Navy Yard, all, like McRae, on the mainland and forming part of the harbor defenses. For such cooperation, Meigs needed a young, talented, and daring naval officer, and accordingly he made choice of Lieutenant David D. Porter, a companion and intimate friend who, as he believed, combined the requisite qualities. One important characteristic of this Pickens expedition was to be its secrecy. Seward, in his argument on Sumter, had much insisted that preparation for reinforcement would unavoidably come to the knowledge of the rebels and enable them to find means to oppose it. This argument applied with even greater force to Fort Pickens. The rebels controlled both the post and the telegraph throughout the South, and it was thought that upon the first notice of hostile design, Bragg would assault and overwhelm the fort. Besides, the orders transmitted through regular channels two weeks before had apparently failed. But now that the ships to supply Sumter were being got ready, it was doubtless thought that under this guise, the Pickens' relief could be prepared without suspicion. On Monday, April 1st, 1861, Captain Meigs, Colonel Keyes, and Lieutenant Porter were busy under the occasional advice of Seward and General Scott in perfecting the details of their plans and in drawing up the formal orders required. These were, in due time, signed by the President himself, it being part of the plan that no one but the officers named, not even the Secretaries of War or Navy, should have knowledge of them. This was an error which only the anomalous condition and extreme peril of the government would have drawn Lincoln into, and it was never repeated. He doubtless supposed they were entirely consistent with the Sumter plans, especially as General Scott's written request for his signature accompanied the papers, the general being perfectly cognizant of both expeditions. The immediate departure of a war steamer, with instructions to enter Pensacola Harbor and use all measures in its power to prevent any attack from the mainland upon Fort Pickens, is of prime importance. If the President, as Commander-in-Chief, will issue the order of which I enclose a draft, an important step toward the security of Fort Pickens will be taken. But although useful to secrecy, this course was bound to produce confusion and bad discipline, and such was its immediate result. That afternoon, the Commandant of the Brooklyn Navy Yard received two telegrams in very similar language, directing him to fit out the Powhatan to go to sea at the earliest possible moment. One was signed by the Secretary of the Navy, the other by the President, the former intending the ship to go to Sumter, 
the latter to Pickens, and neither being aware of the other's action. Neither had reason to anticipate any such conflict of orders. The Powhatan was not included in Fox's original requisition, and Meigs did not even know that the Sumter expedition was being prepared. On the same afternoon, several additional orders made out under Seward's supervision were brought to Lincoln. Supposing they all related to this enterprise, he signed them without reading, but it soon turned out that two of them related to a matter altogether different. These orders changed the duty of several naval officers. Captain Garrett J. Pendergrast was to be sent to Vera Cruz on account of important complications in our foreign relations, and Captain Silas H. Stringham was to go to Pensacola. When these last-mentioned orders reached the hands of the Secretary of Navy, to whom they were addressed and immediately transmitted, that official was not only greatly mystified, but very seriously troubled in mind. He hastened to the President, whom he found alone in the executive office, writing, "'What have I done wrong?' Lincoln inquired playfully as he raised his head, and with his ever-accurate intuition read trouble in the countenance of his secretary. Mr. Wells presented the anomalous papers and asked what they meant. He had heard of no foreign complications, and he preferred Stringham in his present duty. Mr. Wells says, "'The President expressed as much surprise as I felt that he had signed and sent me such a document. He said Mr. Seward, with two or three young men, had been there through the day on a matter which Mr. Seward had much at heart, that he had yielded to the project of Mr. Seward, but as it involved considerable detail, and he had his hands full and more too, he had left Mr. Seward to prepare the necessary papers. These papers he had signed, some of them without reading, trusting entirely to Mr. Seward, for he could not undertake to read all papers presented to him. And if he could not trust the Secretary of State, whom could he rely upon in a public matter that concerned us all? He seemed disinclined to disclose or dwell on the project, but assured me he never would have signed the paper had he been aware of its contents, much of which had no connection with Mr. Seward's scheme. The President reiterated that they were not his instructions, and wished me distinctly to understand they were not, though his name was appended to them, said the paper was an improper one, that he wished me to give it no more consideration than I thought proper, treat it as cancelled, as if it had never been written. Mr. Wells acted upon this verbal assurance, and was highly gratified that the President thus corrected what he felt to be an encroachment upon the duties and powers of the Navy Department. Nevertheless, it is apparent that he had his doubts whether Lincoln had fully and unreservedly given him his confidence in this affair. In these surmises, he was correct. A circumstance had occurred between the President and Seward, which the former could not communicate, and, so far as is known, never did communicate to any person but his private secretary, and of which the President's private papers have preserved the interesting record. In order to understand it rightly, a brief glance at contemporary affairs is needful. It will hardly be possible for the readers of history in our day to comprehend the state of public sentiment in the United States during the month of March 1861. The desire for peace, the hope of compromise, the persistent disbelief in the extreme purposes of the South, and strangest of all, a certain national lethargy, utterly impossible to account for, all seem to mark a decadence in patriotic feeling. The phenomenon is attested not only in the records of many public men willing to abandon constitutional landmarks and to sacrifice elementary rights of mankind, but also shown in the words and example of military officers in their consenting to shut their eyes to the truths and principles of their own profession, that it is the right of the government to repel menaces as well as blows, and that building batteries is as effective an aggressive war as firing cannonballs. This perversion of public opinion, in fact, extended back to the meeting of Congress in December. Under the spell of such a political nightmare, the revolution had been half accomplished. The Union flag had been fired upon, the federal laws defied, the secession government organized and inaugurated. The work of the conspirators was done, but the popular movement had not yet fully ratified it. The difficult problem was presented to the Lincoln administration, not alone whether it should endeavor to knock down the revolutionary edifice half-built, but also whether such an effort might not excite the whole Southern people to rise en masse to complete it. From our point of view, the answer is easy, but it was not of so ready solution in March 1861. 
Lincoln, in his hesitation to provision Sumter at all hazards, was not executing his own inclinations, but merely submitting to what, for the time, seemed the military and, more than all, the political necessities of the hour. The Buchanan administration had first refused and then postponed succor to the fort. Congress had neglected to provide measures and means for coercion. The conservative sentiment of the country protested loudly against everything but concession. His own cabinet was divided in council. The times were out of joint. Public opinion was awry. Treason was applauded and patriotism rebuked. Laws were held to be offenses and officials branded as malefactors. In Lincoln's own forcible simile, sinners were calling the righteous to repentance. It must be remembered, too, that during the month of March 1861, Lincoln did not know the men who composed his cabinet. Neither, on the other hand, did they know him. He recognized them as governors, senators, and statesmen, while they yet looked upon him as a simple frontier lawyer at most, and a rival to whom chance had transferred the honor they felt to be due to themselves. The recognition and establishment of intellectual rank is difficult and slow. Perhaps the first real question of the Lincoln cabinet was, who is the greatest man? It is pretty safe to assert that no one, not even he himself, believed it was Abraham Lincoln. Bearing this in mind, we shall be better able to understand and explain acts done and acts omitted during that memorable month. In this state of affairs, the policy of the new administration was necessarily passive, expectant, cautious, and tentative. Other causes contributed to its embarrassments. The change from a long democratic to a republican regime involved a sweeping change of functionaries. The impending revolution made both sides suspicious and vindictive. The new appointees could not, as in ordinary times, lean upon the experience and routine knowledge of the old. The new party was not yet homogeneous. A certain friction mutually irritated Republicans of Whig, of Democratic, or of Free Soil antecedents against each other. Douglas was artfully leading a Senate debate to foster and strengthen the anti-war feeling of the North. The Cabinet had not become a working unit. Each secretary was beset by a horde of applicants, by over-officious friends, by pressing and most contradictory advice. Seward naturally took a leading part in the new cabinet. This was largely warranted by his prominence as a party manager, his experience in the New York governorship and in the United States Senate, the quieting and meditating attitude he had maintained during the winter, the influence he was supposed to wield over the less violent Southerners, the information he had gained from the Buchanan cabinet, his intimacy with General Scott, his acknowledged ability and talent, his optimism, which always breathed hope and imparted confidence. During the whole of March, he had been busy with various measures of administration. He had advised appointments, written diplomatic notes and circulars, carried on a running negotiation with the rebel commissioners, sought to establish relations with the Virginia Convention, sent Lander to Texas to kindle a backfire against secession, elaborated his policy of evacuating Sumter, proposed a change of party name and organization, and set on foot the secret expedition to Fort Pickens. All this activity, however, did not appear to satisfy his desires and ambition. His philosophic vision took a yet wider range. He was eager to enlarge the field of his diplomacy beyond the boundaries of the Republic. Regarding mere partisanship as a secondary motive, he was ready to grapple with international politics. He would heal a provincial quarrel in the zeal and fervor of a continental crusade. He would smother a domestic insurrection in the blaze and glory of a war, which must logically be a war of conquest. He would supplant the slavery question by the Monroe Doctrine. And who shall say that these imperial dreams did not contemplate the possibility of changing a threatened dismemberment of the Union into the triumphant annexation of Canada, Mexico, and the West Indies? On this same first day of April, while Meigs and Porter were busy with plans and orders about Fort Pickens, Seward submitted to Lincoln the following extraordinary state paper, unlike anything to be found in the political history of the United States. Some Thoughts for the President's Consideration, April 1st, 1861. First, we are at the end of a month's administration and yet without a policy, either domestic or foreign. Second, 
This, however, is not culpable, and it has even been unavoidable. The presence of the Senate, with the need to meet applications for patronage, have prevented attention to other and more grave matters. Third, but further delay to adopt and prosecute our policies for both domestic and foreign affairs would not only bring scandal upon the administration, but danger upon the country. Fourth, to do this we must dismiss the applicants for office. But how? I suggest that we make the local appointments forthwith, leaving foreign or general ones for ulterior and occasional action. Fifth, the policy at home. I am aware that my views are singular, and perhaps not sufficiently explained. My system is built upon this idea as a ruling one, namely that we must change the question before the public from one upon slavery or about slavery for a question upon union or disunion. In other words, from what would be regarded as a party question to one of patriotism or union. The occupation or evacuation of Fort Sumter, although not in fact a slavery or a party question, is so regarded. Witness the temper manifested by the Republicans in the free states, and even by the Union men in the South. I would therefore terminate it as a safe means for changing the issue. I deem it fortunate that the last administration created the necessity. For the rest, I would simultaneously defend and reinforce all the forts in the Gulf, and have the Navy recalled from foreign stations to be prepared for a blockade. Put the island of Key West under martial law. This will raise distinctly the question of union or disunion. I would maintain every fort and possession in the South. For foreign nations, I would demand explanations from Spain and France, categorically at once. I would seek explanations from Great Britain and Russia, and send agents into Canada, Mexico, and Central America, to rouse a vigorous continental spirit of independence on this continent against European intervention. And if satisfactory explanations are not received from Spain and France, would convene Congress and declare war against them. But whatever policy we adopt, there must be an energetic prosecution of it. For this purpose, it must be somebody's business to pursue and direct it incessantly. Either the president must do it himself and be all the while active in it, or devolve it on some member of his cabinet. Once adopted, debates on it must end and all agree and abide. It is not in my especial province, but I neither seek to evade nor assume responsibility. It is a little difficult to imagine what must have been the feelings of a president, and particularly of a frank, loyal, and generous nature like that of Lincoln, on receiving from his principal counselor an anticipated mainstay of his administration such a series of proposals that he should delegate his presidential functions and authority, that he should turn his back upon the party which elected him, that he should ignore the political battle which had been fought and the victory for moral government which had been won, that he should by an arbitrary act plunge the nation into foreign war, that he should ask his rival to rule in his stead. All this might be romantic statesmanship, but to the cool, logical mind of the president, it must have brought thoughts excited by no other event of his most eventful life. What was to be said in answer? The tender of a grave issue like this presupposed grave purposes and determinations. Should he, by a fitting rebuke, break up his scarcely formed cabinet and alienate the most powerful leader after himself, who might perhaps carry with him the organized support of all the northern states which had voted for this rival at Chicago? The president sent his reply the same day. He armed himself with his irresistible logic, his faultless tact, his limitless patience, his kindest but most imperturbable firmness. Only the hand of iron in the glove of velvet could have written the following answer. Executive Mansion, April 1, 1861 Honorable W. H. Seward, My dear sir, since parting with you, I have been considering your paper, dated this day, and entitled Some Thoughts for the President's Consideration. The first proposition in it is, first, we are at the end of a month's administration, and yet without a policy, either domestic or foreign. At the beginning of that month, in the inaugural, I said, the power confided to me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government, and to collect the duties and imposts. 
This had your distinct approval at the time, and taken in connection with the order I immediately gave General Scott, directing him to employ every means in his power to strengthen and hold the forts, comprises the exact domestic policy you now urge, with the single exception that it does not propose to abandon Fort Sumter. Again, I do not perceive how the reinforcement of Fort Sumter would be done on a slavery or party issue, while that of Fort Pickens would be on a more national and patriotic one. The news received yesterday in regard to Santo Domingo certainly brings a new item within the range of our foreign policy. But up to that time, we have been preparing circulars and instructions to ministers and the like, all in perfect harmony, without even suggestion that we had no foreign policy. Upon your closing propositions that, whatever policy we adopt, there must be an energetic prosecution of it, for this purpose it must be somebody's business to pursue and direct it incessantly. Either the president must do it himself and be all the while active in it, or devolve it on some member of his cabinet. Once adopted, debates on it must end and all agree and abide. I remark that if this must be done, I must do it. When a general line of policy is adopted, I apprehend there is no danger of its being changed without good reason or continuing to be a subject of unnecessary debate. Still, upon points arising in its progress, I wish, and suppose I am entitled to have, the advice of all the cabinet. Your obedient servant, A. Lincoln. In this reply, not a word is omitted which was necessary, and not a hint or allusion is contained that could be dispensed with. The answer was conclusive and ended the argument. So far as is known, the affair never reached the knowledge of any other member of the cabinet, or even the most intimate of the president's friends. Nor was it probably ever again alluded to by either Lincoln or Seward. Doubtless, it needed only the president's note to show the Secretary of State how serious a fault he had committed, for all his tireless industry and undivided influence continued to be given for four long years to his chief, not only without reserve, but with a sincere and devoted personal attachment. Lincoln, on his own part, easily dismissed the incident from his thought with that grand and characteristic charity which sought only to cherish the virtues of men, which readily recognized the strength and acknowledged the services of his secretary, to whom he unselfishly gave, to his own last days, his generous and unwavering trust. End of chapter 26 Recording by Jill Ingle End of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 3, by John Hay and John George Nicolay